It begins what's expected to be a consequential week for former President Donald Trump and our entire country. This afternoon, Mr. Trump expected to make his way to New York before his arraignment Tuesday. Wake Up Charlotte's Bree Jackson now in Washington with more on how this week could play out. Good morning, Ben. Former President Trump posted on social media that he plans to travel to New York this afternoon and stay at Trump Tower before being arraigned on criminal charges on Tuesday. How do you feel, Mr. Trump? Former President Trump preparing to voluntarily surrender to New York authorities. He's gearing up for a, a battle. Um, you know, this is something that obviously we believe is a political persecution. Trump is the first former president to face criminal charges. Sources tell NBC News there are about 30 of them related to alleged document fraud. Their exact nature will be unveiled during his arraignment Tuesday. We will take the indictment. We will dissect it. Um, the team will look at every every um, potential issue that we, we will be able to challenge and we will challenge them. The indictment is connected to alleged hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. This is less about the crime and more about the target. So um, it has to play out. It's very sad for our country to have to go through this. I would hope uh, and pray that whatever comes forth that they've done due diligence. The legal fight comes as Mr. Trump makes his third run for the White House. His campaign says they've already raised more than five million dollars since he was indicted last Thursday. What they think that they're going to do to President Trump, it's going to boomerang back on them. This whole process of them indicting Trump is a sham. The former president will fly from Florida to New York this afternoon and stand before a judge Tuesday. And after his arraignment in New York, former President Trump plans to go back to Florida and deliver remarks from Mar-a-Lago on Tuesday night. In Washington, Bree Jackson. Well, spring just started, but if you've got kids, now's the time to start planning for ways to keep them occupied this summer. How's that going? We are already in the planning process. <laughs> it's a struggle, I mean, from it what really I is. hear. Especially with the budget, right? Right, the budget and, and really just the timeline. Yeah. You got to get started That's early. Right. WCNC Charlotte's Carolyn Brock is joining us with what we need to know before selecting a summer camp for those kiddos. Okay, so here are five steps to help you select a summer camp. And this is according to the Better Business Bureau. They took a deep dive into this. The first thing you need to know is accreditation. Mm. You need to check for that. So there is a um, accreditation kind of organization called the American Camp Association. Um, it will accredit camps in the United States if they meet 32 national summer camp standards. So that's a good place to start. The second thing to know, safety requirements. Yes, we are no longer in a pandemic, but COVID could still be a concern. So you wanna know what the camp protocols are. What are the health guidelines? Are visitors gain, gaining access to that camp? So know these things ahead of time. The third thing, get references. Yes, this is not a uh, job interview, but at the same time, you are going to be putting your child in the care of these people. So ask camp management. It's totally in your right to ask them to put you in touch with past campers so you can discuss their experiences with the camp. And also make sure you check those online reviews. Just mm -hmm. get a deep dive and be thorough with that. Right. You, this is something that you cannot overlook evaluate health resources the camp has interesting you want to ask about the medical facilities on site to treat your camper if they do become sick or injured so is there one that's on site you also need to know the camp policy if medical care is in fact needed you also need to know if there are kids if this is like a sleepaway camp and you, your child maybe has to take a daily medication what are the accommodations for that who is in charge of administering it. You just want to iron out all those details so you're not surprised about it in the end. And this one, speaking of budget, guys, you <sighs> have to review the contract and the fees. you got to read the fine print. You cannot trust or take the word of anything that is said to you. You have to read that contract before you sign it. And it's very important for you to ask about the total cost. You want the deposit included because some camps have this deposit requirement that's separate from the total cost. You say everything included I need to know before you sign. That's what you need to know. Here are the five steps to pick that summer camp. I know it's a lot of information, but no. it's important. Well, when you're a parent, you got to do your due diligence, right, Carolyn? So yeah. good, I'm trying to help here. Good steps there. We appreciate it. Things to keep in mind. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, it certainly felt like we got the summer vibes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. With your help, WCNC Charlotte is making a difference in our community. We want people to know it's okay to ask for help. 
We are the guardrails to some of these families who are struggling. We get to present a check for $5,000 via the Techna Foundation. These people give up their heart and their time, and they don't get anything but thank yous in return. If you'd like to make a difference, go to WCNC.com slash make a difference now. Time now to connect the dots when we make the news make sense. Recently, several swastikas have been discovered on the campus of Queens University and at a Jewish temple in Boone. And now leaders across the country are still trying to figure out why an unsettling trend is growing. Attacks against the Jewish community are on the rise in America. Let's connect the dots. Anti-Semitic incidents last year surged to the highest levels ever recorded. The Anti-Defamation League reports America saw nearly 3,700 incidents of assault, harassment, and vandalism. That's a 36% increase from the year before. And it's being felt right here in the Carolinas. In South Carolina, the ADL tracked at least 44 incidents, up 193%. North Carolina is seeing an uptick of 39 anti-Semitic attacks, up 30%. And here's the thing, we don't know why. The ADL says an increase in white supremacist propaganda and increases in anti-Semitic incidents at schools and colleges might be the reason. Some leaders in South Carolina pushing for a hate crimes law to punish people who target others based on their religion or race. Right now, it's one of only two states without hate crime laws on the books. And that is Connecting the Dots. Now to the day's check. Now to another update here. More fallout for Charlotte's public transportation. Cats' ongoing operations issues are a big concern for city leaders, and they were a focal point at today's transportation planning and development meeting this morning. All this while leaders work on a $13 billion transit plan for the city. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre is joining us to show us how the dialogue is going so far. Jesse. Yes, that's right. You know, city leaders are stepping in to get cats back on track. Now, this comes after learning of derailments that were not properly disclosed to local leaders, past due inspections, and several concerns about safety. This thing it, it is a cancer, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and we gotta you gotta treat the cancer before it spreads. And I think you can even say that maybe it's spreading already because it's just not the derailment, it's the maintenance, it's all the other things that we're dealing with. Monday, the City of Charlotte's Transportation Planning and Development Committee met to discuss several issues plaguing CATS. The Federal Transit Administration has been requested to do a review of CATS following a rail derailment back in May of 2022 that was not properly reported to city leaders. It was later discovered former CEO John Lewis did send a text to city manager Marcus Jones at the time, but it was missed. I'm not going to, um, but um, 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 lose a lot of sleep over the fact that he missed it. I'm losing sleep over the fact that it was uh, that somehow it wasn't reported in a different way other than a text, right? Well, Mr. Jones did not recognize the inflammatory nature of the word derailment did not appreciate the need to be very upfront about that. Uh, and, you know, it was a, a bit of a lapse on his part, but I can well understand that he didn't think, based on the information he got, that there was a need to make public disclosure. The FTA is looking into maintenance records, operations, safety, and state of repairs. Necessary repairs, city leaders say, will not interrupt service. We have the capacity to continue to offer the service that we have been offering and trains will be cycled out of service in order to get these repairs done a few at a time. Interim CAT CEO Brent Cagle says they are implementing mandatory overtime to cover vacancies after learning the rail system has not operated with adequate staffing. The issue also flagged by NCDOT after an unannounced inspection. And we are going to be compensating the controllers for that and we will be getting much more aggressive or trying to find more aggressive ways to recruit new controllers. The agency will also be working with a third party company to improve the work culture, customer service and leadership. Now that we've been alerted to this problem, we are going to be very vigorous about making sure we don't get it again. Now, once on track, city leaders will work to find the right candidate to fill the CEO position. Now, despite the issues, there are no plans to stop moving forward on the transit plan. Live in studio, Jesse Pierre sending it back to you. Thank you, Jesse. Verify, WCNC Charlotte. Verify is all about trying to make a difference in the community by making sure that the community has the correct information. This is what we know, 
and hey, this is what we don't know, sometimes you're actually surprised by the answer. Verify the difference. Verify is a great way to combat that misinformation, making sure that people know the process of the reporting. The York County Sheriff's Office making its youngest hires yet. Yeah, the office says it's welcoming its first 19-year-old detention officers. Sheriff Tolson recently swore in Seth Schultz and Heather Culver. Both used to be civilian booking clerks before becoming detention officers. In January, Sheriff Tolson lowered the age requirement from 21 to 19 for detention officers in order to help fill vacancies at the county detention center. Right now, we got to talk about a new art exhibit. It's here in Charlotte. It features the work of the well-known Pablo Picasso, but it also sheds light on a lesser known artist, but it's a name you've probably heard a lot here in Charlotte, Romare Bearden. Yes, sure. He has an uptown park named after him, but Larry Sprinkle shows us how the Picasso event also pays tribute to the Charlotte born Bearden. Romare Bearden isn't just a well-known park in the Queen City. Bearden was a creative and influential artist who was born near what is now Uptown. And though he traveled all over the United States and the world and made a name for himself, he still means a lot to the Mint Museum and to the city of Charlotte. So the museum decided it would be great to highlight his work and show how much Bearden was greatly influenced by Picasso. We knew we had a Picasso show coming. We knew we were going to be the only East Coast venue. We thought, how can you know, all these people be coming in? How can we really spotlight Bearden even more? And so we decided to organize this exhibition, which explores their relationship. Romare Bearden, who was African-American, was a student of Picasso and other modern artists. And Picasso's impact on Bearden was profound. You can see that in the artwork. So you'll see a number of Beardens you haven't seen. We brought in Beardens from private and public collections across the country, um, along with a couple of more Picassos, um, so that people can really see that relationship uh, in person. The exhibition gives Charlotteans the chance to learn more about their own culture and history. If you didn't know Romar Bearden was from Charlotte, he really is one of the most significant American artists of the second half of the 20th century. Um, you know, he kind of reintroduced, reinvigorated the medium of collage. A lot of his work draws, looks back on his ties to the South. This is the first show to explore the relationship between these two amazing artists. It's called Rhythms and Reverberations, and it's just one part of the bigger Picasso exhibition, which has proven to be very popular. Our um, Picasso Landscapes Out of Bound show, it's drawing in people. Um, really busy on the weekend, so I would say if you want to come see it, definitely come midweek if you can. In Uptown, I'm Larry Sprinkle, WCNC Charlotte. Well, if you're interested in checking out the Picasso exhibition, head on over to WCNC.com or just find the story on our WCNC mobile app. The show actually runs through May 21st. So you've got a little more time. All right. Something to look forward to. Something to look forward to. Oh, new frontier. Yeah. Right to the moon and beyond. Beyond. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that blowing connection. your mind? Right. Right. The connection right here in the Tar Heel State. Yeah. yeah. Something special. And you have a personal connection as well. I do. I went to high school for a couple of years with Christina. Before yeah. she transferred to science and math, she was really smart, as you can see. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> certainly paying off now. Yeah. So uh, let's look into the forecast for tomorrow because I think the sunshine tomorrow afternoon is going to pay off if you're looking for a nice warm up as temperatures are going to surge into the 80s for the next couple of days. So that's a little bit of a hint what to expect in the short term. But there's more to the forecast than what meets the eye right now. Now, as we are drying out after some scattered showers this afternoon, temperatures 61. How it feels now will be in parallel to how it's going to feel by tomorrow morning. Once you wake up, many of us will be in the upper 50s out the door for tomorrow. In addition to the mild temperatures tomorrow morning, it is going to be foggy in some areas, perhaps not widespread, but I want to let you know that that patchy fog could reduce visibility. So be sure to use the low beams, be prepared to slow down, allow extra time to your commute. So you're not rushing to get from point A to point B and watch for those kids at the bus stop tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the clouds and the fog early on tomorrow will give way to some sunshine by noon tomorrow into the early afternoon time period. So we're looking at 
some nice bright blue skies by tomorrow afternoon. What a contrast from what we had today by Wednesday. Once again, mostly sunny skies. We will have some cloud cover developing. Nonetheless, we will stay dry into your Wednesday out the door for tomorrow may look a little murky early on between 7 and 9 a.m. But notice the sunshine by tomorrow afternoon. We'll have a southwest wind pumping in that warm air with highs near 80 for tomorrow. That's well above average on average. Yeah, we should be around. You see it here 70 degrees 69 70, but we're going to come well above that by at least 10 to 15 degrees between Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday back to reality by Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And here's why a cold front is going to pass through while we're dealing with dry weather the next couple of days. Those areas in Arkansas hard hit by tornadoes over the past couple of weeks, even within the last four days, they are under the gun once again for severe weather. Tornadoes will be likely that cold front is going to move towards us. That severe weather threat here at home is going to be weaker as it moves into the Carolinas. Nonetheless, we are watching for those showers and storms to be ongoing into the holiday weekend. I got a breakdown right now for those rain chances as you make plans for the weekend. Perhaps you're traveling Thursday into Friday. We'll have a cold front passing through rain chances around Saturday is going to be a wet day along with much cooler temperatures. So be prepared for perhaps not soaking rain, but we will have persistent light rain over the course of your Saturday and some of those showers are going to spill over into Easter Sunday. Check out the guy roof and seven day forecast next three days looking pretty good between Tuesday and Wednesday. Very warm by Thursday. We're tapping into that moisture that cold front passing through may trigger some storms Friday, Saturday and Sunday looks to be wet and that rain continues into your Monday after Easter guys. WCNC Charlotte weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on you know, how it threatens your family, your livelihood or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference that process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family. It's my friends. It's my neighbors. New at six in life, sometimes we have setbacks and for a Charlotte family, the word cancer changed their lives forever. But tonight, nine year old Cameron is doing well and thanks to make a wish, he was able to make a once in a lifetime trip reliving his favorite movie. WCNC Charlotte anchor Sarah French takes us along for the ride. Cameron was a totally healthy kid. Cameron's parents, Robert and Clary Gray, say they received the shock of a lifetime when their son turned seven. He started getting a very bad headaches uh, that we couldn't find the cause of. And we eventually found that he had a brain tumor. While Cameron had the tumor removed successfully here in Charlotte, his tumor was the kind that spreads. Uh, luckily, Cameron fit into a trial at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. Cameron had to receive two months of radiation and seven months of chemotherapy before returning home. And that's where Make-A-Wish stepped in, just in time for the one-year anniversary of Cameron returning home. I picked to do what we did in Home Alone 2 because I, it's my favorite movie. And Cameron wanted to do exactly what they did in the movie. So in the movie, Kevin McAllister gets a limo ride with cheese pizza. And so we so we got a limo ride and we had the cheese pizza in it. And oh, we went to FAO Schwartz also. All the kids come into the store and play with all his toys. This is a really fun part. We went and got a Sunday bar. We stayed at the Plaza Hotel where they stayed at in the movie. This is a vacation. It was beyond magical. There were some good happy tears. For sure. I'd like to kind of think that all the hardship that we went through made us stronger as a family. And I think it's true. And it's not like it's magically easier once you get back. Cancer's gone and treat, treatment's over and you're back in school. But um, it's a journey and we're all stronger for it, don't you think? Yeah. 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 The family says Cameron is doing well. He's finished with his treatments and there's no evidence of cancer. And they are just so thankful to make a wish for giving their family an unforgettable trip with memories they will cherish forever. For WCNC Charlotte, I'm Sarah French.
New at four, a local school that's been around for more than two decades is finally getting its first black leader. WCNC Charlotte's Kia Murray introducing us to the woman who's now leading Trinity Episcopal School in Uptown. You'll find Imana Cheryl in this courtyard every week. She looks over the hundreds of students at Trinity Episcopal School as they sing and dance during morning announcements. It's on these grounds she makes history. I come from a really long history of educators, even when they weren't allowed to learn. Cheryl calls it standing on the shoulders of her ancestors, and she stands tall as the first black woman to earn the title of head of schools at Trinity Episcopal. Throughout her life, Cheryl says being the first and only is nothing new. It's why she hopes in her field of education, more black women will walk through halls just like these to nurture students and lead with love. Because there's so many brilliant, bright, successful, authentic and thoughtful educational leaders that should be in this role right alongside me. So hopefully that opens the doors to thinking about having women of color in these types of roles. And as far as holding the door open for other diverse leaders to follow, Cheryl's goals put equity, inclusion, and belonging at the center. I think you have to be very intentional. Um, I always try to make sure that every decision that I make is mission and core values focused because it's not about me, it's about these 440 kids in that building and trying to make sure that we're developing them completely. I asked Cheryl how she wants to lead differently. She said she wants to take the lead on more community partnerships between the school and businesses in Uptown Charlotte. Now this is just one of many examples of WCNC's partnership with Pride Magazine to share stories like this one. If you'd like to see how Imana Cheryl got her start, you can read more at pridemagazineonline.com. I'm Kia Murray, WCNC Charlotte. <laughs> An update tonight as we follow a shooting in Cornelius. Police are looking for a 66 year old woman in connection to the incident. This happened earlier this evening at the entrance of Ramsey Creek Park. We know that someone was shot but aren't yet aware of their condition. Cornelius police say this was an isolated incident and they say the suspect is still on the run. Police are looking for this woman who is approximately 66 years old. She was seen walking in the area of Nance Road and West Catawba Avenue around five this evening. They say she's armed and dangerous. If you see her, police say you should call 911 immediately. The legal team for Shanquella Robinson's family is set to meet with White House officials this week. It comes five months after the 25 year old died in Cabo where she was traveling with a group of friends. Her family's lawyers want the U.S. government to intervene in the investigation. What is near me? If you see breaking news, just open the WCNC News app and go to near me on the bottom right. Tap share with us, upload a photo or video and tell us about what you saw. Hit submit and once you see success, your news has reached WCNC Charlotte. Local gun shops say that they've been busy ever since last week's override of North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper's veto of Senate Bill 41. This is the bill repealing the requirement to get a permit from a local sheriff before buying a handgun. You remember Governor Cooper vetoed that bill once it reached his desk. The Republican majority, along with a handful of Democrats in the General Assembly, made it law anyway, voting to override that veto. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us how that's impacted the process for buying a pistol. Hyatt gun shop packed on a Monday night. Workers say it was so crowded over the weekend, customers had to be one in, one out. We're going to have a couple of weeks where it's really busy, but South Carolina, Virginia, Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, they all have this same law that we have here. They don't have lines out the door. It just takes a little while for it to calm down and business will get back to more normal. Shop owner Larry Hyatt says most customers they're seeing were waiting weeks for their pistol purchase permit from the Mecklenburg County Sheriff. Now with the new law, they just have to clear the FBI background check at the store, which Hyatt says can take one to five days. Well, it's a little harder for us because we're doing more background checks here than what the Sheriff's Department used to do. Them. So we did them for rifles and shotguns, but now we do them for handguns too. While the law change is making things busier in here, one senator tells me he's worried about its effect outside of the store. It opens up a giant loophole when it comes to private sale of guns. So if you are an individual and you want to sell your gun to your neighbor, 
or someone down the street or a coworker. Well, now you're no longer obligated to perform a background check before you make that transfer of that firearm. That's because the old law required someone being privately sold or gifted a pistol to first get a permit from their sheriff. Now, the pistol purchase permit doesn't exist. Senate Bill 41 does nothing to strengthen the public safety of North Carolina. It actually takes us a giant step backwards. Mecklenburg County Senator Mujtaba Mohammed also argues federal background checks aren't as thorough as the sheriff's. Hyatt disagrees because they now must be run for every handgun purchase, whereas sheriff permits lasted for five years. We really needed this change. The law calls for state agencies to launch a campaign to promote safe storage of guns and give out gun locks. And it allows concealed carry permit holders to carry on private school campuses during church service. Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. In the meantime, we are seeing some state senators pushing for more gun control following last week's veto override. Democrats filed a new bill today to reintroduce a state level pistol permit requirement rather than the recently repealed county level requirement. The bill proposes the new process go through the State Bureau of Investigations instead of the local sheriff's offices. This Democrat backed bill does face an uphill battle, though, with a Republican controlled Republican controlled House and Senate. Well, a local teen who has always had an interest in cooking and dreamed of owning her own business, now making those dreams a reality. She is also hitting the road to share her passion with others. On a nice day in the Carolinas, food trucks aren't hard to find. I'm going to try and do my best sauce I can. Maybe a mixture or something would be nice. But this isn't your average food truck. How old are you? 13. That's right. Vivian Detali is just 13 years old. She's had a passion for cooking for a long time, so to her, a food truck seemed like the obvious way to put her skills to practice. That's when Vivian's Rockin' Concessions was born. When I started to cook, I realized how fun it was and how I'd like to see the smile on other people's faces and how they would love to see a 13-year-old especially making food and how cool, unique that is. On the menu, homemade Rockin' Burger Sliders and Italian chopped cheese, her own recipes. I just took the ingredients I used and I was just like, put this and that, put this and that. I use my seasonings and then I use my buns and then I use my meat. And I was like, this is really good. This is going to be my recipe. All of this she's doing on her own dime with some help that's from mom and dad. And I mean, they're the reason I have this food truck because obviously I can't buy anything on my own. Um, I actually need them to buy the license plate and all that and drive me places. So it's all thanks to them that I'm really doing this. Vivian says all of this is just a taste of what's to come. I really hope that in the future I will be remembered as a kid that started her own food truck and that's going to be like my like cue to where I started and people are going to remember that and say wow she's been working this since she was 13 that's actually pretty awesome. And we're saying wow right now mm -hmm. not even in the future. All right well the truck's grand opening will be at Camping World in Statesville on May 5th and 6th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Okay. When it comes to WCNC's chief meteorologist Brad Panovich, our viewers tell the whole story. Hey, if you're new to the area, this meteorologist is awesome. I always stick with Brad Panovich when it comes to severe weather. He's rarely wrong. You should follow Brad if you don't already. He's usually right on the money with his forecast. I don't look at anything else besides what Brad says. We are fortunate to have him here. Brad Panovich, experience the difference with WCNC Charlotte weather. Well, many of you pay your monthly homeowners association dues, expecting your HOA will live up to its end of the agreement. But a Charlotte woman says her HOA has moved so slowly to fix a hole in her roof. Her town home has suffered thousands of dollars in what she calls preventable damage. Six months after Hurricane Ian's heavy winds toppled a tree onto her home, rainwater continues to get inside. As she asks, where's the money? The HOA assured WCNC Charlotte's Nate Morbido they'll hire a contractor to make the necessary repairs by the end of the month. What the HOA won't tell us is why this has taken so long. We're talking about six months of exposure to the elements with nothing more than a tarp covering the roof. All while the owner pays her monthly HOA dues for a home she doesn't feel safe living in. Okay, uh, September 29th, a tree fell on the top of the townhouse. The storm itself caused enough problems. It's uninhabitable. The aftermath made matters so much worse. 
Um, well, it was devastating. Just when Shanti Horn and her fiance, Mark Bass, started preparing to put their townhome on the market, disaster struck. We had to call the tree remover ourselves. The tree removed, they quickly alerted their homeowners association of the underlying damage to their roof. Repairs legal documents show are the responsibility of the HOA. It shouldn't take this long. Six months later, the damage is still here. All the insulation is exposed, all the wood is exposed, the windows busted, the storage room is busted, so water has been pouring all through the townhouse from September to now. But not just outside. Step inside and then walk upstairs. Rain is pouring out of the outlets in the walls. And you'll find water damage in the walls. The ceiling is falling in upstairs and now it's poured down into the laundry room and the ceiling is caving in in the laundry room. Overhead and underfoot. The subflooring in the bathroom has gotten spongy now, so when you walk on it, it bounces. This is what she gets in return for the $185 she says she pays every month to the HOA. I'm paying it every month on time, and we expect the same courtesy. Horn says her community's property management company changed last summer, with Cedar Management Group taking over responsibility. State records show people from all over have named Cedar Management Group in two dozen complaints filed with the North Carolina Attorney General's Office since 2020, including this one filed in January, a complaint about an 83-year-old's damaged condo roof in Hickory. Her daughter told us it took several months for the company to make repairs. What most people don't realize is what a significant role an association and its board can play in your day-to-day -day life. Attorney James Galvin specializes in this area of the law. He says generally the best way to protect yourself is to do your research before you even move into a community. You can require a seller to hand over information about the financial health of your future HOA, as well as meeting minutes to get a feel for how responsive the association is when concerns arise. What the minutes will also do is give you a sense of the personality of the board. If you already belong to an HOA, he says it's critical to get involved. So if and when a problem surfaces, relationships already exist. Your rights will be more easily ignored um, if the board's not hearing from you, if you're not participating. Back in Kimberly Woods, Cedar Management Group shared limited information with us, insisting the Homeowners Association did in fact respond immediately once the HOA received proper notification suggesting Horn did not follow HOA protocols in this case. The company added the HOA has and will continue to exercise its due diligence in rectifying this issue, which includes securing multiple estimates before authorizing any contractual agreements of this magnitude. An email shows the company received a quote back in November, but needed approval from the board of directors before moving forward. Just weeks prior, Horn emailed the HOA to warn the damage might get worse over time. It's gotten just gradually worse and worse. And it did. For Horn and her fiance. It's ridiculous, yeah. The old saying rings true. Six months after Ian, when it rains, it pours. After all this, the HOA recently accused Horn of violating the neighborhood's rules, warning the board will fine her if she doesn't treat the bare spots in her lawn. Even though the covenant we reviewed shows it's the HOA's responsibility to maintain the lawn on each lot. We're told the HOA has since retracted that violation letter. Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. When did you know what you wanted to be? Hey mom, the weather's on! WCNC Charlotte's chief meteorologist Brad Panovich always knew what he was meant to do. All right, don't forget your umbrella. In fact, he joined the American Meteorological Society when he was 13. Now Brad is all grown up. You can see him right here on WCNC Charlotte, making sure you're informed and safe. Hey, where did all my hair go? Experience the difference. All right. Something to look forward to. Something to look forward to on the frontier. Yeah. Right? To the moon and beyond. Beyond, yeah. Isn't <laughs> that blowing your mind, right? Right. The connection right here in the Tar Heel State. Yeah. yeah. Something special. 
Yeah. You have a personal connection as well. I do. I went to high school for a couple of years with Christina. Before yeah. she transferred to science and math, she was really smart, as you can see. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, certainly paying off now. Yeah. So uh, let's look into the forecast for tomorrow because I think the sunshine tomorrow afternoon is going to pay off if you're looking for a nice warm up as temperatures are going to surge into the 80s for the next couple of days. So that's a little bit of a hint what to expect in the short term, but there's more to the forecast than what meets the eye right now as we are drying out after some scattered showers this afternoon. Temperatures 61. How it feels now will be in parallel to how it's going to feel by tomorrow morning. Once you wake up, many of us will be in the upper 50s out the door for tomorrow. In addition to the mild temperatures tomorrow morning, it is going to be foggy in some areas, perhaps not widespread, but I want to let you know that that patchy fog could reduce visibility. So be sure to use the low beams. Be prepared to slow down, allow extra time to your commute so you're not rushing to get from point A to point B and watch for those kids at the bus stop tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the clouds in the fog early on tomorrow will give way to some sunshine by noon tomorrow into the early afternoon time period. So we're looking at some nice bright blue skies by tomorrow afternoon. What a contrast from what we had today by Wednesday. Once again, mostly sunny skies. We will have some cloud cover developing. Nonetheless, we will stay dry into your Wednesday out the door for tomorrow may look a little murky early on between 7 and 9 a.m. But notice the sunshine by tomorrow afternoon. We'll have a southwest wind pumping in that warm air with highs near 80 for tomorrow. That's well above average on average. Yeah, we should be around, you see it here, 70 degrees, 69, 70, but we're going to come well above that by at least 10 to 15 degrees between Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, back to reality by Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And here's why. A cold front is going to pass through. While we're dealing with dry weather the next couple of days, those areas in Arkansas hard hit by tornadoes over the past couple of weeks, even within the last four days, they are under the gun once again for severe weather. Tornadoes will be likely. That cold front is going to move towards us. That severe weather threat here at home is going to be weaker as it moves into the Carolinas. Nonetheless, we are watching for those showers and storms to be ongoing into the holiday weekend. I got a breakdown right now for those rain chances as you make plans for the weekend. Perhaps you're traveling Thursday into Friday. We'll have a cold front passing through rain chances around Saturday is going to be a wet day along with much cooler temperatures. So be prepared for perhaps not soaking rain, but we will have persistent light rain over the course of your Saturday and some of those showers are going to spill over into Easter Sunday. Check out the guy roof and seven day forecast next three days looking pretty good between Tuesday and Wednesday. Very warm by Thursday. We're tapping into that moisture. That cold front passing through may trigger some storms Friday, Saturday and Sunday looks to be wet and that rain continues into your Monday after Easter guys. Well, today's another big day for the future of space exploration. NASA unveiling the four astronauts who will take a 10 day trip around the moon. Artemis 2 is the first crewed flight uh, test and it's a critical step towards a long term human presence actually on the moon. The chief himself, Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich, <laughs> in today for the midday show. He joins us more with this announcement. And Brad, some notable folks going to be on this mission. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. You know me, I'm a big space geek as well. I had to put my NASA shirt on today. But let me introduce you to the four astronauts that were picked to go back to the moon. From left to right on my screen here, you can see our commander. This is Reed Will uh, Wiseman, excuse me. This is Victor Glover. This is a very important person right here. This is Christina Cook, all right? She is a three-time graduate from NC State. She grew up in Jacksonville, North Carolina. And then our Canadian friends, Jeremy Hansen, he's the Canadian on this uh, crew as well. Now, this first mission is uh, going to be crewed. It's going to go around the moon. They're going to survey it. They're not going to land on it next year. The goal is sometime late in 2024, maybe around November. They will be the same crew, though, that will go on Artemis 3, which will actually land on the moon. Now, unlike the Apollo missions, we're actually going to try to uh, build a base there in the southern part of the moon. Remember, the Apollo missions were more in the equatorial or the middle part of the moon surface. This is going to be towards the southern end. And the reason for that, guys, is there is the possibility of some frozen water in those craters in the southern part of the moon. And the goal is to have the base be nearby where they can actually harvest that water and use it for the mission to eventually 
go to Mars because this is the first step in getting all the way to Mars. They got to establish a moon base first because if we do go to Mars, the, the way it's going to work, we'll go to the moon first. That'll be kind of like the midway point and then they'll go all the way to Mars. So kind of exciting news today. And, you know, you think about it, it's been over 50 years since we were last to the moon back in 1972. That was the last Apollo mission. So this is a whole new generation. And as you heard today in the announcement, they're calling it the Artemis generation. So our parents kind of grew up with the Apollo era. This is going to be the Artemis uh, uh, you know, mission, and it's going to go into the future and eventually to Mars. So pretty exciting day to see the first four that will be going back to the moon. And good to see North Carolina represented. I know. Isn't that yes. amazing? I love it. Yeah, she was my she was my favorite because I was hoping that she got selected and she was the very first one announced. And I kind of thought she'd be there because she is really brilliant and she's been uh, on many missions. Most of these astronauts have gone to the space station several times. They've had a long career already, so they're very well established. And it'll be very interesting to watch that launch next year barring any delays, which we know in space flight. There's maybe, uh, maybe Brad can get an interview with her. I think so. I would love to. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Brad, thanks, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Now a local visit from Bill safety. Damar Hamlin three months since he suffered cardiac arrest during that game against the Cincinnati Bengals. As Hamlin continues to recover, he's also focused on using his platform to educate others about life saving CPR. That includes a visit to the White House last week and a stop here in Charlotte today to team up with the Carolina Panthers for a CPR training and education session. Ashley Strohlein has more on how Hamlin is continuing to inspire others. Stro? Yeah, well, we always say it's bigger than sports, and in this case, it most certainly is. When DeMar Hamlin suffered cardiac arrest during Monday Night Football back in January, it impacted millions across our country, whether they were a sports fan or not. Now, the Panthers organization certainly watched with concern while everyone waited to see the outcome of DeMar's incident. And Nicole Tepper told us she wanted to do more than make a donation in DeMar's honor while he recovered. She wanted to find a way to make an impact in the lives of others by CPR certifying everyone at Tepper Sports and Entertainment. And thanks to a chance meeting at the Super Bowl, it all came to fruition. We're in Arizona, I was at a lunch, and I look up from this lunch and I see DeMar standing in the back of the room. I almost teared up, I think I did tear up, and I beeline to the bar like a fangirl. <laughs> and I introduce myself, I tell him who, he, who I was, and I start talking really fast. Nicole says that chance meeting is a God wink, divine intervention. And I was started telling him the story. We were going to donate to Chasing Amba, and then we decided we were going to do CPR training and all of this stuff, and you know, just in honor of you and Kim, and da, 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 and he just looked at me with this unbelievable smile, and he said, "I will be there." True to his word, Demar made his way to Charlotte for Monday's CPR training and education session held by the Panthers in partnership with the American Heart Association. You know, I always grew up wanting to be a football player, wanting to make it to the NFL. Um, and, you know, uh, this situation has just brought a whole bigger life purpose for me. And while DeMar's life purpose is an unexpected one, he's all in on using his platform any way he can. I just want to keep raising awareness and trying to get as many people uh, that we can CPR certified because you never know when you could be that hero. Uh, my trainers, like Nancy said, uh, everything went how it was supposed to go um, because they're well trained, they're well prepared, uh, they take the proper time out and, and making sure if moments like that happen that they know what they're doing and that's exactly what we're going to do here today. Now Tepper's vision for the hearts in our community to keep pounding has that many more CPR trained and educated people in it thanks to an unexpected friendship or perhaps a God wink at its finest. The real story is, is that I met a forever friend who I'm extremely proud of. Um, I will always have his back. I will always support him. Um, I'm his biggest fan, and I just can't be more excited that he took the time out of his schedule because you know you're all watching him, right? He's making a difference in this world. Yeah, so just amazing to be there today to hear Damar speak and share his story. I mean, we were all, we're all so concerned when that incident first happened, but now yeah. to see what he's doing with his platform. And I love the story that Nicole Tepper shared. I said, hey, how did you guys meet? She's like, oh, you're going to hear all about that. But a chance meeting at the Super Bowl and now yeah. a partnership where he came here to the Panthers and, and shared his time. And now that many more people in our community are CPR certified. Yeah. Talk about taking a moment and then, you know, 
building on it to impact people. It almost seems like Absolutely. it was meant to be. Yeah. How many people went out and learned CPR after that? Right, we even in our newsroom. I was about to say, we even had our own trainings here, yeah. So. so. Yeah, keep yeah. doing what you're doing. All right, yep. thank you, Stroke. Thanks. The new and improved WCNC Plus, now on Roku and Fire TV. Watch local live newscasts, get extended breaking news coverage, and see local programs and specials. The new and improved WCNC Plus, now on Roku and Fire TV. New at four, two donkeys are now back with their owners after getting caught by officers this weekend. Huntersville police posting this photo saying the donkeys were just grazing on some grass in the Stevens Grove neighborhood. Police say they corralled the animals into a fenced backyard where they waited for their owners. And that's when they say, look how cute they are. Their owners led them on a quarter mile walk of shame <laughs> back home. <laughs> Sweet little guys. A new push tonight to get more psychologists in schools. There is a bipartisan bill in the North Carolina Senate seeking to add more of these specialists in districts across the state. The National Association of School Psychologists say that North Carolina is actually one of the worst student to psychologist ratios in the nation and one of the lowest average salaries. WCNC Charlotte Shamaria Morrison looks at the latest efforts to change this. The bill comes as experts are warning about a mental health crisis in K through 12 students and as there are calls for more mental health resources inside schools to curb violence. If passed, the bill would cost taxpayers about $22 million. The money would go towards pay increases, recruitment, and retention of school psychologists. CMS school board member Jennifer Delahara has been calling for more state funding for school psychologists for years now. We have a lot of students uh, where um, suicide ideation is up, students who are battling um, you know, drug abuse and addiction. Um, obviously, there are concerns around firearms and weapons. The recommendation from the National Association of School Psychologists is 500 students per 100 psychologists. CMS is at one per 1,500 students. We know that the social and emotional well-being of our children is just as important and actually impacts their academic success as well. And what's really uh, poignant to point out is that our students are also asking for that. The bill would give school psychologists a $650 supplement and a 12% monthly bonus of their salary for being nationally certified. One benefit that we've been able um, to see in the bill is there is an increase in pay, which of course is really needed to be able to attract and then retain our school psychologists. The bill would also create a new grant program for schools to get money to recruit psychologists. CMS wouldn't likely benefit from this portion of the bill since it prioritizes school districts with little to no psychologists, which are normally small and rural districts. Very happy that other districts are going to potentially benefit, but this is another one of those areas where the larger districts sometimes get left out of what's otherwise really great, meaningful legislation. Money would also go to five North Carolina colleges, including Appalachian State, with the goal of doubling the number of school psychologists graduating from the schools. Shamaria Morrison, WCNC Charlotte. When I think about the community, I think about the time that I've been here. I've been in this community almost my entire adult life. So I, I, you, know, you get to know the people. When you know what they care about, then that's what you care about. This community looks at all of us who do weather here at WCNC Charlotte as part of their family. And uh, when you're part of their family, you wanna make sure you do it just for them. Right after practice and on a day between games, the Hornets still brought the energy to give back this afternoon at Spectrum Center. LaMelo Ball, Coach Steve Clifford, and basically the whole roster helping to pack 3,000 care kits for military service members preparing to deploy or returning from deployment at a number of local installations. This was done in conjunction with USO, USO North Carolina. The military and basketball are kind of similar, you know, it's competitive. So we we're, were comp competing even in the, in the boxes. So, you know, it's all the same thing, so it's fun. They're risking their lives in the front line, so. So that's crazy in itself to risk their whole lives for the sake of us, the children in the, in the youth, in the community. Snacks and thank you notes included in those packs. Hornets hosts the Toronto Raptors tomorrow night. If you're looking to buy a used car in Charlotte, you might be in luck. 
and really it's because on average we're seeing it's actually cheaper to buy now than it was just one year ago, but there are going to be some exceptions to that. Yeah, WCNC Charlotte's Carolyn Bruck here with the used cars that will cost you more so you're not left asking where's the money. So if you are in the market for a used car, I've got some good news. Used car prices nationwide have gone down 8.7%, which is around $3,000 less than it was just a year ago. Now in Charlotte, we're not as great, but still 8.1%, which is $2,700 basically. And this is just from a year ago. But as Vanessa said, there are some exceptions. So these certain vehicles will be um, more expensive, unfortunately. So Ford Expedition Hybrid, it's actually more expensive by 8.3% than it was just last year. So you're paying an extra $4,100 if you want this used car. The GMC Yukon XL, that's also up 8.1%, which is a $4,500 price jump from just last year. Mercedes-Benz GLS, 7%, but when it's a car that, that costs a lot more, that 7% equals $4,800 more than it was just a year ago. The Toyota RAV4 Hybrid, now you notice there are some hybrids on this mm -hmm. because of course those are the popular cars people want. This is up 6.8% from just last year, which is $2,400 increase. And then the, the Porsche Cayenne is 5.9% higher than it was just last year. And that's uh, $4,300 that you're gonna have to tack on to that. So if you are looking for a used car and you don't have deep pockets, steer clear of those ones. By the way, tomorrow, I'm gonna bring you the five cars that are um, costing much less this year than I need last to year. Know. Yeah, we'll wait for that I'll one. Need to know. Yes. Because right now I got empty pockets. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Same, Fred. I'm looking forward to that cheap list you got tomorrow. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. Where's the money? WCNC Charlotte. Where's the money really is about leveling the playing field. It's about helping others and breaking down barriers. We don't want our viewers to be taken advantage of, so we're here to help. See the difference. We see ourselves as a resource for the community. A lot of times when people get to us, they've tried all kinds of other alternatives. They've knocked on doors that haven't been answered or they go to places where there aren't doors. We create openings for them. And that's what we do with Where's the Money. All right, something to look forward to. Something to look forward to Always. New Frontier. Yeah. Right to the moon and beyond. Beyond, yeah. Isn't that blowing connection. your mind, right? Right, the connection right here in the Tar Heel State. Yeah. Yeah. Something special. Yeah. And you have a personal connection as well. I do. I went to high school for a couple of years with Christina. Before yeah. she transferred to science and math, she was really smart, as you can see. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> certainly paying you off now. Yeah. So uh, let's look into the forecast for tomorrow because I think the sunshine tomorrow afternoon is going to pay off if you're looking for a nice warm up as temperatures are going to surge into the 80s for the next couple of days. So that's a little bit of a hint what to expect in the short term. But there's more to the forecast than what meets the eye right now as we are drying out after some scattered showers this afternoon. Temperatures 61. How it feels now will be in parallel to how it's going to feel by tomorrow morning once you wake up. Many of us will be in the upper 50s out the door for tomorrow. In addition to the mild temperatures tomorrow morning, it is going to be foggy in some areas, perhaps not widespread, but I want to let you know that that patchy fog could reduce visibility. So be sure to use the low beams, be prepared to slow down, allow extra time to your commute so you're not rushing to get from point A to point B and watch for those kids at the bus stop tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the clouds and the fog early on tomorrow will give way to some sunshine by noon tomorrow into the early afternoon time period. So we're looking at some nice bright blue skies by tomorrow afternoon. What a contrast from what we had today by Wednesday. Once again, mostly sunny skies. We will have some cloud cover developing. Nonetheless, we will stay dry into your Wednesday out the door for tomorrow. May look a little murky early on between 7 and 9 a.m. But notice the sunshine by tomorrow afternoon. We'll have a southwest wind pumping in that warm air with highs near 80 for tomorrow. That's well above average on average. Yeah, we should be around, you see it here, 70 degrees, 69, 70, but we're going to come well above that by at least 10 to 15 degrees between Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, back to reality by Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And here's why. 
a cold front is going to pass through. While we're dealing with dry weather the next couple of days, those areas in Arkansas hard hit by tornadoes over the past couple of weeks, even within the last four days, they are under the gun once again for severe weather. Tornadoes will be likely. That cold front is going to move towards us. That severe weather threat here at home is going to be weaker as it moves into the Carolinas. Nonetheless, we are watching for those showers and storms to be ongoing into the holiday weekend. I got a breakdown right now for those rain chances as you make plans for the weekend. Perhaps you're traveling Thursday into Friday. We'll have a cold front passing through rain chances around Saturday is going to be a wet day along with much cooler temperatures. So be prepared for perhaps not soaking rain, but we will have persistent light rain over the course of your Saturday and some of those showers are going to spill over into Easter Sunday. Check out the guy roof and seven day forecast next three days looking pretty good between Tuesday and Wednesday. Very warm by Thursday. We're tapping into that moisture that cold front passing through may trigger some storms. Friday, Saturday and Sunday looks to be wet and that rain continues into your Monday after Easter. Guys. First, it's hard to believe we are more than just more than uh, three years into the COVID pandemic and doctors, they're still learning so much about the virus. Many who battled COVID lost their sense of taste and smell and continued dealing with those symptoms for months or even years. In my case, NBC's Kristen Dahlgren has more on the new hope for those patients. Jennifer Henderson wouldn't normally cry over a cup of coffee. Is it strong? Yeah. <laughs> but she hadn't smelled one in nearly two years. It smells like coffee. After a COVID infection in January 2021, Jennifer Henderson never got her smell or taste back. You couldn't smell or taste nothing, anything. Nothing. And then after about a year, it wasn't that I couldn't smell or taste anything. Now the taste was off. It was terrible. Food she once loved tasted disgusting. Chicken. I couldn't eat chicken. What did it taste like? It tasted like rotten flesh. Jennifer grew depressed. Meals were unbearable. It's hard to get through each day. And then a Facebook group with nearly 50,000 people with similar complaints led her to Dr. Christine Shin at the Cleveland Clinic. It was incredible that something simple as the stellate ganglion block could produce this type of result. The stellate ganglion is a nerve bundle in the neck. Numbing it has been used for a century to help regulate some pain and circulation. So doctors tried the procedure on long COVID patients. We have seen quite a good um, response, but there are also patients who don't respond. And we're still in that phase where we're trying to figure out who it's going to help. Doctors still don't know exactly why it works to restore taste and smell. But Shin estimates it helps about 50% of patients. Shin plans to start the first clinical trials for its use in treating long COVID soon, but in the meantime is offering the procedure to patients like Jennifer. Now getting her third round, a quick injection into her neck. Within minutes, Jennifer tries something she hasn't tasted in years, watermelon. You can taste it. Oh, wow. Dr. Shin says some patients see instant relief. Others get senses back over time and some nothing at all. It's unclear if improvements are permanent and insurance coverage also varies by plan. Oh, God. But for Jennifer, you're my hero. <laughs> <Give me> my <laughs> the results it's couldn't no, be I sweeter. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, Cleveland. And there was a shooting this evening, too, in East Charlotte. It put one person in the hospital. That happened at the Avalon Apartments just off Albemarle Road. Medic says that person has life-threatening injuries. No word from CMPD yet on a suspect. We are lurking, working to learn more, though, about what happened.
we've talked about local police department efforts to recruit more officers and specifically more women to bear the responsibilities of the badge. If you're looking for a shining example of a female on the force, we've got one for you tonight. Yeah, we want to take you to the campus of Kannapolis Middle School, where you will meet our latest Hyundai hometown hero, an officer making such a difference in the community. Many students call her mom. And today we can call her a worthy recipient of the Charlotte area Hyundai dealers brand new Santa Fe. It's early morning and Kannapolis Middle School is enjoying a special rally before class. Little do students know this rally is about to become recognition for someone making a major impact on the community. She goes above and beyond for the students and for the staff. You'll often find her after hours in the community attending things for students that aren't required of her. That's really our mom, like our school mom. Like we go to her and talk about stuff. Like if we need to get something off our chest, that's more of like our counsel. Is there an officer Armstrong? And when we call school resource officer Nija Armstrong to the auditorium stage, you can see the effect she has had on these kids. Miss Armstrong has dedicated herself as a police officer, a school teacher. She's really just become a, a shining star of the community. You know, today, on behalf of the Hyundai dealers of Charlotte area, I'd like to congratulate you and offer you a new car. It's always important to give back to the community, you know, and, and the community or, or the people that enable us to do what we do. So whenever we can return that favor to somebody deserving of it, it it's really worth it. She is a hometown hero. She's a hero to us, but she gives us an opportunity to say, hey, we're human. Understand, we're here to help. A member of the force and a force for good, driving our kids to be the best they can be. I'm very grateful, appreciative, like, they know I love this shop. I give the kids my all here. Like, whatever they want, whatever they need, whether I'm getting paid for it or not, I'm there for them. And driving off with a well-deserved Hyundai Santa Fe. I love the kids here. I love working here. It's, whew. It's definitely a lot. That's all I got. <laughs> so, um, you know how we talk about when things happen for a reason. There are other layers to the story. We didn't realize until after we had given her the surprise. She was actually supposed to go that day and buy a new car. How about that? <laughs> She'd actually planned to go with a friend. It's because her prior car broke down. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a red charger. She said she loved it. She loves red cars. She and got that's, a red car. That's the other layer. Oh, wow. But we didn't know that at the that's time, awesome. but it just all works out. I believe she'd been praying for that. That's she, probably an an, that's probably an answered prayer. I think so. Good for her. Yeah. And they always respond the same, always humble, always love what they do, would do it for free. Yeah. yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. Looking ahead to Friday, that's when the health insurance coverage of millions is at risk. A pandemic era rule that protected people from losing Medicaid coverage is set to expire. Usually a Medicaid recipients need to renew their coverage every year. But in 2020, lawmakers passed a rule that kept people automatically enrolled even if they no longer meet the requirements for coverage. 15 million people are at risk of losing coverage. Friday will mark the start of an unwinding period where states will check everyone's eligibility and send renewal and termination notices. This is expected to last 12 months. Experts predict unenrollments to start trickling this month. WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on you know, how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Anticipation along with a show of force is growing in lower Manhattan right now. Former President Donald Trump is expected to be formally charged tomorrow. The case involving a payoff to former adult star Stormy Daniels to keep quiet about an alleged affair ahead of the 2016 election. It will be the first time ever a former president will face criminal charges. Jay Gray is in Manhattan with more on what comes next. Former President Donald Trump making the trip from Mar-a-Lago to Manhattan a day ahead of history. 
Tomorrow afternoon, the 45th president of the United States expected to become the first to sit in the Oval Office, then stand before a judge facing criminal charges. We don't know what's in the indictment yet, but um, yeah, it's, it's pretty surreal, to be honest. The indictment will remain sealed until after his arraignment, but sources tell NBC News the former president will face more than 30 charges in the case involving hush money paid to former adult star Stormy Daniels just ahead of the 2016 election to cover up an alleged affair. The Trump legal team says he will plead not guilty. Um, the team will look at every every um, potential issue that we, we will be able to challenge and we will challenge it. Security will certainly be a challenge. There are no credible threats, according to police. Still, New York's mayor has this warning for potential protesters. Uh, while there may be some rabble rousers thinking about coming to our city tomorrow, a message is clear and simple. Control yourselves. New York City is our home, not a playground for your misplaced anger. The entire NYPD force, 35,000 officers, is on alert. The FBI also on the ground, and the Secret Service will be with the former president at all times. Jay Gray, NBC News, New York. Welcome back. Spring break is almost here for most of the Charlotte area schools. And if you're planning a getaway, you have to be prepared to pay more for just about everything. Yeah, almost absolutely everything. As you said, Charlotte's Carolyn, Char uh, WC's Charlotte's Carolyn Brooke is here with the uh, prices you can expect to pay. So you're not left asking, where's the money, Carolyn? Well, you might be left asking, where's the money? <laughs> I got to be honest, All but, right. but, but I, we'll can, be prepared. I can prepare you at there least for having to pay so much more. So let's talk about it. I mean, that, if that gives you any indication, Mm -hmm. Because uh, the spring break yeah. is up and it's up in all cases, but one. So let's talk about airline tickets. <laughs> I mean, this number 26.5% higher than it was just one year ago is I think we can all agree is ridiculous. Yes, yeah, it's absurd. It's a lot. Hotels and motels. So once you get to your destination, you've got to find somewhere to stay, right? Hotels and motels up 7.4 percent and I guess you look at this and you say okay so last year this was around I think 15 percent so I guess <laughs> it's a little less but it's still almost eight percent more restaurants because you have to go out to eat right if you're going to a place where you don't have a kitchen you got to go somewhere to have food and that's up eight percent uh, and I was actually surprised by that number not being higher admissions and this is this is an average for admissions to things like amusement parks water parks um, any any sort of place where you want to go to spend your spring break you're going to expect to pay six percent more now this is the one area that is uh, less expensive this year but not by much so car rentals a one percent decline from last year. So if you are headed out, make sure you bring your piggy bank because the cost of spring break, cha-ching. It's breaking the piggy bank, really. Yeah, it really is. You have to take all your pennies with you. It's unfortunate. Rent a car true. and just drive around the area here. I mean, hey. I mean we're lucky that we live in such a nice place, right? <laughs> right. We don't have to go anywhere. Just go to North the park. Carolina, right? Just rejuvenate tourism right here. Go to the home. mountains, exactly. go for Carolyn, a hike. That's Hopefully free. you're giving some ideas to people at home. We yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Connect the dots and let us clear up the confusion. We're here to make sure the news makes sense. And with Connect the Dots, you'll understand how the headlines impact your family. See the difference on WCNC Charlotte. Some galactic news this afternoon. Another big day for the future of space exploration. NASA revealing the four astronauts who will take a 10 day trip around the moon. One of them has ties to the Tar Heel State. Christina Koch is an NC State grad. She's going to make history as the first woman to fly to the moon. Artemis II is the first crewed flight test and a critical step towards a long term mission. This morning, Brad Panovich actually talked about the major announcement and the mission goals. You can see that full report right now on our app. Hundreds of new homes are coming to Rowan County. It is just part of the growth that's happening in the city of Salisbury and nearby town of East Spencer. WCNC Charlotte's Kaylin Hagwood is in East Spencer with more on the developments and how people who live in the area are responding. Well, here on Bringle Ferry Road, you see mostly trees in this area for right now, but town leaders tell me more than 120 homes have been approved for that side of the street with more developments on the way. A town on the move. It's an older community, but we're on the verge of um, a huge explosion. 
Town manager Michael Douglas says the population of East Spencer is about 1,500, but could soon see some new faces. East Spencer is right in between Greensboro and Charlotte, and that's why there's a lot of growth. Already, he says, two major subdivisions have been approved and are expected to bring more than 120 homes to Bringle Ferry Road and more than 50 to McCandless Road, with new businesses possible as well. East Spencer has been a neglected community for years. This growth is beyond imagination for us. A similar story in the city of Salisbury, just minutes away, where new homes are coming, including on Earnhardt Road and right downtown. The city says apartments are even being built above businesses like Threadshed, where Dave Laughlin works. I've been downtown for 47 years, and there's always something going on that's good. And again, I think it's because we care about our town, we care about the old structures. Across the street, the city says the Empire Hotel, which has been vacant for decades, could also see new life with a boutique hotel, row homes, a restaurant, and more proposed. Amtrak is expanding service here in Salisbury. We're looking to improve our main street. Good growth for everybody, smart growth. Back in East Spencer, Douglas says this side of Bringle Ferry Road could see some development too. They're considering homes or businesses, but that all depends on if they get approval to make some road changes that would more closely link the town to I-85. Kaylin Hagwood, WCNC Charlotte. All right. Something to look forward to. Something to look forward to. Oh, we frontier. Yeah. Right? To the moon and beyond. Beyond, yeah. Isn't that <laughs> blowing your mind, right? Right. The connection right here in the Tar Heel State. Yeah. yeah. Something special. Yeah. And you have a personal connection as well. I do. I went to high school for a couple of years with Christina. Before yeah. Before she transferred to science and math, she was really smart, as you can see. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> certainly paying off now. Yeah. So uh, let's look into the forecast for tomorrow because I think the sunshine tomorrow afternoon is going to pay off if you're looking for a nice warm up as temperatures are going to surge into the 80s for the next couple of days. So that's a little bit of a hint what to expect in the short term. But there's more to the forecast than what meets the eye right now as we are drying out after some scattered showers this afternoon. Temperatures 61. How it feels now will be in parallel to how it's going to feel by tomorrow morning once you wake up. Many of us will be in the upper 50s out the door for tomorrow. In addition to the mild temperatures tomorrow morning, it is going to be foggy in some areas, perhaps not widespread, but I want to let you know that that patchy fog could reduce visibility, so be sure to use the low beams, be prepared to slow down, allow extra time to your commute so you're not rushing to get from point A to point B, and watch for those kids at the bus stop tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the clouds and the fog early on tomorrow will give way to some sunshine by noon tomorrow into the early afternoon time period, so we're looking at some nice bright blue skies by tomorrow afternoon. What a contrast from what we had today. By Wednesday, once again, mostly sunny skies. We will have some cloud cover developing. Nonetheless, we will stay dry into your Wednesday. Out the door for tomorrow may look a little murky early on between 7 and 9 a.m., but notice the sunshine by tomorrow afternoon. We'll have a southwest wind pumping in that warm air with highs near 80 for tomorrow. That's well above average on average. Yeah, we should be around, you see it here, 70 degrees, 69, 70, but we're going to come well above that by at least 10 to 15 degrees between Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, back to reality by Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and here's why. A cold front is going to pass through. While we're dealing with dry weather the next couple of days, those areas in Arkansas hard hit by tornadoes over the past couple of weeks, even within the last four days, they are under the gun once again for severe weather. Tornadoes will be likely. That cold front is going to move towards us. That severe weather threat here at home is going to be weaker as it moves into the Carolinas. Nonetheless, we are watching for those showers and storms to be ongoing into the holiday weekend. I got a breakdown right now for those rain chances as you make plans for the weekend. Perhaps you're traveling Thursday into Friday. We'll have a cold front passing through rain chances around Saturday is going to be a wet day along with much cooler temperatures. So be prepared for perhaps not soaking rain, but we will have persistent light rain over the course of your Saturday and some of those showers are going to spill over into Easter Sunday. Check out the guy roof and seven day forecast next three days looking pretty good between Tuesday and Wednesday. Very warm by Thursday. We're tapping into that moisture that cold front passing through may trigger some storms Friday, Saturday and Sunday looks to be wet and that rain continues into your Monday after Easter guys.
All right, well, a new age of gaming to talk about. Local developers getting a head start in the video game industry and introducing a new generation of people to coding and programming. And this weekend, you can actually get the chance to play their games. Brittany Van Voorhees tells us how. Here's a story to put all four letters in the science, technology, engineering, and math STEM acronym. Super Abari is a community-driven arcade and game bar with a goal of highlighting independent games. Amar Ahmed is the game designer for Crab Volleyball. Although he has a background in software development, there was a significant learning curve. While I knew the software and I was able to make that, um, it got really hard for me to kind of get the full experience from the hardware side, so I had to learn a lot about soldering, I had to learn a lot about um, just wiring things, how power works, you know, grounding of wires. Wilder Ham developed The Legend of Zelda Pinball. He says one of the best parts of the journey is watching people enjoy your game. And it's great. People, people see this as a really challenging project and they appreciate it. And when I look at it, all I see are the flaws, but you know, it's, it's a passion project. Owner Zachary Pulliam says it's important to give these artists a chance to show off and create a relaxed environment for all to enjoy. I think it's a really nice place for you to come, feel comfortable, meet like-minded people, and you know, also try out some games that you won't get to play anywhere else. The gaming community hopes this event will spark creative interest for gaming and others. Plus, supporting local is always great for business, especially based on how much effort the creators put into these games. For WCNC Charlotte, I'm meteorologist Brittany Van Voorhees. <laughs> WCNC Charlotte. This is Flashpoint. Thanks for joining us here on Flashpoint. I'm Ben Thompson. Healthcare for thousands of people here in North Carolina could soon be on the way. This week, Governor Cooper signing the Medicaid expansion bill into law. It's something that's been years in the making. Republicans eventually swayed by nearly $2 billion in federal incentives. And now some 600,000 folks could get the care they need. Joining us now is the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. Secretary, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Absolutely, Ben. Thanks for having me. So this week, a big deal here in North Carolina this week, becoming one of the last states to finally expand Medicaid. We've talked about it for about 10 years now. Given that most states have already done this, given the fact that you sort of are aware of how these things go in all 50 states, what is this going to mean for those 600,000 people here in North Carolina who finally have access to affordable health care? Ben, perhaps there's no better way of saying it than to say to those 600,000 uh, Americans in North Carolina, to the governor, to all the legislative leaders, you've just given people peace of mind. Uh, to all those people who today know that if their child all of a sudden becomes uh, deadly, deadly ill and needs to go to a hospital, you don't have to worry anymore. If I take my child to the to the hospital, will I not have the money to pay the mortgage or or my rent? Will I go bankrupt? That used to be the case, and a lot of folks would have to weigh those decisions and sometimes not go to the hospital or not buy the medication. Today, 600,000 people have the peace of mind to know that they can take their child to the hospital. Um, for our friends down in South Carolina, which by the way, only about 10 miles from where I'm sitting here in Charlotte, um, they have not expanded Medicaid. What else do you think needs to happen to get those last few states on board? You know, 40 states have given millions of their residents the peace of mind. Uh, but you're right, there's still 10 states in America who have not. And it's a, it's crazy to believe, but there are still millions of Americans who don't have the opportunity that their fellow Americans just across the state border have to have that peace of mind. We It's not something we can afford to do, and it's not something a country as great as America should do. Switching gears now, this week the FDA approving the over-the-counter uh, Narcan. It's a drug that can reverse overdoses. It's been talked about for quite some time. How do you see this changing the game when it comes to overdoses here in America? Oh, it's it's like uh, getting three new strikes when you're at the plate. Uh, we know that a lot of people are dying today because they don't realize that the drug they're about to ingest or inject is laced with uh, deadly fentanyl or other drugs. And what happens is you have younger and younger populations that are dying from overdose. Narcan is one of those drugs that helps offset. It, it, it reverses what some of these deadly drugs like fentanyl can do, uh, what opioids, excuse me, can do, and it could save a life. Now the fact that you can get it over the counter will make it far easier for some of these folks who are still using drugs to save a life.
or for a family member or a friend to be able to save a life. It will change. It is a true game changer, but we have to make sure that it's done right. And so for that reason, we want to make sure when it gets on the market, it's affordable. When it gets on the market, it's uh, easier to understand where to get it. And when it gets on the market, finally, we make sure there's accountability to make sure it's being used the ways we want it to be used. Let's talk about insulin prices. Three of the major producers uh, of insulin announcing caps at 35 bucks a month. Uh, it's something that the administration I know has been working hard on, but it's just one of, as you know, ex many extremely expensive drugs. Help us w work this out. I, I realize this is different, but at the same time, I know folks at home want to understand why can we not apply this same sort of thing and scale it to say other prescription drug costs? Well, Ben, they're right. There's no reason why we shouldn't. And, and so that's absolutely the correct question. Why are, why are we doing it for insulin, but not for so many other drugs that we need that are so, so expensive? And that's the, the answer. Uh, that's the question that the president answered by making sure we passed his new prescription drug law that will lower the cost of uh, prescription medication. Let's talk about COVID. Um, here in a little more than a month, uh, the public health emergency is set to uh, end. I know while vaccines will remain free, I think coverage of some of the over-counter tests will, will, will end. Are, are you worried that this would lead to less testing and potentially more people going to, to work, school with the virus? Or are we now saying as a country, okay, that's a level of micromanaging this virus that we're not going to do anymore? Well, I, I'm hoping that what happens is because we are at a different place than we were three years ago with COVID, uh, that we can <clears throat> say that we're no longer in a state of emergency that we can't control, but that we know how to control. We know how to manage COVID. And ha ha having learned how to manage COVID, vaccination, distancing, masking where necessary, that what we'll do is we will put it as into part of our routine, just the way we will get the flu vaccination, just the way we ask our kids to get vaccinated for measles and for uh, smallpox and the rest. We're gonna try to move America towards putting this part of their routine to protect against COVID. And the best way, of course, is to get the vaccination, uh, stay updated. So it's gonna get to the point where we hope it will be once a year for most Americans, get that vaccination, and you're in pretty good shape when it comes to COVID. Obviously, continue to be smart, don't do crazy things. But that's where we hope we'll go, Ben. But the bringing down the public health emergency means that we're in a better place, but that still means we have to work hard to protect ourselves. Does this mean, mean the end of folks needing to necessarily quarantine anymore? For the most part, remember, we still have Americans who have low uh, immunity because of uh, they may have cancer. They're taking drugs that lower their immunity, make it tough for them to fight off uh, those types of viruses and diseases. And so we always have to protect our, our elderly uh, loved ones who are not as strong anymore. Our children sometimes can have certain diseases. So there's always going to be a case where we have to be careful. Quarantining would be one of those examples where it's a severe example of how we try to protect ourselves from those who might spread uh, a disease. But for the most part, as I said, we've learned to manage COVID so we can move away from some of the more dramatic measures that we had to take before. Finally, let me ask you, it's not exactly your wheelhouse, but you are Health and Human Services. And, and we have saw once again this week that there's um, gun violence, the number one killer of, of children in America. Your thoughts on our inability as a country to tackle this problem? Well, we have the ability. We just have to be willing to use the wherewithal we have. And unfortunately, from my personal perspective, we haven't. Uh, I consider, we at the Department of Health and Human Services consider gun violence a healthcare crisis because it impacts not just those who are the victims of gun violence, including up to death, but it, it, it hits every family member. And I, I must tell you that uh, today Americans are suffering, suffering by the death of children uh, at the hands of someone wielding weapons of mass destruction. And I, I would say that it's time for us to realize that we have it in our power to reduce gun deaths. We just have to be willing to take so, some of those actions and keep those weapons that are not meant to be principally defensive or for hunting out of the hands of people who are using them in a way that kills our loved ones. Are you optimistic that anything will change anytime soon? Look, I'm always optimistic. I'm the son of immigrants. And so uh, I, I do believe that this country will learn. 
Uh, and sometimes we we take a little while to learn, but that's the beauty of America. We move forward, we learn, we don't want to go backwards. And I think we see that we should not be the king and queen of gun violence in the world. And we will learn because it's our children who are suffering because of our inaction. U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. Secretary, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. All right, take care. Well, the primary for North Carolina governor now less than a year away. Coming up next on Flashpoint, the first Republican candidate to announce his bid for the governor's mansion. Tonight, we are learning a man has died from his injuries following a shooting in Gastonia last week. Police say 61 year old Clifford Scoggin died at the hospital. Officers say 58 year old Calvin Black shot Scoggin and assaulted a woman inside a home on Osceola Street last Sunday. When police arrived, they say they ended up shooting and killing Black. The woman was treated and is expected to be OK. The Carolinas rank in the top 25 nationwide for the most lightning strikes in this week's Weather IQ. Meteorologist KJ Jacobs explains what you can expect when lightning strikes. I'm in Kannapolis, the lightning capital of North Carolina, just north of Charlotte. In 2022, Kannapolis had more lightning events than any other city in the Tar Heel State. Lightning is a spectacular weather phenomenon. It goes viral when captured on camera. June, July, and August account for more than 75% of the yearly lightning strikes in North Carolina. A positive lightning strike is typically 10 times brighter, 10 times stronger, 10 times louder. Positive lightning bolts originate from the top of the thunderstorm, which allows them to be powerful and deadly. 90% of lightning strikes are negatively charged and tend to branch out. On radar, the frequency of lightning strikes can signify a storm is intensifying or weakening. And we hear thunder when the air expands and contracts due to its intense heat. Because light travels faster than the speed of sound, you will see lightning before you hear thunder. Thunder can be heard about 10 miles away from the apparent storm. And if you can hear thunder, you are close enough to be struck by lightning. Do not shelter under trees or open structures. Do not touch electronics plugged into the wall and do not use running water. If you ever at a ball field like this one in Kannapolis, the 30-30 rule can help keep you safe. If you hear thunder within 30 seconds after seeing lightning, go indoors. Stay there for at least 30 minutes until the last sound of thunder. In Kannapolis, a meteorologist, KJ Jacobs, W, CNC Charlotte. Two missing boys from Concord have been found safe in Missouri. That according to the Concord Police Department. They say authorities found the brothers and their father at a Super 8 motel in Rockport. That's about two hours north of Kansas City. The boy's father has been taken into custody. He's now facing several charges. Police say they're working to get the kids back home to their grandmother in Concord as soon as possible. Matter of fact, I would say that Charlotte at number three and Minneapolis at number four are going to be the biggest surprises uh, around the country uh, when they look at our uh, project that we've completed here. I think the thing that pushes Charlotte over the top, uh, especially against some of the similarly sized markets, number one, you have that motorsports footprint. There are thousands of people employed in motorsports in Charlotte, from the race teams to the facility to even the NASCAR Hall of Fame. So that gives Charlotte a real advantage in terms of just the number of people employed in sports. I think another thing that helps Charlotte is an oversized media uh, footprint. When you think about ESPN and how many employees they have for the SEC network, uh, for ESPN events, which runs a lot of their business out of Charlotte, uh, so that can't be underestimated. And I think that gives Charlotte an advantage that maybe some other cities at size don't have. 
Uh, getting back to our methodology a little bit, one of the buckets of data that we use, we interviewed about 100 top-level executives from around the industry and just got their anonymous feedback. We wanted them to be as uh, honest with us as they could. Uh, they gave Charlotte really high marks. So uh, it's a great environment for business. Uh, the banks and financial sector really underpin a lot of the sponsorship here, and I think that's important. Uh, plus, not to mention, great people, great weather, great food and restaurants. It really is just outside of sports a great place to live. So uh, people may be surprised by Charlotte, but I think folks within the sports industry will not be nearly as surprised. I think one thing that Charlotte has done over the last few years is build some more hotel rooms. That's important. Uh, you know, we have talked for years and years about it. would Charlotte ever be able to potentially host a Super Bowl? Uh, maybe wanting a domed stadium is part of that, but another part of that equation was just how are we going to fit all these people in the city when they're coming in for a Super Bowl? They're starting to resolve some of those problems. Uh, so I think events in Charlotte, you mentioned a lot of them, uh, don't underestimate what goes on at, at Quail Hollow. Uh, the PGA Championship, the Ryder Cup, those are really big sort of premier marquee events, and Charlotte is winning a lot of those bids. So uh, I think that as the city grows and as it uh, establishes these public-private partnerships around sports, uh, I don't see this as something that is going to uh, recede. I think Charlotte is going to continue to be a hub for sports. One of the metrics we looked at, uh, Charlotte actually in our study came out as the fourth fastest growing region in the country. So Dallas is our number one city in this report. Dallas is very similar to Charlotte in that it is a growth city. Uh, if you think about Dallas, you have so many transplants from California that move in uh, because of the low taxes. Uh, government regulation is not nearly as strict. It's just very business friendly. Uh, Charlotte, kind of on the East Coast, has that same dynamic. You have people moving in from New York. You have people moving in from Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland. We know that because when you go to a Panthers game and those teams are playing, it's hard to tell sometimes who the home team is. <laughs> but that plays into Charlotte as a destination city. This is the type of place that people move to and they stay because they like it. So the facilities in Charlotte are top-notch. Uh, Virtually any kind of sport you want is played here. Uh, we'll see if Charlotte is in the running for a Major League Baseball team or not. Uh, even if they don't get it, it's easy to see that the Knights have one of the top minor league facilities anywhere. That's uh, almost like watching Major League Baseball when you go to a Knights game. Uh, it's a great environment. So uh, Charlotte has a lot going for it, and I think they've put a lot of effort into this in the last few years, and this is the result of that. Well, one of the things we looked at was if I'm a, uh, let's say I'm a salesperson for a vendor in the sports space and I want to visit a city and in two days I want to make as many in-person sales calls as I can, Charlotte's a great place for that. All of the properties are located essentially within blocks of each other uptown. Uh, getting around Charlotte is not nearly as difficult as it is, say, in Los Angeles or Atlanta, two cities that are bigger than Charlotte but got dinged for this type of thing in our survey. So I think Charlotte um, is, uh, it rates really highly with people coming into town. They like what they see. Uh, they know that uh, they can do business here. Uh, when you talk about the financial services industry, just look at what they've done with local sponsorship. So, you know, Bank of America obviously has a huge uh, relationship with the Panthers in the stadium. Uh, Ally with Charlotte FC's jersey. Ally has been a great corporate sponsor and has done a lot of really innovative stuff with their sponsorships. Truist has the deal with the Knights. Uh, Lending Tree has the Hornets jersey patches. So these are all local financial institutions that are heavily invested in sports and that means a lot to people when they come into town. They know they can hit up four of the biggest sponsors in sports and they're all located within just a block of each other right uptown. So those are the kind of things that help Charlotte out a lot. The financial services industry, you know, is the bedrock on which the city's built. I think as a baseball city, the first thing you have to think of is there are 81 home games. Are we really going to be able to draw 30,000 people a night to 81 home games? There's reason to think that you can. Number one, the weather here is fantastic. So uh, you're not going to have some of the problems you may have in Cleveland, uh, you know, and uh, Milwaukee as far as getting snow dates. 
But, you know, can Charlotte support 81 home games a year? That really is a big question. Um, you do, like I said, have so many transplants that you'll have a lot of fans from the visiting teams that will go and show up for games. I think that will help. Um, we'll see. I mean, I think we weren't sure that soccer was going to be uh, was going to take off in Charlotte, and we see how successful that's been. Uh, just looking at what Charlotte FC is doing right now, winning and losing doesn't seem to matter. They're having great success now. Over time, that's where winning and losing. We say around here all the time, there's no promotion like winning. So there's no marketing or sales efforts you'll ever be able to do that is better than just winning games, and so. If Charlotte has a Major League Baseball team and they end up being a small market team with a low payroll like, say, Pittsburgh or Cincinnati or Detroit, and they're going to kind of languish around the bottom of the league, baseball's uh, revenue sharing structure is such that you'll have the Mets with a $300 million payroll and the Pirates with a $60 million payroll. That's pretty unique in sports. So if I were to look into a crystal ball and say 10 years from now Charlotte had a Major League Baseball team, but its payroll was near the bottom, and they weren't able to really compete with some of the other big market clubs, that's a possibility. It could turn out that way. It could also go a totally different way where they're more like, say, Tampa, another small market or low revenue team, still finds success. So uh, there's no promotion like winning, and that will cure all ills, but there are still some questions Charlotte's going to have to answer about whether they can support a Major League Baseball team. And I think Charlotte was in the running for FIFA... World Cup qualifiers, uh, they want to be in the conversation for every major sporting event. Uh, Charlotte has had Final Fours, and Charlotte has, you know, North Carolina is obviously a great market for college basketball. Uh, you know, I think back to even 30 years ago, did we even think the NFL was going to succeed in Charlotte? I mean, there are a lot of people who have doubted Charlotte over the years, but the business climate here, there's a lot of smart people working on it. Um, they know what things they need to address, uh, and Danny Morrison and the crew at the Charlotte Sports Commission do a great job of sort of looking at these problems and trying to address them. Uh, as long as you have corporate support on your side, uh, that will be a big feather in their cap, and it will help them compete against some of these other markets. Um, if you look at the top 10 cities in our recent survey of the best cities, six of those 10 are sort of what I would call sunbelt cities. So Phoenix, Las Vegas, Nashville, Atlanta, Charlotte, Dallas. Uh, business is moving away from New York and Los Angeles. There's no question about it. Taxes are too high. Cost of living is too high. Uh, some of the regulatory problems these cities have are just a lot to overcome. Charlotte, Dallas, Atlanta, they don't have a lot of these problems. And so you see businesses moving to these cities, and they're growing. And I don't see that kind of growth on the coast anymore. I think we're undergoing not just in sports but really the whole country is undergoing a shift away from those two markets, and markets like Charlotte are definitely taking advantage. All right. Something to look forward to. Something to look forward to on the frontier. Yeah. Right? To the moon and beyond. Beyond, yeah. Isn't that <laughs> blowing your mind, right? Right. The connection right here in the Tar Heel State. Yeah. yeah. Something special. Yeah. And you have a personal connection as well. I do. I went to high school for a couple of years with Christina. Before yeah. she transferred to science and math, she was really smart, as you can see. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, certainly paying you off now. Yeah. So uh, let's look into the forecast for tomorrow because I think the sunshine tomorrow afternoon is going to pay off if you're looking for a nice warm up as temperatures are going to surge into the 80s for the next couple of days. So that's a little bit of a hint what to expect in the short term. But there's more to the forecast than what meets the eye right now as we are drying out after some scattered showers this afternoon. Temperatures 61. How it feels now will be in parallel to how it's going to feel by tomorrow morning once you wake up. Many of us will be in the upper 50s out the door for tomorrow. In addition to the mild temperatures tomorrow morning, it is going to be foggy in some areas, perhaps not widespread, but I want to let you know that that patchy fog could reduce visibility, so be sure to use the low beams, be prepared to slow down, allow extra time to your commute so you're not rushing to get from point A to point B, and watch for those kids at the bus stop tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the clouds and the fog early on tomorrow will give way to some sunshine by noon tomorrow into the early afternoon time period, so we're looking at 
some nice bright blue skies by tomorrow afternoon. What a contrast from what we had today by Wednesday. Once again, mostly sunny skies. We will have some cloud cover developing. Nonetheless, we will stay dry into your Wednesday out the door for tomorrow may look a little murky early on between 7 and 9 a.m. But notice the sunshine by tomorrow afternoon. We'll have a southwest wind pumping in that warm air with highs near 80 for tomorrow. That's well above average on average. Yeah, we should be around. You see it here 70 degrees 69 70, but we're going to come well above that by at least 10 to 15 degrees between Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday back to reality by Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And here's why a cold front is going to pass through while we're dealing with dry weather the next couple of days. Those areas in Arkansas hard hit by tornadoes over the past couple of weeks, even within the last four days, they are under the gun once again for severe weather. Tornadoes will be likely that cold front is going to move towards us. That severe weather threat here at home is going to be weaker as it moves into the Carolinas. Nonetheless, we are watching for those showers and storms to be ongoing into the holiday weekend. I got a breakdown right now for those rain chances as you make plans for the weekend. Perhaps you're traveling Thursday into Friday. We'll have a cold front passing through rain chances around Saturday is going to be a wet day along with much cooler temperatures. So be prepared for perhaps not soaking rain, but we will have persistent light rain over the course of your Saturday and some of those showers are going to spill over into Easter Sunday. Check out the guy roof and seven day forecast next three days looking pretty good between Tuesday and Wednesday. Very warm by Thursday. We're tapping into that moisture that cold front passing through may trigger some storms Friday, Saturday and Sunday looks to be wet and that rain continues into your Monday after Easter guys. At WCNC Charlotte, we really want to make a difference. We have tools like Verify and Where's the Money to really listen to viewers and see what they're struggling with, whether that's trying to get money that you deserve or answering a question that's confusing you. We're not the experts, we're interviewing the experts. And that's why we wanna bring it to you so you can see the facts, how we check them and how we get the answer. Developing now new details about the Chinese spy balloon U.S. officials shot down over the South Carolina coast back in February. The Biden administration says the balloon did gather intelligence from several sensitive military sites. It first entered U.S. airspace over Alaska. China has said repeatedly that the balloon was an unmanned civilian airship that accidentally strayed off course. begins what's expected to be a consequential week for former President Donald Trump and our entire country. This afternoon, Mr. Trump expected to make his way to New York before his arraignment Tuesday. Wake Up Charlotte's Bree Jackson now in Washington with more on how this week could play out. Good morning, Ben. Former President Trump posted on social media that he plans to travel to New York this afternoon and stay at Trump Tower before being arraigned on criminal charges on Tuesday. How do you feel, Mr. Trump? Former President Trump preparing to voluntarily surrender to New York authorities. He's gearing up for a, a battle. Um, you know, this is something that obviously we believe is a political persecution. Trump is the first former president to face criminal charges. Sources tell NBC News there are about 30 of them related to alleged document fraud. Their exact nature will be unveiled during his arraignment Tuesday. We will take the indictment. We will dissect it. Um, the team will look at every every um, potential issue that we, we will be able to challenge and we will challenge them. The indictment is connected to alleged hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. This is less about the crime and more about the target. So um, it has to play out. It's very sad for our country to have to go through this. I would hope uh, and pray that whatever comes forth that they've done due diligence. The legal fight comes as Mr. Trump makes his third run for the White House. His campaign says they've already raised more than five million dollars since he was indicted last Thursday. What they think that they're going to do to President Trump, it's going to boomerang back on them. This whole process of them indicting Trump is a sham. The former president will fly from Florida to New York this afternoon and stand before a judge Tuesday. And after his arraignment in New York, former President Trump plans to go back to Florida and deliver remarks from Mar-a-Lago on Tuesday night. 
in Washington. Bree Jackson. Well, spring just started, but if you've got kids, now's the time to start planning for ways to keep them occupied this summer. How's that going? We are already in the planning process. <laughs> it's a struggle, I mean, from really what I is. hear. Especially with the budget, right? Right, the budget and, and really just the timeline. Yeah. You got to get started That's early. Right. WCNC Charlotte's Carolyn Brock is joining us with what we need to know before selecting a summer camp for those kiddos. Okay, so here are five steps to help you select a summer camp. And this is according to the Better Business Bureau. They took a deep dive into this. The first thing you need to know is accreditation. Mm. You need to check for that. So there is a um, accreditation kind of organization called the American Camp Association. Um, it will accredit camps in the United States if they meet 32 national summer camp standards. So that's a good place to start. The second thing to know, safety requirements. Yes, we are no longer in a pandemic, but COVID could still be a concern. So you wanna know what the camp protocols are. What are the health guidelines? Are visitors gain, gaining access to that camp? So know these things ahead of time. The third thing, get references. Yes, this is not a uh, job interview, but at the same time, you are going to be putting your child in the care of these people. So ask camp management. It's totally in your right to ask them to put you in touch with past campers so you can discuss their experiences with the camp. And also make sure you check those online reviews. Just mm -hmm. get a deep dive and be thorough with that. Mm -hmm. you, this is something that you cannot overlook. Evaluate health resources the camp has. Interesting. You want to ask about the medical facilities on site to treat your camper if they do become sick or injured. So is there one that's on site? You also need to know the camp policy if medical care is in fact needed. You also need to know if there are kids, if this is like a sleepaway camp and you, your child maybe has to take a daily medication, what are the accommodations for that? who is in charge of administering it. You just want to iron out all those details so you're not surprised about it in the end. And this one, speaking of budget, guys, you <sighs> have to review the contract and the fees. you got to read the fine print. You cannot trust or take the word of anything that is said to you. You have to read that contract before you sign it. And it's very important for you to ask about the total cost. You want the deposit included because some camps have this deposit requirement that's separate from the total cost. You say everything included I need to know before you sign. That's what you need to know. Here are the five steps to pick that summer camp. I know it's a lot of information, but no. it's important. Well, when you're a parent, you got to do your due diligence, right, Carolyn? So yeah, good, I'm trying to help here. Good steps there. We appreciate Things it. Things to keep in mind. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, it certainly felt like we got the summer vibe. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. With your help, WCNC Charlotte is making a difference in our community. We want people to know it's okay to ask for help. We are the guardrails to some of these families who are struggling. We get to present a check for $5,000 via the Techna Foundation. These people give up their heart and their time, and they don't get anything but thank yous in return. If you'd like to make a difference, go to WCNC.com slash make a difference now. Time now to connect the dots. Would we make the news make sense? Recently, several swastikas have been discovered on the campus of Queens University and at a Jewish temple in Boone. And now leaders across the country are still trying to figure out why an unsettling trend is growing. Attacks against the Jewish community Good evening, everyone. Fred Shropshire here with WCC Charlotte. I want to welcome all of the people on our Facebook page, on our web page, and on our YouTube channel who are tuning in for this special town hall that we have for you tonight. Bring it home. We're helping black applicants overcome mortgage disparities. All of this born uh, out of uh, a, a series of stories that we've been covering. I want to first introduce the panel that we have with us this evening. Uh, we're joined by uh, Aaron Barbie who is the Senior Vice President of Program and Fund Development with Dream Key Partners. We have Dwight uh, Crawford, who is a uh, lender uh, with uh, New Res. We have Michael Horde, who is the head partner at Horde Law, and also jo joined by Dr. Melita Pope-Mitchell, who is the interim dean over at the College of Professional Studies 
at Johnson C. Smith. And uh, not uh, last but not least, my colleague, Nate Morbino, who's been doing some awesome reporting. Nate, I want to bring you into this uh, conversation at this point, because really you did a story, um, a series of stories. You had one this evening as well, where you're uncovering these numbers where black applicants in the Charlotte area we're finding out have been uh, denied two to three times more uh, than their white counterparts when it comes to mortgage applications. Yeah, so n number one, not only are black applicants denied at, at two to three times, you know, higher rate at the largest lenders, most of the largest lenders in Charlotte, but that population overall is underserved when it comes to the number of mortgages, home loans originated, you know, just about 13% for a population that makes up almost 25% here in the Charlotte area. And so we've been really pushing this issue. The disparities are clear. The data is clear. There are disparities. Obviously, this is a nuanced issue. There are several layers to it. Uh, and what we wanted to do tonight is to provide solutions. And I will tell you, while, while we're giving solutions directly to people, uh, the House Financial Services Committee next week on Wednesday will be meeting in Washington, D.C. to discuss this very problem, access to homes, access to loans. And we just want to offer people today some real solutions and opportunities and direct them to resources as the federal government begins to really take a hard look at this issue, which is now considered one of the uh, two top priorities for the uh, agency that holds oversight over the mortgage industry. Now with the new administration in the White House, uh, as Representative Alma Adams told me, who is on the House Financial Services Committee, we know that this is a problem and we are going to address it. And the NAACP here in Charlotte told us as well, the system needs to be revamped. And we're gonna talk about that. And we're also gonna offer some other solutions tonight. Okay. Well, I wanna start with uh, with Dr. Belita Pope, uh, who who is, uh, as I said, a, a Dean over uh, at Johnson C. Smith. Uh, you actually deal with educating um, students on, on some of the challenges that, that people have had to overcome when it comes to obtaining a mortgage. Our college, the Metropolitan College of Professional Studies, houses our business and economics program, which is uh, preparing students to go into uh, specific fields that are going to address these disparities. So we have students who are going into finance, um, dealing with mortgage lending and things of that nature. And we're also super excited about our new partnership with Project Destined, which is allowing students to gain uh, real life expertise in the real estate market. Um, our students are going into uh, this with the possibility of earning a real estate license at the end of their coursework and are actually participating in real life projects with other students across um, other institutions as well as individuals who are currently working in this field. And I think we lost, we have, uh, oh yeah, we have Michael Hoard here who is actually um, you deal with a lot of a lot of um, black realtors. What are they seeing uh, from clientele uh, in the Charlotte area in terms of this this issue that we're facing? And you're on mute too, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to call it that. Okay. So thanks for that question. Great question. And um, I just wanted to say that I'm a part of a nonprofit here. Charlotte Crown Black Real Estate Association, where we focus on issues like this. But specifically, when I deal with realtors in closing transactions, um, I've noticed that the problem is not only education of the borrower or the populace, but it's also the activities of the lender that causes some of these disparities that we see. Uh, specifically, uh, loan officers should be educated about the process before they take somebody's application, uh, before they pull their credit, which could damage them later. Um, and, and some of that occurs quite a bit. And, and I've even heard uh, crazy stories of how folks will see a name or hear a voice and then decide not to even pull credit and tell somebody they pull credit, but they didn't qualify. So you have, you have a small portion that, that still uh, is subject to discrimination. And, and, and that's something that needs to be um, taken, up, taken up and we need to challenge it and, and, and have a battle with that as well. Uh, separately, the, the challenge is just education about credit financial literacy, understanding what you need to actually get the loan done. Um, and, and my organization, we, we work on that day in and day out. And, and I would hope that um, realtors would, would, would refer folks to these resources that they have to learn more about the process and what they can do and how they can improve their credit scores, as well as make sure the income is there to uh, get into homes. 
I wonder right now if, if we could get a quick lesson on credit, you know, like what do we need to know about credit? You know, what affects our credit rating? How long does this credit hang with us? What do we do to try to clean it up? Great question. So, so if I could, um, so, so the a FICO score is what a lender uses to determine your credit worthiness. Uh, and a FICO score uses various elements to figure out um, the, the number that they will look at. Uh, one important thing is to remember that if you have a credit card, say, uh, you don't want to use more than one third of what you have on it. So if you have a credit card for $3,000, don't use any more than $1,000. And if you do, make sure you make the payments on time every month. And don't just pay the minimum, pay more than the minimum. That helps build your credit. There are different types of credit you also want to have, and not just credit cards. But um, credit cards, uh, if you have an auto loan, that, that will help you, of course, get, getting uh, your score up as well. And, and you want to keep the good credit. So don't close credit accounts if you have good credit history on them. If you close them and they have good credit history, there's no, gonna, no longer to be used for your, uh, your score. Uh, and if you have collections, of course, make sure you take care of those. Call these companies, make negotiations, get them settled, and get them off of your credit report and give yourself time to heal. Um, that, that's just a few tips uh, for, for putting your credit up. I'm sure the other panelists would have other tips as well. I'm wondering, is there a baseline in terms of the, the credit score? Because we hear terms of good credit, uh, excellent credit, low credit. Is there a baseline that people should be thinking about before they consider buying a home? So um, this is Aaron. I'm happy to jump in on that one. So of course there's a baseline, right? So at a minimum of 580, some lenders will uh, work with a 580 in order to make it happen. Uh, minimum 620, ideally 640. But your question was, should they have the, achieved this credit score prior to uh, going down the home ownership path? And that answer isn't always yes. We know that some people will see that, their credit score and say, I can never own a home. What we ask is that that people can be engaged in these education programs like we offer at DreamKey Partners in order to get the financial literacy they need to build their credit. So I, I, I hope that's not a barrier to people starting their journey. Yeah, and you also, with your program too, you also help, it's not just people buying homes, but it's people staying in their homes too, uh, maintaining, being able to maintain mortgage payment, right? Yeah, absolutely. So through through the financial education that we offer, we want to make sure that people know how to stay in their home. Um, unfortunately, if people get to the point where they have to consider foreclosure, we want them to come and work with us. We do have a specific department who can help people prevent foreclosure. And right now, during COVID-19, we have seen that people are at risk of losing their homes. And so we offer financial um, literacy in, in partnership with our uh, mortgage assistance program through the city of Charlotte. We want to make sure that people can stay in their homes through this hardship uh, and make sure that they have the financial stability that they need to get through this. I want to just back us up a little bit. Nate, you can jump in here, but we're having this conversation and we're offering, I hope at this point, people who are listening, um, some tangible help because we're operating within a, a system uh, really that has, has not, has been hard for um, people to navigate, right, Nate? Yeah, I mean, you know, there was a, a subcommittee hearing last week in Washington where much was talked about when it comes to technology, when it comes to automated underwriting, which is the, the president and CEO of Community Link told me, it's designed for a person like me. It's not designed for people like you, right? And you also have these kind of uh, credit risk systems um, and interest rate, you know, risk-based systems that are technology that have biases as well. And that's another part of this issue. And I also want to kind of push back too, because a lot is made about the need for, for financial literacy. And without a doubt, it's part of, it's part of this, right? Um, Fred, you were engaging with someone online earlier who, you know, came from a position of, well, of course we need financial literacy because look, about, look where we came from. Look at the decisions we've had to make to be frugal, right? Uh, to, try, to try to learn how to, to, to use the money within the system that we're living in. And I think that in some ways it's easy to dismiss this as just a financial literacy problem, but it's not, it's systemic. Yeah, what do you say? And I wonder if, um, I, I wonder if I could get uh, some, some, some of you on the panel to weigh in on this because we're coming, we're jumping in this um, in the in smack dab in the middle of 
uh, 20, we're, we're, we're in 2021, but clearly this is a, this is something that, that has history behind it. It's not a coincidence that there's, there are these disparities. Um, who can speak to why these ex disparities exist in the first place? And that's to anyone on the panel who wants to jump in. Fred, I'll jump in from the educational perspective. So when we think about the history of uh, economic mobility, not just here in Charlotte, but in our nation, we're looking at individuals who have not been trained in specific areas. So I'm so excited about the work we're doing at Johnson C. Smith because we're preparing the next generation of students to go out and to work in these different industries. That's one way to try to combat some of the misinformation and some of the stereotyping that goes on when it comes to individuals being able to obtain uh, mortgages and to purchase their own homes or purchase commercial real estate for their own businesses. It's really important for us to look at educa educating the community, not just from the financial literacy perspective, but actually training individuals who will go out and obtain the jobs in finances, obtain the jobs in real estate and things of that nature to be able to combat some of that. That seems like such a significant step to me to diversify kind of the industry, right? Absolutely. And that's, that's one thing that we're really pushing to do is to, to get our students and the community to understand the various um, um, opportunities that they have. You know, when we think about real estate, we don't necessarily think about becoming a realtor. We don't think about, you know, the underwriting and the, the, the lenders and everything that goes into the home buying process or the process of purchasing um, property for your businesses. So we're really excited about being able to train individuals and, and give them opportunities like through Project Destin that showcase um, things like real estate acquisitions and development management and uh, financing properties to really educate individuals on all the aspects that it takes to get to that point where you're having keys put in your hand for your new property. Fred, this might be a good time to bring Dwight in too, because Dwight's a lender. You know, he's with New Res. Um, when I was going through my three month long investigation, I analyzed New Res's data and their disparity rates are below the average for the market. Um, about 8% of originations at New Res went to black applicants in the Charlotte market. And, you know, Dwight, you can really talk about it from a lending perspective, like what, what are lenders generally doing to try to combat this and reduce these disparities and eventually hopefully eliminate them? Well, it's a great question. And um, there's a couple of different things. Uh, right now, I'm on a, a team that from sales to operations, underwriting to senior management is just simply dedicated to um, trying to change the way that um, certain groups of people or actually all people um, who have who have the need for home ownership, who have never had the those opportunities either through economics, through racism, through family, in, um, just they're the first people in their family to even think about changing that mindset. We're there to empower them and we're, we do it in a very simple way. Um, as a lender, we, we're typically, when it comes to a borrower, we're looking at three basic components. Um, we've talked about the credit. It's, and there's also assets and their income. Um, well, we can't change anybody's income. The income is their income. We just need to find um, a, a home for that particular income. But um, as Attorney Hoard mentioned, credit is not something that is, is, is stagnant. It's something that can be changed, it can be fixed, and it can be worked on. And I've been working in partnership with uh, great organizations like Dream Key. I've been connected with Dream Key um, for, I don't know, close to 13 years and been a part of what they've done um, from the, the asset perspective. Because really, it, down payment assistance is one of the, the strengths of the organization on top of the education. Um, and we, what I've seen is that that down payment assistance is an equalizer. What it does is it helps people to come up with the funds because it's, you know, it's very difficult for a single mom to start putting away thousands of dollars just so that she can come up with a down payment or for closing costs. So these, it, it helps in a way that you could never imagine because it equalizes. So we as a lender, what we're trying to do and we've been dedicated to do is to make sure that 
that folks have access to money, not just from the lending perspective, but also from the, the basics of a down payment for closing costs. We have a credit enhancement department that will teach people what to do because credit is, is one of those crazy things. And if you're looking at first time home buyers, one of the problems we have is that there is a cycle of renting. And unfortunately, if you don't know and you're taking your information from your uncle or your mom or your dad who's never purchased a home, it makes it difficult. So we try to take out some of that misinformation and give them the direction that they need to be successful. Dwight, I want to ask you um, a question that you kind of you mentioned to us offline here. It was a comment that you said, um, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glancing at some of the comments and I heard what you just said about, you know, there being these basic things like the income and the credit score and the debt to income ratio, all of those things. But you said something that was very interesting and it's something that we have to account for in this discussion. And that's the discriminatory, that's the discriminatory practices that we see, because that's where the problem happens. And you were saying that, you know, with some of, if someone sees money from a certain source, there might be an assumption with the home buyer. Can you speak more to that? Absolutely. Um, the topic that we're talking about is discrimination in lending, but sometimes the discrimination starts way before a file comes to our desk. And one, my specialty is I layer down payment assistance, meaning that I will use money from the city, I will use money from the state, I'll use money from private sources to give clients literally tens of thousands of dollars. But in the state of North Carolina, on our offer to purchase contract, it's required for someone to disclose that to a, a potential seller. So before they even um, get a chance to get into the game, just because of the source of their funds, where their, their offers are not even being looked at. And I don't believe that it's coming from the perspective of a a, a home buyer, or excuse me, a home seller, they don't know the difference between a down payment assistance or not. This is something that needs to be dealt with from the real estate professional perspective. Because I, I do a lot of business with, with listing agents, and I do a lot of business with selling agents. And they're there simply to do one thing, to move that house to get people in, into their homes. So they're looking to protect, um, or what they believe to be protecting, um, their client. The problem is, is in that protection, there's also discrimination. And, you know, it's, it's been part of the real estate world from the beginning of this country, you know, and the only way that we can change that is if we remove that from the contract, it should be removed. It's because and you might as well say, well, hi, I'm, I'm a, I'm a poor white person or I'm a poor black person. And you can't put that on a contract. So why would you put that on a contract to show, Hey, yes, I'm low to moderate income. Uh, because the majority of my clients are single black women and they're you trying to use this money and they can't they're not even getting their offers accepted and that's a general assembly issue right that's something that the state law needs to change if i could, if I could so the contracts are um actually recommended contracts by the, the um, state um, realtor association and they're, they're prepared by attorneys and then the realtors are told to use them and, and um, within our organization, I've advised realtors that um, if, if an attorney, first off, realtors cannot practice law. So for preparation of a contract is practice, practice of law. If an attorney prepares a contract that they can then use, we can obviate that issue. Um, we, we've had discussions about going to the uh, National Association of Realtors as well as the North Carolina Association of Realtors and, and the local realtor association are pushing back. And I think there's, there's a, a a large group that's interested in removing this from the contracts, but most realtors are going to take the contracts that are recommended and use them. And that's what's occurring, but those are not mandatory. They can use um, altered contracts, different contracts are used at all times. What struck me so much as I was kind of looking into the disparities here in Charlotte were the resources that are available to help with down payments, to help with closing costs, to try and help reduce interest rates. You know, it, some of the lenders are doing that, obviously dream key, Aaron, you, you all are involved with that. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the money that's actually available to help? If, if you can overcome the, the whole issue of the fact that your source of income may be a problem for the, the mm -hmm. selling realtor, the money's there. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. The money is there. So we are excited to partner with the city of Charlotte to offer the House Charlotte program. And that's a down payment assistance program that has many facets to it based off of what your need is. So specifically, we target and work with families who are at 80% of area median income. And what that means is that you would need to be for a family of four around $66,800 for your annual income. And just because because of that, you could get $10,000 of down payment assistance through this program. We also have programs that are specific to those who are uh, public service employees. So if you work for the city of Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, CATS, or the, the CMS school system, you also can get access to specific down payment assistance in the amount of $10,000. One of the great things that's come forward, especially since COVID-19, is a program called the Community Heroes Program. And that is for our, our families that have people who are essential workers, who are um, in law enforcement, firefighters, first responders, and there's an opportunity for you to get up to $22,000 of down payment assistance. And these are tangible, actual programs that people can participate in right now. How do we find those, Erin? Yeah, you can go to our website at dreamkeypartners.org and you can look under the programs department and you can see all of the offerings for the down payment assistance that we have and our education. I did want to enter one thing into the conversation that we haven't talked about yet. We talked about financial literacy. We talked about funds that you can get your hands on, but we haven't talked about as counselors. So through our organization, we have someone that wants to join your journey. We've had people in our program two, three, and four years with the same counselor who is helping to advise them on their journey to home ownership. And it is so rewarding to see that person get the keys in hand. But what that, that counselor does is help you to get through crisis, is a sounding board for you to, it, to reduce your debt to income ratio, is a sounding board for should I take on this credit or not. We think that that is very important to the success of obtaining a home, is making sure you have someone that you can just bend their ear about your finances. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. I interviewed a woman who was denied uh, her initial home loan, her mortgage, she was denied because of her debt to income and her credit. And if, if that were me, I, I could have easily given up at that point, right? Absolutely. She had the drive, number one, but she, she also had someone there guiding her to kind of let her that we can get over this hump. And I think that's so critical. How, how soon in the process do you need to connect with someone like that, a counselor? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So we ask that you would um, attend our courses so that you can get the foundational education that you need in order to be successful, meaning going through your credit report, um, having the opportunity to understand your money mindset. And once you've completed that and that course is two to three weeks, depending on how, what series you're in, then you have access to that counselor that will join you for two to five years. So almost immediately. Yeah. And I want to jump in here and just remind our audience who's who's listening in on this conversation. You have a panel of uh, obviously very well-versed experts here to take advantage of. If you want to ask uh, some, some constructive questions, that's what we're here for. Um, I want to, I want to, I want to ask um, Michael Horde here a question just, or actually all of the panel I can ask because you guys are pretty tapped into your industry and you're also tapped into this issue nationally. How does this look? How does Charlotte, the Charlotte area look compared to other markets? Um, obviously, the disparities are a problem nationwide, but are we any more empowered, less empowered or uh, equivalent to other areas? How do we compare? So, so if I can comment on that, um, uh, and before, before we talk about the historical context, um, I think um, we, kind of, we kind of need to educate people about why there is a difference sometimes too, because folks think that everything is even, uh, there's a level playing field, which there is, there is no level playing field. There, it was a wrong that was done and it's not been corrected. But aside from that, Charlotte is, is unique in that the growth is phenomenal. And what, what's happening is you're having growth um, stimulated by out of the city and out of state uh, players. And because of that, prices are increasing. And a huge problem for our clientele is affordability. The affordability of housing is, is a huge issue for the city of Charlotte. I'm just not sure, and I don't have um, 
uh, great hopes about what's going to happen in the city regarding affordability in the future. There are ways to combat it, and, and, and we do our work, all of the folks on the panel do our work to try to combat that. But, but uh, the hope is waning in terms of keeping it affordable here or making sure affordable housing units are available. Um, that, that's, that's, that's one piece to it. Um, another piece is that the Char Charlotte is a great place to be in. People are moving here in droves. Um, and I think that um, we need to be at the forefront of arguing for a higher minimum wage. Uh, so so when, when folks' income level, we talk about income as a factor, and that's in income as a factor as well. If we don't raise minimum wage, we'll have a situation where you have extremes. You have a, very few haves and, and, and a whole bunch of have-nots. And that's going to cause the destruction of our country if we don't get a handle on it. Greed is something that we have to take care of. I'm sorry, let me get off the soapbox. <laughs> Do you guys think, I want to throw this out there because you brought it up in terms of affordable housing, and this is kind of a current event question, you know, with the city um, looking at possibly putting in these, putting in duplexes and triplexes in certain single family home uh, zoning areas. What are your thoughts on, on a move like that in a city like Charlotte? Is it effective? Could it be? So I can speak to that just a little bit. I am certainly not on the development side of Dream Key Partners, but I do see how there is a great benefit to having mixed opportunities for housing within neighborhoods. So what we see is that not everyone can afford a single family home at the price point uh, that we just talked about, right? These homes are $400,000 at a time, but there may be a possibility for someone to be able to purchase a condo or a townhome and enter at a lower price point that would be more amenable for them to be affordable. And so there's great support from our organization in, in, in diversifying the types of housing that's available. And I know it's a hot topic in Charlotte right now, but we have to consider how do we get more people access to homes so that they have housing stability and build generational wealth. We have to do that through diversifying. Yeah, and one of the things that I, oh, I'm sorry, Nate. Um, no, go ahead, Dwight. Uh, one of the things that, that I, um, it's been one of those bees in my bonnet is that when we, we discuss affordable housing, um, it, it's a percentage of what a, a developer is building, and it's typically going to be rentals. Um, and we've, we've done, I've seen a lot of that, and, it, and it, the, the problem is it does not help to build that generational wealth. It continues to perpetuate the cycle. Um, I, I will say this also, and I'm, I'm sorry to... to keep on harping on, on um, Dream Key, but they've built amazing homes, they built amazing neighborhoods, and then they were able to come in with federal funds, state funds, and local funds to help people to purchase those homes. Um, there's a lot of different organizations um, that, are, that are revitalizing historically black neighborhoods that are putting the money back in there to try to I would um, keep the, the folks that have been there in there, but we need more of those. But the problem, of course, is space. So go back to your original question. Maybe the idea of building up is not a bad thing. A two, because we we're not a real multifamily home type of city, you know. But if you go to a more, more of the larger metropolitan cities, you've got m mixed use properties with homes above them um, that people can own and build that, 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 that kind of generational wealth that we we're discussing. So it's not a bad idea. It's just finding the space because we're limited geographically. We only have a certain amount of square footage here in Charlotte. So the only other alternative is to, to build up. Hmm. Nate, were you going to jump in with something? I was earlier? just going to say, you know, the city of Charlotte's looking at other cities that have done this. You know, we've reported on, you know, in Minneapolis has, has, has looked at this. And, and, you know, with all of these issues, something that struck me in my reporting is that we, we have systems that are meant to be equal, right? They're meant to be race blind, including the mortgage lending industry. But the truth is, it's an equal system for people who are not equal, who have unequal circumstances, right? As much as we want everyone to be equal, you're comparing apples to oranges. And, and I think what happens here, particularly when you're looking for affordable housing, and I think a, common, a commenter said as much, I mean, you're basing um, affordability on white wealth and what, what, you know, what the average person in Charlotte can afford. And, and that's a different profile, quite honestly. Yeah. 
We got a question here that I want to pose out to uh, anyone on the panel who can answer this. Um, when when people are putting when people are putting in their applications, their loan applications, um, do they ask for do they ask for race information? Is that data captured? What happens to that data? How is it used? I think I could speak to that. Um, yes, the it is not a requirement for any mortgage application. It's something that we and all lenders throughout the entire country request or ask for. The, it's called Humda data. And the, the purpose of this data is not to discriminate against the buyers. What it is, it's supposed to create a checks and balances to make sure that we, the lenders, are being responsible and that we are um, lending to everyone blindly, not, not financially blind, but racially blind. Um, so it is asked for, but, and whoever, um, if you do not want to volunteer that information, you do not have to volunteer that information. I wonder, you know, obviously the crux of, of, of getting a loan is your ability to repay that mortgage. That's yes. the critical piece, right? Um, when we talk to some, some advocates who say that there needs to be more sensitive underwriting, um, you know, you have to consider uh, how a person of color's background is different from a person like myself's background and you should maybe you should look at how they paid their rent instead of looking at their you know credit history from from years prior or whatever it may be is that a possible solution to try to slowly overcome this lending in, in general is is always going to be risk-based um and we are trying to mitigate loss that's just the basic whole idea um what you're talking about is really more of um I think it's it's a training that's necessary that every occupation should be doing. It's not just a lending thing. It should be that everybody should be a little bit more tolerant and understanding of other people's cultures and backgrounds. Um, can we throw that into a, a, a risk profile? I really don't know. Um, I, it would be great if we found a way of doing it, but it would once again, it would have to be equal for everyone. So because one family did something one way and another family didn't do it that way, how do we make a decision? And the only way that we can do it is by making it across the board a specific guideline. But we do have, you know, there are people behind this on both sides. Well, underwriters do understand and we do accept letters of explanation on certain circumstances and we do take those into account. We do have an automated underwriting system, but we also have people that make these decisions behind that. Reverend Corinne Mack, uh, the president of the NAACP here in Charlotte, told me something that I just thought was, it just made so much sense. The way lenders see people of color is the way they treat people of color. That's the way that it affects that. And she really believes that the conversations like this training help because you have to look at this through a different lens. And if anything, this last year should have taught us that, right? We need to look at this through a different lens a lens that, uh, that, that things are different. And in order to overcome these disparities and, and to help people get into home ownership, we have to look at it differently. And we have to, all of us, particularly people like me, need to take a hard look at the way we look at other people. Because even if we, we don't mean to do so a certain way, you know, our behavior, the way we grew up, whatever, may affect that. And I think that that's part of this too. When, when you're trying to, to help somebody with a loan, although most of it is, is over a computer, right? you still have some interactions. And the way that someone sees another person affects the way they treat that other person. Sure. If, I could, if I could comment, I'm gonna hold Dwight's feet to the fire a bit. Um, so the, the, the folks are able to put their racial data onto the applications, but, but everything has been eviscerated. If you talk about the Fair Housing Act, um, if you talk, talk about Dodd-Frank, everything's been eviscerated. So the lenders right now are functioning without somebody watching them they're able to have these disparities and not get checked on it because the government is not requiring racial data to be fed to it when it's doing this analysis if you talk about the occ if you talk about um, um the fed they're not requiring that they're only looking at the income levels not the racial data that comes in and so when we're tracking um we're looking at at, at census data or other data that's collected by governmental agencies outside of regulatory agencies and that's something that needs to change. Uh, we definitely need to track that. And, and, and one of these things with, with debt to income ratio, I'm not gonna take up too much time, um, that needs to be changed is, um, 
I want to back up. I, I want to make people understand that if you think about it, uh, we are a few generations out of slavery. And because of that, our education, our college education, had to be paid for with loans. Student loans are a heavy weight on the neck of someone trying to get um, a house. And, and because of that, uh, lenders will count student loans uh, towards your DTI, which could disqualify you automatically. There's no other factors that they would consider if your D DTI is not there. Um, so we need to keep in mind that these things keep us down, whereas I've, I've heard stories from uh, some of my white friends where they, their parents gave them down payment assistance. You know, I didn't have that. My mother was in a single family home in Chicago, so I had to get student loans. And because of that, it took me time to be able to afford a home, time to work hard, and then be able to get there. So I just wanted to make that, make that clear. I wanted to jump into some one point about the regulation, because I think it's really important. This is a, an important distinction, particularly for banks. So the federal government does what are called uh, Community Reinvestment Act performance evaluations every you know, few years or so on banks, and they strictly are looking at income. They're not looking at race. Uh, to Michael's point, they're, they're, they're basically rating the way a bank meets the services and credit needs of a community based on those incomes, not based on race. And, and also, private mortgage companies, credit unions don't have to play that game as well. So there's been a, a, a cry for more regulation as well. And, and, and you know, to, for regulators to reward the lenders that are really trying hard and hold their feet to the fire to those that aren't trying as hard. Fred, I wonder if this might be a good time to, to ask some of the questions that some of our viewers sent in as well. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the uh, the question someone was just saying, you know, uh, earlier, like you said, I was going back and forth with a viewer who, or with a, someone on the Facebook page um, who was just saying that, isn't it this? And this was the question. It was a statement. Isn't it racist to require all of this, all of these, all of these uh, requirements, um, all of these things that, that people have to do uh, to be eligible for this and that? Whether it's the whether it's the loan or the literacy classes or whatever it is to require those things because there seems to be a, a, a concept of deservedness that exists within this system. I understand that all of this is systemic and this is the way it works, but I just want to get the panel's um, view on this. This is something that this is something I've heard from a, or I've seen actually I've read from a couple of the folks who I've interacted with online. So this is Aaron. Can I push back just a moment for some clarity on this? Because I want to make sure we're answering it properly. Sure. Is this is this person saying that there shouldn't be requirements of financial literacy or education in order to have access to down payment assistance? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, um, I, 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 to be honest, don't know the answer to your question. I mean, we could make that assumption. But I guess the I guess it's the idea that there's so many there's so many uh, requirements, so many uh, contingencies um, that exist that don't exist elsewhere. Yeah, so I can speak to the down payment assistance that we offer at Dream Key Partners and why we have the expectation that someone would go through the financial literacy and empowerment program. Um, our goal here is to create the best home buyer possible and just providing the funds for for the ability to, to pay your down payment assistance is simply just a band-aid to the larger issue, which is, in, is, is making people financially stable for a long time and being able to maintain your home. There's much more to it as far as a requirement than just getting access to the money, even though that is the end goal. So we believe we're building better home buyers that will pass that information on to their next generation because we're not having enough conversations with the next generation about why home ownership is important. Our goal is to ensure that we've planted that seed and that it flourishes and grows from generation to generation. Yeah. Any other, anyone else want to tackle that question before we move? Yeah, well, one other thing that um, that that does is if you look at the data on on that home buyer education. Um, the people, folks throughout the entire country who go through a home buyer education program also have less rates of foreclosure than their, their counterparts who have not gone through it. Um, down payment assistance is not a, it's a, it's not a privilege. It's something that a lot of folks work really hard to, to get through. There's an educational component, there's credit component, there's a lot of different things that go through it in order to get that money. So I, I don't know how that would be considered to be, well, 
It's it's not some sort of a just a, an, an extension of some sort of welfare program. It is something that is that people work really hard to get. Um, and I don't know of any down payment assistance program that doesn't have a financial education um, component to it, because uh, there's a lot of these organizations that do things similar. And what they on one end of the hall, you have the home buyer education, but down down the hall is the foreclosure prevention. And the idea is to put the foreclosure prevention people out of business um, so that they don't have to deal with uh, the amount of foreclosures that, that we that our community has seen. So I, I don't know. I think it's it's um, important to have that educational component because it really sets people up for success. Dr. Mitchell, can I ask you just just when it comes to the education component? I mean, how when you when you all formed your partnership, I mean, how how. How long down the road do you expect to see impacts? Obviously, you know the, the first graduates that go through these programs are, are going to hopefully get into the field and, and hopefully make a difference. But I mean, when, when you're looking at the long-term plan for making an impact through your program, how long are we talking to see a difference? Absolutely. Well, Nate, I'll be honest with you. We're hoping to see an immediate impact. You know, we have students in this uh, in the course right now who will be graduating within the next year who will then be able to sit for their licensure and go immediately into their career um, in real estate. So this is this is right now that we can make a difference in changing what the, the landscape looks like for these students. So in terms of you know, educational uh, opportunities, one thing that I wanted to talk about here that uh, Dwight and Aaron br brought up is this piece about uh, educating individuals about the processes, whether it's educating them uh, on financial literacy, talking about you know, um, avoiding foreclosure. It's important to be able to partner. And Johnson C. Smith University is very interested in partnering with organizations to make sure that our community, and especially the uh, West Charlotte community where we're housed, understands what resources are there and available to them. So not, not only is our, um, our goal to educate students who will then graduate and go out and work in these fields and, and make a difference in their economic mobility, it's also to be able to bring resources and partner with our community to make sure that they understand what's available for them and how we can uh, continue to, to strengthen that community there. We see a lot of, uh, and, I'll, and I'll say it, we see a lot of gentrification going on around uh, Johnson C. Smith University. You know, I've worked there since 2006, and, and we're definitely seeing the neighborhood change. You know, I'm looking at houses that are now selling for $1.2 million. So how do we make sure that the community who was there, the community who's been there for generations, also realize that there are resources available to help them keep keep their homes, to help them uh, um, restore their homes and things of that nature. Uh, Councilman Malcolm Graham was talking on a call that I was on the other day about the opportunities that the, the city has to, to give loans to individuals to help them um, rebuild or restore their homes as well. So it's very important for us as a community, not just Johnson C. Smith, but as, as a Charlotte community, to make sure that we get this information to the communities that need it most. Mm -hmm. We've had, um, we've had several comments. I want to highlight one of them, Brad C., who says, he says, Black's total net wealth will be zero by 2050, uh, but has been expedited because of COVID-19. Um, with that statement, um, what kind of policies do you think can happen or should happen to, to, to start to work to reverse that trend? And anyone in the anyone in the panel can answer that. I'll jump in. So, um, so first off, there was a, a wealth gap um, between blacks and whites prior to COVID nineteen hitting. Um, and, and my prayers up to anybody who's lost family members or friends because of COVID nineteen. But um, there was a gap before that, and when it hit, uh, there's a phenomenon that happens when jobs start laying off folks in the order in which they lay off people. Um, sadly. Uh, a lot of black people are some of the first people to go. A lot of black people are the frontline essential workers as well, who, who are staying there and trying to work and do things and can succumb to the disease as well. Um, so so our, our income is being impacted by that because when you lose a job, you can't get a house. And you have to depend on others to give you a job to employ you, so forth and so on. And they're not doing it because of your race. And that's going to impact your wealth. 
uh, what we teach at Charlotte Crown Black Real Estate Association is that um, the key to wealth is home ownership. That's where you start. Anybody who is wealthy, they started with home ownership. And when that's taken away, that slows the wealth, it takes away from what you would consider uh, when, you, when you're calculating your assets and your wealth as well. Uh, so because of that, there, there are about 14 policy changes we recommend on our national level with our national organization. And, and, and one crucial one, I think, is, is the, you know, first off, uh, minimum wage, the DTI needs to, needs to be reformed or needs to go. Student loan and that, student loans and how they're counted need to be reformed and how they're counted. And when folks get back up on their feet, then they can utilize these policies and these changes to go ahead and be able to own a home and then create that wealth that they need to uh, create and try to level, again, the playing field. And I, I will say there, um, a recent study found that the black-white home ownership gap reached its 50-year high in 2018. I mean, just think about that. And then, then a pandemic hits. Yeah. You know, we had, we had a couple questions from a woman named Miss G who emailed us earlier today that I wonder if uh, we can pull up on screen because I thought they were both uh, really good questions directly for a person who's, who's seeking those answers. Fred, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, so she says, um, first question, would banks or credit unions be more amenable to loaning money for land only? Well, I, I guess I can answer that. Um, uh, well, I'll put it to you this way. Yes, um, we, we most a lot of banks do lend um, on land. Um, but going back to that risk model that we've learned this uh, a very important lesson from uh, the 2008-2009 crash, that there's when the first thing, if there's a major financial issue, um, you're going to protect the roof over your head. Um, and if you've got a, a, a piece of dirt, in a sense, that you're making payments on, and things go a little bit sideways, you're going to stop paying on those um, first. So the, the problem is that a lot of banks have, have tried to mitigate that risk by not lending on vacant land. There's still a lot of banks that do. Um, and if, if, you, if you find one, they normally specialize in them. Not too many credit unions do them, um, there's, unless they're specialty credit unions, but the, the money is still out there for that land. The problem is finding it because everybody's buying it. All right. I think um, I think we got to. I think Aaron, you said you wanted to weigh in uh, to talk about the mortgage assistance program again to point out how these programs are underutilized. They're out there, but not enough people are using them. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So we know that through these the new current stimulus funds, it's been a focus on renters. I get that. And through our program opening up on February 9th, we've seen a lot of engagement from renters. And I want to give you some specific numbers. We've received over 5,000 applications for assistance with rent, but our mortgage assistance program opened on the very same day, and we've only received under 300 applications applications. And that's staggering for us because we know that the need is out there and we know that people need access to the funds. We're able to take care of arrears as well as being able to help pay forward through these programs. And they can find out more about it on the RAMP CLT site. That's www.rampclt.com. We encourage people to please, please utilize these funds before they run out in September um, 2021. Aaron, can I ask you, you know, how, how much money do you have available? How many people can you help? Because I know the, the rental assistance program initially closed with plenty of people still waiting for help before you reopened in February. How, how, how much money is out there to help people with their mortgages? Well, here's what's interesting. The new stimulus package did not include mortgage assistance, and we were very disappointed in that, and we're pushing legislation to have that included going forward. The city of Charlotte put some dollars aside specifically in case this happened in the amount of $2.5 million in order to assist families with mortgage assistance. Now, we haven't even put a sliver in that 2.5 million and we're hoping that by the time that those funds are exhausted we have some mortgage assistance funds coming forward through the government and what are the requirements for for needing that money like if, if i were to apply what, what kind of requirements do i do i need to hit 
Yeah, absolutely. So again, we're targeting that 80% AMI. Um, so that family who's making $66,000 um, or less, you've got to live in Mecklenburg County. And the key is that they have to have experienced a COVID hardship. So what that means is they've had um, a loss in their, in their wages. They've had a job loss. They've experienced an illness as a result of COVID, or they've had challenges with childcare because of COVID. And also they can't be in a loss mitigation program like forbearance or repayment. Uh, we understand that that group is getting help and we want to help everyone else. And lastly, it has to be their primary residence. I got a comment over here. Um, this is a, it was originally in the, in reference to the discussion about land and financing land, but Mackenzie Duchess Duvall's, she said, most lenders want 20% down. I know that those figures have kind of vacillated over the years. What's common, uh, what's a common down payment? that we're talking for home buyers? Well, depending on the program, um, you can put you uh, for a conventional loan, a loan that's insured by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Uh, they have programs that you can put down as little as 3%. Um, FHA will um, allow for three and a half percent. You, if you're looking to purchase something in a little bit more rural area, um, you can do a hundred percent financing with USDA. And if you are a veteran, you can also do hundred percent financing. So that 20% rule has, hasn't been a thing for quite some time. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a good thing to do um, because obviously the larger your down payment, the smaller your monthly payment. So when life does come at you, you it's not as challenging. But unfortunately, we're living in a market where the average home is you know in the $300,000 world. Not too many people have that 20% to put down. So there's alternatives. I know Ms. G had another question as well, and I wanted to see if we could put that one up on the screen. Uh, you know, she initially asked about the land, but what, what is recommended if creditors aren't honor, honoring the temporary moratorium on late payment uh, reporting to credit bureaus? Obviously, this is pandemic related. Um, what, what can she do, you know, when it comes to, you know, this issue may be impacting her credit? And if I could, um, so uh, what you want to do is you want to go to the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, you go right online at cfpb.gov, um, and you can file a complaint. And when you file the complaint, make sure you identify uh, the creditor um, as well as um, the credit reporting agency. Uh, that usually gets quick results. Uh, folks don't like to have the government in their business. So once they see that, if they've done something incorrectly, uh, usually they'll correct it right away. Um, so just keep that in mind. I think as we prepare to kind of close up, I wonder if anyone has closing thoughts about, you know, this is obviously a lofty problem. Um, there are some really hyper local solutions available. You know, if you were to say one thing to the people that are watching this right now or will watch it down the road, what would it be? Maybe we can go down through everyone. Yeah, I'm happy to start with that. I love that our organization name is Dream Key Partners because it does start with a dream. And I, what I would love for people who are watching to know is that your dream can become a reality. And there may be hurdles, it might be difficult, but we can join your journey and make sure it happens. I would love for people to, to remove from their mind that it's not for them because homeownership is for you. Just work with one of the great people that are on this panel today and we will help you get there. I'll feel free to join in now as well. Um, you know, just like Aaron says, home ownership is a possibility for everyone. And there are definitely resources in the community that are here to help support you. Just as education is also for everyone. Uh, we hope that, you know, through our partnership with uh, the various organizations throughout Charlotte and Project Destin, we'll be able to bring opportunities to underrepresented groups so that they can be seen uh, in the real estate uh, arena as well. Well, so we look forward to continuing the conversation and to building a stronger community here in Charlotte at Johnson C. Smith University. Dwight or Michael? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I've, I've heard the word um, declined or denied a lot of times tonight on through different topics. And I think that um, it's really important to find somebody that can build a team through home buyer education through down payment assistance, or even if you don't need down payment assistance, just there for your needs. And if there is a problem, that the answer to the problem is not 
no, it's not denied. It's going to be something that's more like, not now, but here's what needs to be done. Because that word denied, the declination, is in, it deflates people's dreams. It's a dream killer. Um, so if I can, as a takeaway to anything, I think that if you have just the, the slightest inkling about purchasing a home, reach out to somebody and try to make that, uh, make, make that dream come alive. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is that I've mentioned down payment assistance, but I'd like to put it into a context because um, like Aaron's program, they, they do $10,000. Um, there's North Carolina housing will do an additional $8,000. There's a program also that if you're buying new construction that you can also obtain $30,000 and you can combine all of that. That's $48,000 for down payment assistance. Now we were talking about that 20% thing You've got $48,000, you could pretty much get your 20% down. Get, make your payments smaller. The goal should be just two things, how to get into a home with the least amount of expense and the lowest possible payment. That's, what, that's where the key is, not just getting into the home, but staying in your home. And that's really where the talent lies. That's true. So um, I, I'd echo every, everything everyone has said. Um, the goal is, is attainable. All you have to do is do your homework, be steadfast, and, and, and move forward with it. I, I, would, I would advise you to, when you apply for a loan, make sure it's somebody that you can trust because um, sometimes if you go to someone, they may tell you, oh, you're denied, sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. And you have those who will tell you, look, before we even get there, you need to work on X, Y, and Z before you can get into this home. Go work on that, here's some resources, go to this organization, go to that organization, and, and get ready to get into it. Um, so just make sure you do your homework and know who you are in terms of your credit profile, your assets, what you can afford, where you wanna be. And, and when you have all that in hand, just make sure you get somebody that you can trust uh, to get you to where you wanna go. That's all Is I have. there one pitfall that you see that when someone fills out an application, that one thing to avoid? That's a good. That's that's a great question. Um, I, I don't I don't I don't think there's anything to avoid. Dwight, you can speak to that, but I don't think there's anything to to avoid. You have to be honest on it, right? So you have to disclose everything. Um, but in in advance, I'll give you an example. Um, I had a situation where where I was getting a refinance, and I told my my loan officer up front, "Tell me exactly what I need to do. I have assets. I can pay this off if I need to. Let me know up front before we get down the road and an underwriter sees it, who you have no control over." And it's their world at that point. They can, they can deny it. They, they can do something arbitrary. They had me produce um, a, a settlement statement from 20 years ago. And that's unheard of. I had to write like 30 letters of explanation. Unheard of. So, so you, you definitely want to make sure that you know what you're getting into up front and correct those things before you even put it on the loan application. Because once you get to that point, there's, there's no turning back. We have a ton of resources on WCNC.com for people to just you search the keyword money. Uh, tons of resources, including in these stories. There's other local community agencies that are just dying to help people overcome these challenges. Yeah, and, I'll, and, I'll, and on that note, I'll close with just saying I like this comment from Emily. Uh, Pretty Mama Smith is the name where she says delayed, not denied. I think that's one of the big takeaways from this discussion is that you know, there's work that can be done to put yourself in a position to be a homeowner. Uh, that uh, to, as, as you said earlier, denial does not uh, mean, is not the final word on this endeavor for a household. I wanna thank all of you on our panel, uh, Dr. Mitchell, Michael Ford, and, and Aaron, and of course our Nathan Morbido doing some awesome reporting as always. Thank you so much and thank you all out there who have been uh, asking great questions and paying attention. And I'll just reiterate, as Nate said, we have all of the resources on our website, wcnc.com slash money. You'll find a list with the bios of all of the folks in our panel, and, uh, and you'll find all of the stories that we've done on this issue. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it, and I hope all the folks out there have learned something. Good evening, everyone. Fred Shropshire here with WCNC Charlotte, uh, welcoming you to our Managing Your Mental Health Virtual Town Hall. Want to welcome all of our folks who are on Facebook, all of our folks on the YouTube channel, folks uh, joining us uh, from WCNC.com. We're going to talk about mental health tonight. 
we, if you watch our newscast, hopefully you do, you don't just watch us here digitally, but if you're watching our newscast, you've noticed for the past few days, we've been talking about this virtual town hall managing your mental health. This is an important issue that we've seen a lot of stories populate and uh, come up during the pandemic. Joining us, a very talented panel, what I'm gonna do is I wanna introduce everyone by name and I'm gonna allow everyone to tell me a little bit about themselves before we jump into our discussion. Just so you know, if you're out there watching us now, uh, we are here to answer your questions. I'm not gonna answer questions. We have a panel of experts here to answer your questions and to address your concerns about mental health. So in order to do that, I'll need you to put some questions down and we'll get to, hopefully we'll be so flooded with so many questions that, uh, that we'll just have a, we'll have a hard time answering, getting to all of them. We wanna answer as many questions as possible. That's what we're here for this evening. So uh, before we get kicked off in our discussion, I wanna to introduce to us first, uh, our first uh, panelist here, Dr. Robert Matlack. Hello, uh, I guess, uh, glad to be here today, glad to be a part of this. Uh, and celebrating mental health this month. Um, I'm a child and adolescent and adult psychiatrist um, with a best day psychiatry and counseling. And uh, we're here to help and we're here to help tonight if you need us. Thank you, Dr. Matt Lack. Thank you for being here. Reverend British Hirams um, is also one of our panelists too. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, I am in probably my third or fourth career as a campus minister at North Carolina Central University. Uh, I have found my dream job that I didn't know that I wanted working with our uh, young adults, and I am happy to be here. It's good to have you. Thank you so much. And uh, last but not least, Coach Lamont Odoms is joining us. Nice to have you here, Coach. Hey, nice to be with you, Fred, and the other panelists. It's, it's a great opportunity to talk about something that is so serious, but one of the things that I hope that we can do tonight is encourage, lift up spirits, and, and remind people that, that tomorrow is coming and to be encouraged and mindful uh, that you can get back into the life that you desire to live. And you can see me here every day right here on WCNC with you day. Absolutely. Hopefully you are no stranger to people who are joining us in this live stream. I want to kick off by highlighting one of the comments that I see off the top here by Kimberly Grog Kane. Uh, she says mental health matters. That is a, a true statement, which is why we are here this evening. And like I said in the introduction, one of the big things that we've seen coming out of this pandemic, going into this pandemic, is how important mental health uh, has become. I mean, it was all it's always been important, but it's become even more so because we are so pressed by so many things, current events happening, uh, financial uh, situations with families and then all the other inner workings within a family that you may not be aware of impacting people more because of being quarantined or being confined, not being able to go to work outside of your home. Um, those things are having a mental impact. So I'm gonna just throw a general question out there. What are we seeing more of um, since the beginning of this pandemic that is affecting our mental health? I'll start with that. And that's for any of the panels to jump in. Um, all right, well, I'll jump in. Um, and I personally, you know, when the pandemic started, I think I would, the biggest thing that I was facing with a lot of people was a lot more of anxiety and depression. Uh, I, I think that one of the scariest parts about the pandemic is you had a lot of change and a lot of things that happened, um, you know, that just threw people just out of kilter a little bit. And I, I think that I've seen a, naturally a rise of anxiety, a rise of depression, you know, possibly some things like that that have seemed to be coming into our practice a lot more. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of it is understandable, okay? It's just part of the human condition, change is gonna happen, and sometimes it gets the best of a lot of us for that kind of goes. Yeah. Coach, you look like you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, I, I was gonna say that no one saw this pandemic coming. And one of the things that this became something that all of us were common with. We all were forced to follow the same routines we had to stay at our homes. But we've been so busy with life that we were never able to really concentrate on who we are. We were in our everyday routines of going to work and then coming home and then doing the same thing the next day. And then our weekends come and we're with family and then we're at church. And we had these patterns that we developed over time, but then the pandemic happened. And we can no longer get back to those routines. So we were able to hide a lot of our illnesses within our routines, but the pandemic 
caused many of us to get to a place that we had to confront ourselves. And we discovered things about ourselves that we thought were things that we had already dealt with or things we never discovered. And when you are faced with yourself and you're faced to look at that person in the mirror, that's where the challenge begins. You begin to ask yourself, is this the person that I've always been? Is this the person that I'm becoming now? And when we find ourselves in the challenge of facing a new season, we try to take the old us into a new place and it just doesn't work. And I think that so many of us are dealing with that right now. We're trying to rediscover who we are in a new age that we're entering into what we can now consider a new normal. And we're trying to discover who are we in this new normal and how can we be the people that we once were in, in a time now that, that we truly don't understand exactly who we are. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, is, this is a moment now for many of us to face ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves the key questions. Who am I? Who do I want to be? And where is this life bringing me? And now it's the time to ask ourselves the question. The one thing I can say is this, is that whenever you start to ask yourself questions, the one person you can never lie to yourself, I mean, lie to is yourself. Why? Because the moment you ask yourself a question is the moment you already know the answer. And many of us now have to face the answers that we've never wanted to face. And that's going to be the key thing moving forward, even after we get out of this pandemic and after we get back to what we now consider a new normal. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that, of course, this has been something that a defining moment and it was sudden for many of us. Um, and I think that for this generation, right, of young adults, um, the high schoolers, elementary schoolers, those who are in college, a defining moment, and it hit the entire world. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, mm -hmm. those words that we kept saying, unprecedented and so forth, that had so many layers for every aspect of our lives that no one was expecting. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I just want to answer a question here from Phyllis uh, Dutton Fail. She said, uh, can we ask live questions? Um, yeah, we can ask live questions there. If you're logging on to our YouTube page as well, you should be able to ask questions uh, no matter where you are. I want to talk about just, okay, so one of the questions that we have here, someone was saying that where do you start to to help with the exhaustion caused by the mental distress that has been brought on by the pandemic? Where do we start? How do you recoup your energy? Well, well, I say the, the the first place you have to you have to recoup your energy is by asking, where did my energy go? <laughs> and and by pulling yourself back and having a serious dialogue within self. And I would love to uh, hear hear the doctor. Um, Dr. Um, Matt, to, to talk more about this, but one of the things that I can say is uh, it is about facing your reality. This is where we are right now. We can't go back. We can only go forward. We, we can't look at the past to try to find the answers that only the future can, can give us. So you have to start to face the person that you are right at this moment. Where do you want your life to go? What lessons have you learned? See, when we look at the lessons we've learned, then it can create a path forward to where it truly is that we're being led to and we want to go. So, so it, to, to regain your energy is to first ask yourself, first of all, where did my energy go? Why did I allow my energy to leave in the first place? And where truly is my life headed? What can I do now that I wasn't able to do? If, if anything that I can say, this should be one of the greatest motivational and inspirational moments right now. And the reason I say that is because you now have an opportunity to rebuild yourself. You can rebuild yourself from the inside out. The things that you weren't able to do and you were confined, now you're excited because now you can get back out and get back to life and you can start to do those things. So get back on track by simply just sitting down within yourself and saying, you know, this is an opportunity for us to reinvent ourselves. So who are we going to invent and who is the world going to get? Yeah. Coach, I'd like to, to add an and on that. I believe Come that- Come on, add the and. Come on, I love the and. <laughs> we also find strength in community. So you need to find a community that's going to help you face that reality, right? Because if you're surrounded by people who are 
you know, have more resources or whatever, or are under a rock just trying to act like this isn't happening, that's not helpful. And so in community, those who will lament with you and help you figure out things and point you in the right direction, that's gonna be very important. We as humans were built for community. And so I that's think right. that um, if you're exhausted, then finding community that's gonna help you is gonna be important as well. Especially too, when you think about the only community that we had was our family. <laughs> and I think for many of us, you know, for me, I, I rediscovered my family. I've, I've been living in a house with these people for so many years. <laughs> and then I learned things about them that I didn't know because we were all confined and we were forced to not only get along, but forced to, um, to work out matters that we had swept under the rug as a family. And I know many families that are watching right now, you had to do the same thing. So to that point, to that point, um, Reverend Hirams, I, I absolutely agree. You're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. And if you want to take your life seriously, you got to you got to surround yourself with serious minded people who have the same future minded goal oriented dreams or or possibilities that they're looking at. Uh, they're going to help you to look at the same thing. If you're not at that place that you need to be looking at that. But it is important right now, start forging forward. Where are you going and what is life prepared for you? Yeah, I want to bring uh, Dr. Matt Lack into this discussion because I know okay. um, you're, you know, when you talk about community and learning people in your family and those types of things, if you... Well, they, they said it really well. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, you know, what, what I try to tell people is, you know, it's something where you try to rely on things that have helped you before, but also now we're, we're different. We're something different. Okay. We've, it, there's community resources. There's family. Those are the two big things that you think about. Uh, just find simple things in life that you would enjoy for yourself as well. The world gets complicated at times. It always has. It always will. But there's going to be times where you just take a look at yourself and say, you know, what can I do to step back from these things for a few minutes and take care of myself for a moment? Mm -hmm. Whether it be, you know, read a book, uh, you know, spend some time going for a walk, or just whatever, whatever you enjoy. But just make sure you're treating yourself well in the process. Yeah, I was going to say the other side of the coin, though, is what if you don't get along with those people in your family or who are who you're around? Right? We all got those stories. Because, you, yeah, because you don't need a pandemic. You just need a Thanksgiving for that. You didn't have a choice. <laughs> you didn't have a choice. You didn't have a choice because you were surrounded by people who, or there could be, um, you know, there could be abusive situations going yeah. on too. You know, and you didn't have a choice because schools were schools were closed. Um, you know, workplaces were closed. People were working from home. I'm sure that as we move out of this, we're going to deal with the backlash or blowback or whatever you want to call it. You know, the consequence of being cooped up in a situation like that. Some people are, yeah. is, is that something that you're anticipating or is that something that you've already seen? Oh, I'm going to say yes. Uh, I'm going to say yes. I have seen it to a degree. And, uh, you know, if I step back, I'd probably have to think, am I seeing it more or not? I, it's certainly logical that it could happen. In different settings is you have people who are now in new roles okay where that could happen you know i'd like to think you know optimistically there are some people which will find new strengths in these ways and they'll do better at things yeah. we're all human okay we all hopefully learn the new things the right way uh is, is there something coming see okay i i hope not i i'm hoping there's going to be a lot better things that i hear than what the worst things yeah you know on, honestly you know and to your point doctor i i believe that there is a lot that's coming um, I believe that as we as we get past this, uh, you're going to now find a lot of people that are going to be dealing with pandemic PTSD. Um, yeah. you're find a lot yeah. of people too that are now going to have to face the mourning of of lost um, lost loved ones. You know, we. I, I am seeing some of that. I'll tell you that. I am yeah, seeing some uh, of that because before. because one thing that we all we all had an uncommon thing make us all common. This pandemic made us all equal. We all had to follow by the same guidelines and the same rules. Now that things are starting to return and we're starting to see a lot of things lax, people are now going to have to face the pain that they corporately were now having to face because we looked at the numbers. We saw how many people lost their lives due to COVID. It hit close to us. So, so now we have a lot of people who were all common that I lost one, you lost someone, but now individually we have to deal with that loss on our own. We have to, we have to sit there and start to think about did, was everything done that could have been done to, to have saved my loved ones? There are a lot of questions that are still yet to be answered about the protocols and a lot of things that were put into place. 
So, so I believe that, you know, unfortunately, I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, but I believe that the worst is coming, but also the best is coming too. Um, and, and the worst is coming because people now have to confront things. The best is coming is because there are resources now to help people navigate through that pain. Well, so naturally, as we're, we're going equal oh. in equal footing. Oh, you know, like I said, I think we're going through a transition, whether whatever the transition is, transitions can be some of the biggest stressors for people, you know, whether they be good or bad, you know, research has shown, you know, retirement or something like that. It's even an incredible stressor for people or something good that happens. So we do have a transition coming. So, yeah, there's going to be some stress, but hopefully there's going to be some strengths and, you know, we're going to learn from it. We're going to learn different things. We're hopefully going to be a little stronger. We're going to learn new skills, new things about ourselves. Uh, so, you know, while there is going to be some stuff that's going to be in, there's going to be good with the bad, and you take the good with the bad, and that's that's probably a good way to handle the stress. Yeah. And, and what yeah. I just wanted really quick, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Reverend Hybrid, you can go. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I think, though, that there's a whole swath of people who weren't allowed to break down or disengage during the pandemic that once we're, you know, more open or whatever, that finally, Finally, they have permission to step back oh, and yeah. make them fall apart. Yeah. So you've got a whole new group of people that you're going to see that were barely holding it together. Mm -hmm. I, I have healthcare workers in mind. I have clergy in mind, yep. uh, wow. and I'm probably missing a whole lot of people. I'm, I'm already, I'm already seeing it too. I know what you're yes. talking about. I yes, see it. absolutely. I it's see it. Essential in folks, private, basically. Our private communities of Facebook groups and so forth, where, yeah, there's a lot going on. And it's something else, too, you see a lot of people that are stepping into their dreams now. You see a lot of people that got to a place where they had to face themselves, as we've already spoken here about that. But now a lot of people, they've got to a point, they were like, you know what? I still have air. I still have life. Now let me start that thing I've been putting off for so long. Let me get back to my dream now. And you saw a lot of people, a lot of more books were written during this period of time. More people started online businesses than ever before. People found a way to sustain themselves, but also found a way to tap into that dream state, that dream state that's living on the inside of all of us. And people got to a place that they started to take their life a lot more serious than what they were doing before, because then yeah. they started to see that, that, that even though tomorrow is coming, we have to prepare ourselves better for the tomorrow that's coming. And we've seen a lot of people that have emerged out of this even stronger than what they were before this started. Uh, Kim, Kimberly uh, Grog Kane said, uh, replied, she said, many people lost themselves too and now have to mm -hmm. rebuild their life. So, yes, it gets worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. I know on my end, I've had a lot of longtime colleagues in other TV markets who were doing fine, but they just decided to take their, their lives in a different direction and they're doing other things now. And it's um, yeah. like you said, people basically have come to the edge of, of what they've been fearing this entire time. Uh, in some cases that happened and they're still here and they're yeah. able to they're able to see past that and able to see their dreams realized. Um, I want to take the, the discussion um, into a different area because I know that uh, Reverend British uh, Hiram's you deal specifically on a campus um, at North Carolina Central um, University. And I know that this pandemic has you has affected young people in a very unique way. Um, students who there there are students who have who, who haven't had a chance to go to prom there are students who didn't get a chance to finish out uh, their competitive sporting seasons um you know all kinds of things that have happened uh, how do you how do you walk uh how do you shepherd um, gen z through this 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 time well I, i'm happy to say what i love about gen z is that Although I have the privilege of walking beside them, they are also walking beside each other. So mm -hmm. when I talked about community, I had them in mind as well. Um, from some of the observations I've seen, uh, those who were juniors or sophomores reaching out to the freshmen to kind of bring them into their fold because the freshmen didn't have an opportunity, you know, so they kind of created their own pods, right? Um, when I speak with students to kind of support them pastorally, always asking for prayer, not only for themselves, but for their uh, colleagues and their family members. And so I think that in many cases, of course, you can never cast you know, too broad of a net, but they have really learned to walk beside one another because they know exactly what they're going through. And then there are adults like me who have the privilege uh, to walk with them and to be there for them as well. 
Yeah, and I know that I know that we we have another uh, very constructive uh, comment here about you know teachers as well as students being stressed uh, in this situation too. This has been a, you know teachers have been put into a situation that they weren't even trained to uh, to do. They're they're trained to oh, yeah. engage. They're trained to engage in person. And there have been so um, so many challenges that they've they've uh, faced and they've overcome as well. And first of all, I applaud our teachers. I applaud our teachers for showing up and, and still educating our kids. And we know that during this age, we lost a lot of students. And a lot of students, meaning they couldn't get logged in, they couldn't um, participate in a lot of classes because of technology issues or, or even a lack of, of, of resources to be able to connect. Um, but teachers, I saw a lot of teachers still going out of their way to make sure that those students were provided for and taken care of. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's something that we've all had to face. It was so many stresses. However, I, I saw so many people, and we all can attest to this, you made the best out of what you had. You made whatever you were facing, you made it work. You made it work for you, and you also made it work for others. And, and that is one thing that I can say, even as a parent of, of uh, I have two daughters that are about to graduate next week, and we're all done with school <laughs> until college then happens. But even some of the stresses that they had uh, of having to um, make sure that they were um, logged in and they were um, logged in not only technology-wise, but mentally-wise, yeah, right. and not taking that time off because you're at your home. So I applaud all teachers for, for staying the course, not quitting on our students, and staying in the game. I, I, I do. I, I, hey, teaching is a tough job. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and they should be paid better, too. That's yeah. my, 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 Definitely. My, yeah. So yeah. Right there. No, I have a family. I, I come from a family of teachers that would just cheer that right on. So I'm right there with you. That's uh -huh. fine. Yeah. I mean, you have to, for, for so many teachers, they have to teach and parent. Oh, yeah. 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 And I mean, then they got to come home. Like I said, they got to teach and they've even got their own kids in the home as well during the pandemic and they have to look after them. So it's, mm -hmm. I know some teachers that are running room to room to do different things the whole time. And it's, you know, it's just, it's amazing. It's taxing them like double or triple the power of what they're, uh, of the stuff they usually have to do. Cause it's, like I said, it's a new structure, but they, yeah, they I, did it. They yeah. Did it. And, I, and I have older students, but I know Fred, you have younger kids. I do. <laughs> so I can just imagine what those what those struggles were. You're having to not only be there, but you have to be there. <laughs> I literally, so, yeah. I literally had to. I literally had to uh, check and make sure that my son's eyes were open. <laughs> because I mean, seven year olds just aren't, you know, this is the attention span and trying to do remote learning. And it was a challenge. It was a challenge. But um, yeah, and 17, teacher, old, 17 year olds just, have the same problem, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, we discovered yeah. that in Miles. But the teachers have been amazing, as you say. You know, one of the things that I want to make sure that we talk about, uh, if we don't say anything else, is just, you know, how we can recognize these things in, in the people around us, in ourselves, too. How do we know that we need to seek help? How do we know that? Because there's, I, I feel like we're in a time now where we're talking more about mental health. You know, one of the things that I, I got um, I had I had a season in my life where I had a therapist, you know, and then that kind of went away. And then when we had the pandemic hit, I got a therapist again. And it's something that I'm, I'm not I'm clearly not ashamed of. And I think that it's, um, you know, it's a it's, it's more like maintenance. But what do I do if I'm good and I'm getting things off my chest and processing things? But I notice things around me. I help people around me get the help that they need. You know, in a lot of cases, Fred, we look at ourselves and we always say we're good. Um, and then our, our loved ones, they're the ones that are taking the brunt of what our not good really truly looks like. Um, we saw a lot of people, we saw anxiety go up. We saw depression go up. We saw substance abuse go up. We saw domestic violence go up. We saw all of these things that were locked on the inside of us, but caught up in routine we were never able to face. Maybe because those things that were locked up on the inside of us came out in different ways until we were then isolated. And then these, came, these things came out ways that we had never seen them before. Mm -hmm. So if you've noticed that you're, you're lacking some areas, if you've noticed the conversations that are going on around you from your loved ones, from your friends, from your family members, even from some coworkers, if you've seen some serious behavioral changes within yourself, 
If there are things that you see about yourself that you question and you're asking, is this really who I am? And is this really how good it gets for me? If those are questions that you're asking yourself, that's the moment that reach out and, and to find that help. You know, during this pandemic, there were two things that I focused on. I focused on, I had to, I was forced to focus on my marriage. I was forced to focus on my family. I was also forced to focus on me. Um, and because I began to see things about myself that I knew that I had unresolved hurts and unresolved pains. And when I was isolated, there Lamont was having to deal with these things. And Lamont had to face this, I had to look at it this way. If I'm going to be a great vehicle to help people find the path that will set their lives free, how can I be that if I'm stuck in me? So I had to force myself to find help and force myself to, to, to get the help that I needed to get me back on track. And to what your point, what you just said, Fred, it is important. If you have to find therapy and you have to find help, it is nothing wrong with that. I, I know that some people have made it uh, to be a, a, a negative thing, but let me tell you something. I would rather somebody face a negative thing that you have to go to therapy so that you can have the positive outcome that is locked up on the inside of you just waiting for you to acknowledge that it's there. So if you need help, get the help. Get out of, this, get out of the path of pride and get into the path of, 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 of self-reliance. Love yourself again and love yourself enough to get the help that you need. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I can only echo a lot of this. It's, it's something that where if, if you are starting to see some signs where you're really not yourself, um, you know, and, and talking to friends and family is a good way to do it too. But at the same time, you know, talk to your doctor okay, and just see if they're seeing, seeing certain things, depression, anxiety, the big, you know, beasts that we've been seeing lately. Um, and, you know, they can get you usually the help that you need, whether it be, you know, therapy, uh, life coaches, so to speak, um, you know, psychiatry, uh, or just anything in general, you know, talk, clergy talk too. Clergy as well. excuse yeah. me, I apologize. Oh, uh, no, no, <laughs> clergy as well. That, mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> but it is something that, uh, like I said, the, the resources I think are there, which is nice. It's just, you know, taking the step and taking, you know, going forward and trying them out, but they can be, you know, very rewarding with a lot of these things. And they're hard, but it can be done. You know, I do believe that clergy are important in this conversation because in many religious communities, whoever your clergy person is, if they tell you, if they are very open about the fact that, yes, we have our faith and our religion, and that these are other tools that have been given to us by God, by your higher power or whatever, to help you so that you can take your mental fitness as seriously as you take your physical fitness and your spiritual fitness and the things that you do to keep yourself well. Yeah. Clergy, I believe, can have a very important voice there. Absolutely, absolutely. I wanna get um, one final word from each panelist for our folks listening to take in before we end tonight. I know that each of you come from, you come from different, um, you come from a little different angle, like Dr. Uh, Robert Matlock, your best day psychiatry and counseling, and uh, Reverend British Hiram, so your Presbyterian campus ministry at um, North Carolina Central University, and, and Coach uh, Lamont Odoms, you are a certified master life strategist. So you come from different, a little different disciplines, but your outcome, your intention is the same. So one takeaway from each before, um, before we go. I'll say this, in 1991, I was a 19, 20 year old kid who was confused and decided one night that he was gonna to try to take his life. Overdosed on pills, had to be rushed to the hospital um, because I did not believe that tomorrow had anything for me. Well, guess what? 2021, I'm sitting here because tomorrow was waiting for me. Tomorrow is waiting for you. I know that these have been difficult times and I know that you've had a difficult, di difficult path and you've had to face a lot of things. We've all had to face those things. But tomorrow is coming and tomorrow does have a better result for you. So wherever you are in your life right now and you feel that need or that urge to just give up on everything, to walk away from everything, to end it all, let me tell you that we still need you. There are dreams, there are, there are so many wonderful things that are locked up on the inside of you that the world needs. And the world are missing things. We're missing great ideas. We're missing great minds. And that great idea and that great mind 
is on the other side of this camera that I'm looking at. I just want you to stay committed to the game. Stay committed to the dream and the hope that's on the inside of you. And just know that God did not create anything that was not living. And because you're living, that means that God has a purpose and a plan for your life to bring your life to the next level. So live elevated and get beyond what you're feeling right now. Get the hope that get the help that you need because on the other on the other side of this hope, on the other side of this help is the hope that's waiting for you. So get back in the game. Don't give up. Don't quit because we need you. Wow. A little more than just a word. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a word. <laughs> but, you uh, know, I just would like to call for each one of us to commit to being someone who does not play into the stigma that is associated, especially with serious mental yes. illness issues. And I guess yes. whatever issue you have is serious to you. So maybe I should drop that word um, by our language, by what we say or don't say, by the, especially the flippant things and the way we throw terms around um, that are related to mental illness. And so sometimes if we could just do that for ourselves and for others, if you can't bring yourself to be positive, at least be neutral. Don't. Come on. Don't <laughs> be someone who furthers stigma. Because stigma means spoiled identity. Yeah. And none of us are spoiled because we are made in the image of God. We are all precious. So, um, yeah, that's that's my final word. <laughs> Good word, Reverend. Well, Thank you, yeah. Reverend. Nice. I tell you, it's hard to follow these two, okay? Because <laughs> um, they pretty much say it all. Um, I guess as a psychiatrist, I, I can tell you that I, I see things every day, every hour, and I see things get better. So I, what I can tell you, you know, from a scientific point of view, it is quite possible to get better. Um, it's very hard to take the first step, but I, I've seen it for years. It can be done. Please believe that there is hope. And if we can ever help, let us know. Well, thank, you. Doctor, thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. There I is do. a possibility to get better. It, you can yeah. get better. You got to put the work in, but you can get better. Thank you so much, Doctor, for saying that. Yeah. That's right. Thank you, sir. That's right. I want to thank each and every one of you. And I want to remind our, 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 our uh, folks who are watching uh, that uh, Dr. Robert Matlack is uh, at Best Day Psychiatry and Counseling. And you are taking clients, correct? We are taking clients. I all see right. all ages. So there's that. <laughs> and we have Coach Lamont Odom, Certified Master Life Strategist. Thank you, Coach. And also, you can find more and see more and hear more of Coach's wisdom uh, Monday through basically every day. Every day. <laughs> every day is, every day is, is, a, is a new day. On our day. Air. Every our day is a new day. In our four o'clock newscast, you, we in, the, in our four o'clock newscast, we have these vignettes of uh, from Coach. He just these nuggets of wisdom, encouragement, um, and inspiration uh, that he shares with us in our newscast. So you can find that. Also, um, you can find it at www.wcnc.com/uday. And last but not least, I want to not only thank Reverend British Hiram's for joining us, but I want to wish you a happy birthday. It's your birthday. Joining us on your birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. <laughs> to happy part birthday. with him and share uh, with our with our viewers here on your birthday. So happy birthday, Reverend. Thank, we thank birthday, you for joining Reverend. us. Happy birthday. And we thank we thank all of you. And uh, just a reminder that we're on the air tonight on uh, WCNC Charlotte um, at eleven o'clock. We'll see you then. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here for our virtual town hall, if you will, that has all to do with resumes and job hunting and things to kind of set yourself up for success when you are looking for a job. I am joined tonight here by Juan Serong and Connor Walsh with Talent Bridge, and these are going to be our two experts we're going to ask some questions of this evening. And you both were telling me that you have very much a familiarity with what people on both sides of this uh, pipeline, if you will, are looking for the employers, what do they want, and the people who are looking for the jobs. Um, one of the things we wanted to show folks first before we dive into things, now keep in mind, comment, please let us know what sort of questions you want to know about, you know, beefing up that resume, any questions that you have about um, getting that job, getting that interview. 
Um, but we wanted to talk about this because this was prompted by a Where's the Money report that one of our reporters, Jane Monreal, recently did. We showed it to you last night on TV. We want to show it to you again this evening. And it's all about somebody who is on this job hunt. She is sending out all these applications. She's not hearing a word back. And so this is probably a big, big red flag to update that resume. So um, Sean, who is behind the scenes directing, if you will, can we cue up Jane's Where's the Money report here? Karen Meisenheimer has had a tremendous career as a certified nurse's assistant, but it's physical work, and after 22 years and a recent injury, she can't perform the job as well as she used to, so she wants to go into a different line of work. I was trying to do, like, more uh, clerical, more secretarial, uh, more customer service. She sent out 100 resumes. Oh, God, probably more than <laughs> Indeed, LinkedIn, uh, Monster, um, some of them I would just look, Google. None of them called her in for an interview. And each time my heart just sank more and more and more. She went to the Free Career Center at Goodwill. So simply sending resume is not enough. We have to understand the culture of that company. What is it that is important to them? Although Meisenheimer's background's in the medical field, she's also dealt with patients, family members, doctors, and making sure her clients' needs are met. That was customer service. Having the ability to understand what are the critical words that allows you to connect to the right position is something that I know we, we coach our participants to understand. According to Flex Jobs, it's important to include on your resume keywords also used in the job description. Thank you. If you land the interview but don't make it further, a local staffing manager says it's sometimes because of TMI. When you're asked that lovely question, tell me about yourself, we want to stay in line with what's related to the work or the job that you're going into versus telling about our life for the past, you know, six to 12 months. For executive positions, going to a staffing agency is beneficial. The old school management style of the 80s and 90s of leading with an iron fist uh, is, I would say, is gone. And, and now it's got to be through vulnerability and humility with your people. One of the perks of working with a search firm like us is instead of being one of three to 500 applicants, you're going to be one of three to five that we put in front of a client. Well, experts also say more companies are looking at your social media, about 70%, so keep it clean. And sometimes there is no time to respond. If an employer gets, say, over 100 applicants for one position, about 20% will get that interview. In studio, Jane Monreal, WCNC Charlotte. All right, so there's your refresher, folks. I feel like there's a lot to digest there. And so, Juan, Connor, I don't know who wants to jump in here. I mean... Is this something that you hear a lot from folks? You know, I feel like I'm qualified. I'm sending out, you know, all these applications. I keep hearing employers are looking for workers. Why am I not getting a call back? Is this a common scenario? Absolutely, Vanessa. We hear it a lot of time in our industry where candidates will reach out frustrated because they've sent in their resume to dozens of companies and they don't hear anything back. And I think a lot of that points us to an ATS or an applicant tracking system where a lot of these are really just automated systems going in and looking for keywords on a resume and it really takes out the human nature of the recruiting process which can be very frustrating in the eyes of someone looking for a new job yeah okay so that that then brings up the question here you know what sort of keyword should i be putting in there because i think maybe people might not know how automated some of these situations are yeah and that's an that's an excellent question so one thing that i tell every candidate that i talk to is look at each job description um tailor your resume specifically for that job that you're applying to if it mentions leadership if it mentions you know a specific skill set make sure that those words are in that resume because as soon as you apply and it happens even for us if we're searching for candidates through places like linkedin or career builder or indeed we're searching for those keywords and so we want to make sure that your resume stands out above the rest and it's always about the percentage of those keywords that you have in there so maybe this is getting into the weeds a little bit. If I'm putting keywords in and I see in the job listing, they have the word leadership. Am I using the word leadership versus I was a leader of whatever? Like, do you think it's getting that particular? Like, you got to use an actual word. Yeah. Be oh, which is insane. Yeah. A lot of times it just pinpoints that specific word. I mean, people have searches that are set up where they'll oftentimes incorporate words that are similar, but most recruiters that work at a corporate job are just searching one specific phrase and that's it. 
Yep. That is one, interesting. Sorry to cut you off. One thing oh, to no, add no, no. too. <laughs> one thing to add is a lot of people try to beef up the resume with really big words or words that make their job title sound really lofty. Um, a lot of times keeping it simple is the best way to go. Um, the shorter your sentences and just get to the point of what your job duties and functions are, the better. Um, because one, people don't have time to read hundreds and hundreds of resumes. So the shorter it is, the better in terms of getting through a lot of them. So true. Now, you mentioned keeping it simple, and that made me think of something that we heard in Jane's piece, which was TMI. What do we mean by TMI? Like, what exactly is too much information? I think it depends on the role and the person, um, especially the job you're applying for. I think there are definitely some extraneous details you can leave out of your resume. You know, say you work uh, a receptionist job, you're a front desk person. You don't have to include every specific thing. Say you ordered office supplies. You don't have to list out every single office supply you ordered. Um, just keeping it very concise, like Juan said, making it as efficient as possible and really broad stroke summarizing the work that you did. You don't have to go too deep into the details unless, of course, the job description is looking for a specific thing. Then maybe you incorporate that. But. Now, we also heard the, the suggestion of using a staffing agency. What is what sort of, I guess, services would you get from a staffing agency? How would a staffing agency set a candidate up for more success versus maybe just going it alone? So this is where we, a uh, shameless plug, of course, but um, not all staffing agencies are made the same. Um, the really good ones like Townbridge, we take our time with each candidate. We get to find out your story, your background, everything that you've accomplished at work. Um, I always ask candidates to tell me stories of when they, you know, achieve something greater than what their resume may show. Um, and we also help them tailor their resume to the, each job that we're applying them to. Um, we want to present our candidates, you know, in the best light possible. And so we give tips and advice. Um, we also will do a lot of interview prep with candidates. Um, so things like going through what to say during an interview, what not to say during an interview, how to negotiate, you know, compensation, um, things that a lot of people don't have a lot of experience in. Um, we go through and make sure that everyone is prepared for each and every interview that we send them to. Uh, one other thing, too, to add to that is I always remind candidates, People are, you know, naturally not good at interviewing. Um, I'm also terrible at it, um, even as a recruiter. When I'm on the other side of the table, I get nervous. I get, you know, sweaty, clammy, whatever it is. And I always tell people, remind yourself that the person interviewing you is also not a professional interviewer, too. Um, and that's something that's important to, to keep in mind. Yeah. And I would also suspect, you know, if you are to the point where you're at an interview, this is someone who is interested in you and is taking the time to learn more about you. So it's not like, you know... <laughs> I mean, there, there's a reason you're there. So I feel right. like that could be a good confidence booster to think of as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I did want to ask, since we are talking about the interview process, um, and, and we were actually kind of talking behind the scenes before we got started with this live stream about this, but like, you know, a lot of things are going virtual now. Um, and let's say you are going to be doing a virtual interview I mean, are we worried about what the surroundings are like? I mean, how particular are we getting with this? Are we, like dressing up, you know, the whole thing? I would say we're getting very particular here. Um, in our industry, we've seen a lot of the crazy stories. We've seen a lot of things firsthand. You always want to be cognizant of, number one, what's in your background? And we've had several candidates who have had video interviews that have missed out on opportunities because they've had alcohol in the background or they've had a TV on in the background, like crazy things that they're just not really thinking about because we're getting a glimpse into our personal lives. I mean, you're in someone's home right now, so it kind of can seem like it's all blending together, but definitely put your best foot forward. I would say a video interview is the best way to do that. You can dress the way you want to. You can rehearse what you want to say. You can control your space. You can make sure there's no distractions. And this is the time to be very serious with that. Yeah. Now, I, I'll remind, I'll take a moment to remind folks, too, who are watching on our social media platforms that you can ask questions. And I, I say that because I do have, I'm seeing a comment from Ashley Strader, who looks like Ashley is watching on YouTube, from what I can tell. Um, and it looks more like a comment than a question. So, Ashley, if you have a specific question you want to know about, because um, you've commented situation, interview, question, slash, answer. So, if you, like, be more specific if you have a specific question about that and our experts will be glad to answer that for you. Um, and thank you, Ashley, for tuning in. Um, so while we await for perhaps more clarity from Ashley or other folks to hop in with their own questions, um, let's talk about maybe let continue on the interview um, topic of techniques. I mean, is there anything that you find yourself commonly reminding folks or telling folks for this interview process? 
Um, simple things, really, really simple things like don't chew gum while you're on a video interview. It's something that it's crazy to have to say out loud, but you know, people forget that the moment that the camera's on, you are trying to sell yourself and you're trying to make yourself be a part of that company. Um, things like keeping your camera at eye level, speaking directly into the camera. Those are things that are very, very important. Um, people forget and oftentimes you get weird angles of holding a phone or something along those lines. We remind folks to make sure that, you know, they're putting their best foot forward, like Connor said. Um, dress appropriately. If, if you're doing a video interview, make sure that you're dressing up as if you're going into an in-person interview. Um, make sure that you're thanking folks as you're, you know, fielding questions, take time, pauses, make sure that you're giving them the ability to provide you answers to the questions that you ask. Um, and make sure that you're tying in your responses to whatever those questions are. Like if they point to a, let's say a, a need that the company has, make sure that you're bringing up examples that show how you're going to help them solve the issues that they have at, at hand. Yeah, I guess that you, you brought up the concept of like, if the company mentions a need, how much research should you be doing on a company before you go into this interview? <laughs> That's a good question. I would say you can never do too much research and, and preparation is always your friend here. Um, I would over prepare for these situations. That way you know everything about the company, the culture, you have that ready so you can ask questions targeted toward the company and where they see themselves. Look up the LinkedIn profile, the manager you're meeting with, always. That's never a bad idea. That way you can tailor your questions and your approach to that specific person as well. It is so much better to prepare for these things than not. Uh, and then you risk asking questions that are already answered on the website or asking questions about what the company does. And those things just honestly are disqualifiers from interviews because that shows you haven't taken the time to look at the company that you want to work for, supposedly. Yeah, that that's great advice. <laughs> that's very good advice. Um, I, I was actually um, thinking about as far as um, preparations, um, are there things that you tell people to just like totally avoid? Don't do this. Absolutely don't do this either. Either maybe you, you can, it can be mm -hmm. resume writing or, or interview wise, anything. There are a couple of things that I always say to avoid, especially in an interview, whether it's virtual, over the phone, in person. Um, number one thing I always say to avoid is speaking negatively about a previous employer. That's, oh. that's a big red flag. Um, specifically in the eyes of an interviewer, they're going to ask you, okay, why are you looking to leave your company right now? And that's a big time for you to, to use that situation and pivot it toward the future. You know, here's what's pushing away from our organization. And it could be something as simple as, hey, you know, I've, I've been here for five years and there's no room for growth because my manager will never leave and the, the organization is very flat, whatever the case is, but have that ready. But then quickly pivot away to what's pulling you to this company. Right. I saw this company has openings here, here, and here. This aligns with where I see myself in the next five years, and I'm excited to contribute to their growth. Always be thinking of the push and the pull, and don't just be like, well, I hated my last job. One, one thing, too, I, I always tell candidates is make sure after the interview, send a thank you note, um, you know, a short email, a short PDF document, anything that you've got to send to an interviewer and thank them for their time. Also, make sure that you button up your LinkedIn profile. Um, can't tell you how many times people have been disqualified, not only from LinkedIn, but also from like Facebook profiles or, you know, Instagram profiles that are public and suddenly, you know, there's, there's a bad light that's painted on you, even though you did a great interview, it won't matter. Yeah. Great, great tips there. We are starting to get some questions from folks watching at home. Um, Rhonda is asking, how do you handle a huge gap from your last job on a resume? And um, for she's specific here, like three years or more. And it's because of a health issue, which I feel like maybe a lot of people can relate to with what we just went through the past two years. Um, so what was your recommendation for that? I think that we're at a time now where organizations are recognizing that they need to be human. Um, just like Matt said in that piece, right? It's, it's not an iron fist. We're not gonna question you know, all your personal reasons, but have a good enough solid reason to show why you were out of work. Um, and if during that time you can show that you were working on specific skill sets, maybe you were taking online courses, maybe you were, you know, doing things to sharpen up and keep those skills sharp. Um, you want to make sure that you can talk about those things. Um, but there's no shame in, in, you know, trying to get back into the workforce. In fact, that's a lot of the work that we do um, through our agency is making sure that we can help people kind of transition back in. Um, a lot of times, just be honest, be transparent. Most companies will understand. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'm, I'll take the question a step further because now I'm picturing like trying to spell that out on a resume. Would you put like, for example, say there's a three year gap, would you like put it on the resume? It, say you were working on something else, like you were going to school or whatever. Would you put that in that three year gap, like on your list of things that you've done? I actually just had a conversation with someone last week about this who 
left her, her previous employer about a year and a half ago, and she focused on pursuing her education, right? She continued her education, um, went back to school. And I said, that's something, to be, that's something to be proud of. You should be incredibly proud that you're completing this achievement. And I said, people are going to see that gap on your resume. They're going to have questions. Let's just get ahead of it. Like, like Juan said, be open and transparent ahead of this. And I asked her, I put it on your resume. Kind of discuss the classes you're taking. Discuss what you're doing to continue your education during these, this gap period, so to speak. And that way you're addressing those questions ahead of time. You're not having to, to risk it, right? Will someone call me or will they not call me? Because I'd rather they see that first and then make the decision than already discount you because of that. Yeah. Um, Karen is commenting from Facebook. Um, and this is, this is just some good advice, I feel like, but maybe you want to even elaborate on this. So Karen is saying you should always have a list of questions to ask about the company that you're interviewing with. And she also says, don't interrupt. But I feel like that kind of ties into what we were talking about with like research and maybe just showing interest by having that. Anything you want to add to that? Yes. Absolutely. We, oh, you want go to go ahead, ahead. Juan. Okay. <laughs> so we always tell candidates to do homework on three topics. One, do homework on the company and the organization you're interviewing with. Do homework on the actual job posting and description that you have so that you know it like the back of your hand and you can tie your examples to what they're looking for. Um, and then three, do homework on yourself and your resume. Um, a lot of people don't take the time to go back through their work history and identify the things that they have done and accomplished. Um, so we want to make sure that people know everything they've done so that in, in a moment of an interview, you can come back and pull out any examples that you have that may show why you're a good fit. Um, can't tell you how many times you know people get out of an interview, either through video or driving home, and they're like, oh man, I had the perfect example for you know why I'm a good fit for this company. But they think about it afterwards because during an interview, you get nervous, you get clammy, all those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Connor, did you have anything you want to add? And I would agree. Karen has a great point um, in her comment. Definitely have questions prepared because if you put that in perspective, if you have no questions prepared for someone that's interviewing you, that can send the absolute wrong message. You're taking your time to interview and, and they are as well, the hiring manager. And if they ask you, okay, what questions do you have for us? And you say, no, I'm good. I don't think I have any questions. That immediately tells that company and that manager that you're not interested enough to even ask them any questions about the job. Yeah, definitely. Um, it looks like Ashley Schrader from YouTube has um, just kind of elaborated a little bit more. Um, and it sounds like she is pointing out a specific question maybe some people might hear in an interview asking, like, tell us a time when you were able to turn a situation around. Um, and that actually just made me think there are probably some questions that people should be prepared to get in an interview. And... Um, maybe some of them might be surprises. Um, so what sort of top questions do you think people need to prepare for for an interview? I think there are definitely some situational questions that arise. Um, a lot of our clients like to use those questions because they're a good gauge of the person's culture fit and their personality and kind of how they would handle situations, of course. And there's always ways to think about it. There's a couple different methods we use. One of my favorite is called the MSA method. And you know, what did you make? What did you save? What did you achieve? Um, there's also the STAR method. There's different ways to approach these things and different guidelines we can offer candidates, but it's always helpful to, before you go into an interview, have these situations in your head. You know, just think of a couple different examples of maybe a time when you had to handle a confrontation, maybe a time when you had to persuade someone to get on your side about something. Just always have those things ready, like Juan said, when you're preparing for interviews, just have those things ready to go through when you need to. Yeah, I feel like some of the questions that I hear nowadays are um, not necessarily like, now tell us a great thing about yourself or like <laughs> it, it's, it, it is kind of like almost even like, how did you turn some problem around or like, mm -hmm. how did you take something that was negative and make it positive? So I think that's something that maybe folks should be yeah. thinking about. Yep. Um, Anil is asking, is there something like too much experience in the job market? I feel like I hear that. Like, I feel like I'm overqualified for this. I mean, too much experience. Is that a thing? Yeah, so I actually really like that question, and I think that candidates um, kind of reject themselves out of jobs based on not thinking that they're going to get it even before they apply. Um, and one of the things I tell candidates is don't self-reject. If you think that you're going to be happy at that organization in that job and the pay is you know, what you're thinking it should be, go ahead and apply for it. Um, the biggest thing, again, going back to that original point, make sure that you are tailoring that resume to that um, job that you're applying. So if you're, you know, a big leader, but you want to take a step back because maybe you don't want to be in management anymore, make sure that you tailor that resume down so it doesn't show that company that's like, you know, why are you applying for a job that's beneath you, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, Ashley is back with another question, which is a great question because 
I can't tell you how many stories we've done with people during this pandemic where they said, I've been doing this for so many years and I don't want to do this anymore. And I want to do something different. And I had this dream to be in this field or whatnot. Ashley wants to know, say, for example, her example here, you've been in customer service, you want to change roles. Maybe you don't have any background in what you want to do. Is there any way to kind of spin that or flip that? So it's not like, I, I don't have background, but here I come. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and changing your career can be very intimidating. It can seem like a scary thing at first. My best advice here is keep an open mind. Um, there is a lot right now. There's a lot in the job market. It's just a matter of keeping an open mind and, and being open to whatever kind of comes your way. I think there are several different avenues you can pursue, whether that's, hey, maybe I have to take a contract role just to get some additional experience in, in a different field. You know, get that on my resume, get that experience. Um, or it's taking a contract to hire role with a great organization here in Charlotte that likes to kind of try that program out to see if this company is the right fit for you and vice versa. Um, a lot of times those organizations will bring somebody on in a role that's contract to hire if they have no experience in a specific field and just kind of try them out and see if they love that company. And then they'll convert that person to a full-time role. Maybe it's the same role or a different role in a different industry. So there's always ways to approach it. Just keep an open mind and, and just don't pigeonhole yourself is my biggest advice. Yep. And, and I would add to that, too. Sometimes we talk about maybe it takes one step back to, you know, take a running sprint forward. Um, sometimes you may take a job that maybe is, quote unquote, by title lower than what you have. But if you want to switch industries, sometimes it takes that for a year, maybe two, and then you're off and running in the direction that you intend to go. Yeah. Yeah. All things to consider. You got to weigh it out. You know, maybe the, the bigger picture or the longer run um, mm -hmm. for what the move is going to mean for you. Shannon had a similar question, changing industry. So I think we tackled that. Um, one thing that I did want to pick your brain about, is there something, and you both can answer this in turn, but um, is there like a top, like, I don't want to say complaint, but like top feedback that you get from the employer side of like, you know, if this person only did this, or um, I don't know, is, is there like a top correction that you hear from employers for people who apply for their jobs? Um, I think for me, so I've, I've had some feedback um, recently. So number one, if you are showing up to an interview, like we've talked about, make sure that you're presentable. I had feedback, you know, about a candidate being essentially disqualified before they even got the chance to talk about their background. Um, and then I think also um, some other feedback, and it's very specific to industry. Um, if you're an engineer, know engineering. If you're in accounting, make sure that you know Excel and some, you know, SAP, for example. Um, it just really depends on what your specific field is, making sure that you've got the right skill sets um, for those jobs. Okay. Yeah. Honor, anything on your side? Um, one of the biggest feedback points I receive is culture-based or personality-based. And a lot of this can be pressure going into interviews, right? Like Juan said, a lot of us are inter interview nervous. It's, it's a weird thing for us to be doing is putting ourselves on a show, basically, and displaying for everyone else. And interviews can feel like you're being grilled, like you're being interrogated. Um, a lot of times this is a chance for you to let your personality show, let, let all of this out and really show the interviewers who you are, how your experience relates to the job. Um, so feedback that I've heard sometimes is, you know, this candidate looks great on paper, but in, in reality, their experience didn't really come through in the interview. They weren't able to talk through their experience. They couldn't tell me examples of when they made this happen. Um, and so just don't be afraid to, like Juan said, do your, do your research, know yourself, know the company, know the role and have that confidence. The more you practice these things, the more that confidence is going to come out and you'll really put your best foot forward in interviews. Okay, okay. Um, I did wanna, oh, I'm just gonna make sure that we're not missing any comments here. I think we're gonna work on the community stuff. Okay, um, let's, let's revisit resumes because I know we touched on it a bit. We might have some new people joining us um, who didn't get their questions. And so once again, folks who are just popping on here, um, ask, ask questions of our experts. I mean, they can be resume related. I know that's kind of the headline that we put here on this post, but we've also been talking about interviews. Um, I'm sure anything job related is, <laughs> is fair game here. Um, yeah. So Ashley commenting again, saying being a college graduate a few years back, looking for something that I don't have a degree in. I mean, I feel like that's, that's, that's the thing right now. I mean, people are, rethinking they're rethinking life they're rethinking you know how they want to be spending a good portion of their weekday do, doing so um yeah all i can say is is best of luck to you and in, in whatever you're looking for and yeah this is this is the story that we are hearing um from so many people but yeah i wanted to revisit the resume situation um 
I feel like at least when I was like first applying to, to jobs in, in news, there was like, you had to have like a cover letter and then your resume and, and in news, it's like, you got to highlight certain things. Um, is it safe to say that like, depending on different industries, you might be stacking your resume differently and, or maybe like education might be at the top for some and maybe for others, education's at the bottom. And like, I guess, how do you kind of uh, explain that to folks who come, come to advice about that? So I think with resumes, again, it goes back to tailoring it, right? So if it's a position that is highly skilled that requires a very specific degree, of course, put it at the top of the resume. Um, if it's something where your degree maybe doesn't tie into what it, the job actually entails, but your professional experience does, put that at the top and move your education to the bottom. Um, I think the other thing too is, is making sure that, um, really the, the main point is skill sets have to show on the resume um, at the end of the day, that's, that's the biggest thing. Got it, got it. So putting your best stuff up near the top, is it safe to say that? Correct. <laughs> okay. And it, I'm, I'm also going to guess you probably, and I, I know you touched on it, but you want to kind of keep it, you know, as, I don't want to say brief, but <laughs> as concise as possible. You don't have to put everything on there, right? Right. Absolutely not. And especially if you're someone who's been working for quite some time. I mean, I've even talked to candidates who have taken several years experience off their resume and said more experience if, if required to see like you can always put that on there and expand later. Um, what I would rather do is keep it short, succinct, you know, get what you need to get on there and then have that conversation down the road if they want, if they want to discuss that. Um, because I know a lot of people are very, very concerned about being disqualified based on years of experience. And so just nip that in the bud. Don't even include it if you're worried about it. Just focus on the relevant experience. Like you said, put the, the best stuff at the top and then yeah. the rest will come. I love the question from Ashley about having a cover letter. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So I would say, you know, have a cover letter if it's something that one, if the ATS system that you're applying through asks for a cover letter letter spot, please include one. Um, if you have one, go ahead and attach it to the resume. But the biggest thing here is it doesn't have to be a novel. Um, it, it can be just, you know, three short paragraphs. One, touching on, you know, why you want the job. Two, why you're qualified for the job. And then three, why you're excited about the opportunity and what the next steps are. Um, so again, it doesn't have to be a long written, you know, three page thing, just a short, you know, maybe 45, you know, couple little things there. Um, one thing too, that I would always say too, about the cover letters is people always forget to change the companies that are listed in their cover letter or their resume. Um, it, it's really, really easy when you're applying through indeed and LinkedIn to just click apply, click apply, click apply, but you forget to change what company you're applying to. <laughs> it makes me do the cringe face. Yeah. Uh, I, I can totally get how that would happen. I, I mean, not not in a judging way, just more like, like <laughs> pictured like doing that. Right. Um, okay, so we addressed the cover letter. Are we still doing um, to who it may concern, dear sir slash madam? <laughs> Are we like trying to be like specific, like we know like who we're writing to? <laughs> I think that depends. If you know who you're writing to, definitely address them. Um, I will say. I've seen comments on both sides of the fence. I personally am very anti cover letter. Um, I think, especially in this day and age, I think they are a waste of time. Um, I will say that working with a recruiter is a benefit because we, one of my coworkers says this every day and I think it's funny, but I'm running with it. He says that we are your cover letter as a recruiter. We're representing you. We're letting this client know who you are, what you've done, why you want the job. So you don't have to send that cover letter. It's, it's unnecessary. So I think that's always interesting. Yeah. And that's a good point there. Um, this is kind of a, a different um, tangent here, but Karen is asking again another question. Are new hires having difficulty transitioning to virtual training versus brick and mortar training? I don't know if you have, are you able to provide insight on that? I don't know if that's in your wheelhouse. I think it depends on the person. Um, I know a lot of our clients have had to adjust, right? As of 2020, they had to make everything virtual. Um, a lot of candidates had been onboarded and fully hired remotely, and they had never met their coworkers. As we're transitioning more into back in office and, like Karen said, brick and mortar, people are seeing a little bit of a shift where orientations can be in person. A lot of this is still remote, though. So um, depends on kind of your adaptability and your capability with technology and how familiar you are with that and if you're comfortable doing those online programs. But a lot of companies have this set up, and they've been doing it for several years. And I'd say they're pros by now, so they, they make it really easy to get into that system. Earlier, y'all had mentioned um, how you can also assist with, um, you know, like salary negotiation type mm -hmm. stuff. And that just makes me wonder, and I don't know if it's changed at all. I mean, are we, is it okay to talk money in that initial interview? 
um, like what are, I, I guess, you know, have the boundaries changed mm. in the past couple of years? <laughs> I think it's important to be prepared if it does come up, but don't be the one to bring it up, especially in a first interview. Um, it's not appropriate to start asking about money. Um, it kind of shows that you're going in for the wrong reasons. Um, yeah. You know, employers want to know that you're there for them and for the actual position, not for the dollar signs. Yeah. Okay. So things have not changed. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure because, you know, we, we are dealing, I feel like with an evolving um, marketplace, if you will, where, you know, People are looking for different things, and in some ways, they're putting their foot down more for the things that they want from their employer. Um, Ashley's asking again a question that I'm sure y'all would love to answer because um, she missed the beginning. Um, Ashley, they work for Talent Bridge. Do you guys want to talk about Talent Bridge and what you do, just for the folks who are just hopping on now? Ooh, Connor, would love to. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just see my eyes light up. Um, so, Talent Bridge has been in Charlotte since 2002. We essentially are a staffing partner. We connect people with their purpose in life and, and have meaningful conversations in the area. So our job is to act as a partner to folks that are looking for new jobs or folks that are looking to hire talent for their team. And we really are a resource on both sides of the house. Um, so whether you know somebody who wants to make a change in their career, whether you want to make a change yourself, whether you know somebody who maybe needs to add someone to their team in the next couple of weeks, we are here to help you. So we can be a resource for you in all ways through interview preparation, interview debriefs, salary negotiation, resume feedback and tips. We are here as a resource for you. All right. So there you go, Ashley. Now you are in the know. Um, I feel like we're starting to wind down with some of the comments that we're getting. Um, I figured I'll just throw this out there for just like a nice, well-rounded discussion. Um, we talked about a lot about perhaps what employers are looking from, from their applicants. I mean, what are you hearing on the other side? You know, the employers who are like, I'm trying to get someone to come and they're not coming. Like, what are you hearing from the, the candidates who are passing on these companies? So that's a great question. I think one of the biggest things that we see, uh, as candidates really want to feel included and be a part of something that is growing to something bigger. Um, and, and a lot of times employers don't relay that message properly to the candidates, maybe through an interview or mm -hmm. through the whole process. Um, we always, you know, tell clients, be excited about bringing someone on and show them why they want to be there. Um, you know, obviously you can't necessarily hide a bad culture per se, or you can't hide, you know, flaws in the organization, but if there are bad reviews about your organization, talk about them, bring them up, you know, face them head, head first so that that candidate feels like they can trust what you're saying and what the job they're going into is. Anything on your side, Connor? I agree hundred percent. I think that's probably the main focus. And I think as with all things, address it with transparency and, and get it, get, get ahead of that when you can, you know, don't let that come around and nip, you know, bite you in the butt later. Just talk about it right now, nip it in the bud, address those concerns and talk about what you're doing to change that, to change the culture and, and be forward thinking and talk about that progressive nature. Yeah. Um, Matthew, <laughs> Matthew is on here talking about hybrid workspaces. Speaking of things that I guess like, you know, employees nowadays might be looking for something hybrid. Um, are businesses looking at, he's calling it hot desking, um, sharing desks among different people and different shifts? And is that a good middle ground for employers and employees? Is that something you've heard talked about? Personally, I, in my industry, have not seen that come up yet. What I have seen is kind of the shift to a hybrid schedule, whether it's, you know, come into the office three days a week and work from home twice a week. Um, we're seeing a good bit of that now as employers recognize that they have to adjust to keep their talent and retain talent and attract talent in this marketplace where a lot of companies are moving fully remote and they have been for a while. That's a big attractive piece for some candidates. You know, there, there are still some folks that want to work in office five days a week, which is totally fine. But um, I just think that's not the way that things are progressing. And so people have to be competitive to get that, to get that talent. Yeah. Um, Ashley wanted to know, um, speaking of talent bridge, do you guys usually work with mostly like remote jobs or hands-on jobs, um, any industry? So that's an excellent question. We actually work um, primarily here in the Charlotte market. We have other markets as well. Um, we okay. just opened up a, a Denver office, for example, um, but we're very much a local recruiting firm. And then we also have a national arm. Um, so it really depends on what you're going after. Um, for us here locally in Charlotte, so Connor and I are on our local recruiting team. Um, we have human resources and recruiting. Um, we have accounting and finance, which is what I support, engineering, construction, mm -hmm. um, professional support services, and IT. Did okay. I miss any, Connor? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, think I, I think I got them all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all 
right. So there you go, Ashley, and um, you're very welcome. And thank you. Thank you for asking so many questions, great questions that are going to um, give some wonderful insight to folks who are also tuning in. Um, so yeah, I think we are kind of getting to a winding down point. Um, do y'all want to leave us with any parting tips here? Any parting comments? We can go one at a time or however you want to do it. Hmm. I think looking for a new job and changing careers can be very scary. Uh, don't let that intimidate you. I think finding a partner, number one, is going to be helpful, whether it's us as recruiters, another recruiting firm, have someone that you can bounce ideas off of, have a couple. Um, it always helps to have different eyes on things, situations that can give you advice and kind of consult you in different ways. And just be open with people you're talking to. Be transparent. Talk about what you want, what you don't want. Those are equally important factors. And just be open-minded to whatever comes your way. All right. Juan, anything? Excellent advice from Connor. Um, one thing I will add, you know, a lot of people have misconceptions about staffing firms. Um, you know, particularly with TalentBridge, for example, we don't charge our candidates anything for coming to us. Um, same thing with clients. We, we, of course, have a fee, but it doesn't actually get charged until we find you the right person. And so that's something that's really, really important. Um, don't give yourself, give yourself all the resources that you can, um, especially if there's someone out there that's willing to help and kind of assist you in that career search. Um, apply and have a conversation. That It never hurts to talk to people. All right. Ashley is just the question queen. Do you have like a a link to talent bridge that you can offer to us is it like an easy can we remember it easy talentbridge.com there you go <laughs> talentbridge.com well we've got some interest for you so that is great to hear um i think that's going to do it for us i'm not seeing um really any other questions coming in so thank you juan and thank you connor from talent bridge for joining us for this very robust coming from okay <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Ashley, it's just <laughs> i like it engagement he's very engaged um thank you all for coming on here and having this robust conversation about resumes and job hunting and all that and um thanks to everyone who joined in for the stream we had some great questions and i enjoyed it a lot did y'all enjoy absolutely yeah, great <laughs> fabulous all right thanks everyone um i'm vanessa rufus by the way with wcnc charlotte we are going to sign off the stream for now we'll see you next time thanks vanessa mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I'm Ben Thompson here in the WCNC Charlotte uh, studios, just wrapping up our Bin Day newscast. Um, thanks so much for joining us here on YouTube and, and Facebook Live. We're, we're talking about something today that that's just it's so important, and it's always been important, but I think it's uh, become more important than last year or so um, as we're navigating new ways of, of, of living and working and, and relating with other people. And so uh, joining us today is Dr. Robert Matlack. He's from Best Day Psychiatry and Counseling. Um, and he is taking your questions, um, and we've had questions already submitted by some folks, and we'll get to those coming up in just a second. Um, and if you have a question yourself, you, you have a, a trained professional right now um, <laughs> at your fingertips, uh, so to speak, over the course of the next few minutes, who can take your questions so you can post them there on YouTube or Facebook. Doc, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, I mentioned the pandemic. I, I mean, I think Probably your business and, and a lot of the businesses has changed, have changed, but I know so many people um, have been suffering in a variety of ways uh, during this time. Um, well, what, just as a, as a point of curiosity first, what trends, if any, are you seeing over the last year and a half? Well, we're seeing some trends in a number of areas. Um, I, probably the big two I hear are depression and anxiety. Okay, um, just, you know, the changes, things that have happened have probably thrown people off the most. Um, you know, you see plenty of people who their lives have changed to where they have to do things a different way or there's new pressures or new routines. And, you know, that can lead to stress in everyday life. Um, but you also, you know, there's also been concerns about, uh, you know, isolation a little bit, kind of like you know, where they end up getting depressed or keeping to themselves a lot of times. Um, and that a lot of times can lead to depression in itself. Um, you know, now, you know, it's normal to be nervous. It's normal to be, you know, moody. Um, but it is something that, uh, you know, can, uh, can make a difference in terms of, uh, you know, your day-to-day -day activity. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to seek help, but a good number of people do. What you, you provide the perfect sort of segue to my next question. How do you know that it's really anxiety versus, oh, I'm just a little nervous? Um, and how do you differentiate between 
this is normal and I actually might need to get some help. Sure. Well, you know, everybody's anxious. You're supposed to be anxious. That's just part of being a person. Um, and, you know, when things change, it's normal to be thrown out of the ball game a little bit where you're a little more stressed, where things are just a little bit different with sleep and other things. It's where things start getting, you know, to the extreme, like it's been taken up a few notches. Like, uh, you know, you're throwing yourself into panic attacks or you have a lot of stress where you end up having to, you know, you just can't go anywhere. You feel a little more like less, uh, less comfortable going places. You know, the big thing you hear about with COVID is people, you know, worrying about they're going to catch the virus. So it does create a little bit of stress. Um, yeah, but that, that can sort of, but if it, if it looks like it's affecting their day-to-day -day activity, their routine, their sleep, their mood, a lot of stuff, then yeah, it's probably a good time to start calling. It's it's not just a, it's not an isolated thing. It's impacting your 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 work and uh, your relationships and, and things like that. Um, joining us today is Dr. Robert Matlack here on Facebook Live and YouTube from Best Day Psychiatry and Counseling. If you have any questions, please let us know. Some of you already submitted questions um, this morning. Um, one of them was, um, if I know somebody whose mental health is suffering right now, and I know that, what can I do to support them? Um, well, first of all, yeah, be there. Okay, support systems are a fantastic source of treatment. Okay, they you know let somebody know they're not alone, that there there are things that uh, you know people care about them. There are things that, that can be done to help them as well. Just being there as a person, just being a friend or family member. Um, but you know if you feel like something is starting to you know get a little bit out of whack, it wouldn't be unheard of just to say you know we're, we're kind of noticing these things about you. It's kind of changing. Are you okay? Um, or do we need to go talk to somebody? You know people are. We're human. We're going to have times where we need to talk to somebody, but you know, just being a friend and talking to somebody that way, just approaching it like that. Um, you know, some people like don't like to hear that, but uh, you know, a lot of ways, some people kind of understand it, even when it's happened to it. So, a good number of people will appreciate it. Uh, a question from Shatima uh, Harris on on Facebook, wanting to know why is it so hard to receive help for PTSD, and then she goes on further and, and buckles down and says, uh, especially in the Black community. I mean, so many of these things that we're talking about, the reason that we're doing this here today with you is, is there's a stigma associated and there's stigma associated with certain conditions. There's stigma that, that come with, with um, certain backgrounds that, that are different. So specifically with this, um, what can you tell, what can you tell Ms. Harris to, to sort of help her here? Well, there's, there's two parts. Let me take the first part first. It's very hard to, you know, receive help with PTSD in a lot of places because a lot of places are more backed up right now. Um, the access has been different, okay? Uh, you know, what, as, us as a practice, what we try to do is to make sure we are able to, you know, get people in when we need to, um, because it, it is part of just being human, you know, things like that where you're going to need help sometimes. Um, with regards to the Black community, there could be different reasons for that. One of them, there could be cultural differences. Okay, you may see somebody respond differently to one culture than another. Uh, you may see an access issue, you know, based on, you know, that different... Uh, different places where people live, okay? You know, you can see uh, um, racial differences in terms of, uh, you know, one community versus another, uh, where, you know, some communities may, may have many resources, some may not. But it's something to where, you know, a lot of times even finding somebody they can open up with. Um, sometimes there are cultural differences to the point where they may feel they don't quite connect with the therapist the way in some others do. You know, the, the thing about that I'd say is find the therapist that works the best because you're going to see a lot of different styles out there. Um, and it, part, when you're working with something PTSD, you're really putting everything out there on the table where you can kind of, you know, where you, you have to talk about stuff. And you got to feel where he can trust. Um, and you got to feel like it's somebody that understands. You. Um, but, you know, but and then, you know, it's but those are those are probably some of the reasons. Yeah, and I, th I think you make a good point. Make sure that you you, you find a, a therapist counseling service that that works for you, because because just like human beings, people have different preferences and different likes. and, and it, it's important not to give up if at first you you you, you don't find one that really you um, enjoy. Um, how has um, um, how has this pandemic changed your job? As far as you mentioned, a backlog of patients in some cases, but but has the virtual aspect of this, what you and I are doing right here right here right now, has that not opened at least some more opportunities for folks yeah, where they no, don't I, they don't have to travel? Yeah, I mean, I, I tell you, it's, this is all new ground for all of us. OK, um, I, I have found because we we were doing virtual for a while. Then we started going to, you know, I, I talked to, you know, summer or so. We said, all right, we're going to give people the option of coming into the office. We're doing it virtually. 
Uh, I have seen almost like probably above 80% of people want to do it virtually. Okay. Just because I think they like it that they're able to just call from home or call from work or, you know, in the car even or something like that, where it's, it gives them more time. Okay. Uh, which has been really nice. So I think I think the virtual I've been a fan of the virtual world so far with this kind of thing, uh, but if somebody wants to come in person, I think that's great. I've had some that just say, "Yeah, I, I want it face to face. I want it personal." That's fine. You know, we offer both, but uh, but it really depends on the person. So way kind of like what you just said, it it makes an access issue a lot better. Uh, so many times I've had people just without the resources of coming in or transportation, but this makes it a lot easier. In this kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, there's definite pluses to the virtual. Yeah, um, I can speak from personal experience. I, I just got married and we've been to couple counseling trying to be preventative in some of these issues. And we went to um, a, 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 the actual counselor a few times and then decided to go virtual and found it to be um, really just as helpful um, a, a, as it was in person. But to your point, everybody's a little different. Um, I yeah. want to follow up. Uh, Shatima Harris uh, followed up with something. And I think at this point, you almost have to take this all, offline. But she was saying she was receiving therapy for anxiety and depression when she was diagnosed with PTSD, it was completely uh, cut um, from in health insurance, it sounds like. She doesn't know what to do. It sounds like a serious situation. I think perhaps maybe um, we take this offline with her and maybe she contact you or your office and, and there might be some more specifics unless you feel comfortable talking about it here. Well, I can I can tell you general things of what you yeah. can do because I yeah. now this is not a bad question to ask because I hear about stuff like this. Because um, insurance, there's been so many changes. Um, you know. And in, in usually when you have a, a psychiatric provider, usually we should at least give you a 30-day notice, okay? We should still be your provider for 30 days, okay? Even if, if there's not health insurance or anything, we still have a duty, okay? Now, if for some reason you get cut off, uh, there are access points you can go to. Uh, you know, even just, it, it just depends. And, it, and it's harder to do this with the whole COVID thing. Sometimes even just going to like a local health department or the emergency room or something like that where they can help you. Um, I, I've known people in that situation where they were doing that, then they, you know, they, they felt like, you know, until they went from one to the next and things like that. Um, our, our practice, we take pretty much any insurance, we take any kind of government insurance pretty much, um, you know, but it's also something where you look at it and you kind of say, you know, do I qualify for any other kind of benefit? Uh, that's, that's the hardest part about this. Now, I'm not an insurance guy, okay? so I'm just a psychiatrist, but it is something that my point being that it, going somewhere, you know, to get some help with this. Um, I've even known people that have gone, you know, if, if they're a religious person, they go to the clergy, um, or, you know, just like I said, the friends and support are there. But, you know, the, the ER is there for, you know, emergencies. And if this is an emergency, absolutely. I mean, you know, go there if you feel like you need something because it is something where they can help you. Um, I, another question submitted before our webcast submitted this morning. Um, it talks about how, how this person evidently has some, some time between therapy appointments and struggles to, to sort of keep their head right in between as far as, as, as not um, leaning into anxiety or, or anxiousness. What are ways that you tell folks to, to sort of um, keep themselves uh, in, in between appointments? If they have to go a few weeks or if they have to go a month or if they don't want to be virtual, what's a, a good way to sort of, um, you know, keep your, keep your mind clear in between appointments? Oh, you, you try to live a good life the best you can. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I tell everybody that I, that I see, you know, if, if you need a sooner call, let's do it. Okay. Um, and I, you know, not a day goes by, I don't have something like that. And probably many other professionals as well. Um, you know, the, the best thing I can tell you is, you know, we're all human. A lot of people go through this stuff. You don't feel isolated about it. Uh, have fun when you can. Enjoy life when you can. If, if it's something to where even if it's like 15, 30 minutes or five minutes, something just do something that takes yourself back on stuff uh it's normal to get upset it's normal not to feel well but you want to you know treat yourself well you know i could go even further and say eat well exercise you know try to do some things that might make you feel better or just hobby something just distract you with some things in general or a lot of times are good for people because you know we do as humans we do need distractions sometimes to help with mental health yeah it's it's amazing how much just some basic distraction can help when because when, when you're in a bad place and, and you're either depressed or you're anxious, th those problems can seem overwhelming. And yeah. we, we've all been there. And if you can get distracted either by friends and family or, you know, some other means, you know, restaurant, going out shopping, just to get your mind off of it, it can give you just a little breather and maybe a little perspective. As oh, well. yeah. And there's, there's articles about, you know, 
20 things you could do to take your mind off of stuff, which is, you know, <laughs> there, there are things that are out yeah. there. It's just, you just find something that's just, don't, don't miss out on. Heather's asking right now. Um, it, it's a generic question, a general question, and then she gets more specific and says, why is it hard to be diagnosed with anything? She goes on to say, it, it's okay for depression, bipolar, or schizophrenia, or anxiety, but anything beyond the normal scope means you are abnormal, and I feel like it's taken me 30 years to be diagnosed. I mean, you know it better than anybody, Doc. I mean, I mean the human mind is a complex, complicated thing. That's what I'm told. <laughs> but, but it is something that, uh, you know, that, that's 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 a fair question, um, and, and and it depends on the provider. Now I, I'll go ahead and tell you when when we're trained. Okay, this is something where you know when you're tested, you, you want to make sure that they're not saying, uh, "What do you feel like this patient has?" And it's like you don't you don't just dive into that. Now it's good to have some ideas. Okay, the problem is that things can change. Okay, now I, I can't speak for this case in general, but um, you know I, I usually when I think when I meet somebody, I have a good idea. Are we dealing with some type of a mood issue or an anxiety issue? that would use more generic diagnosis. Um, then hopefully, time goes on, you kind of level on into what it is. Uh, the big thing is, well, there's a few reasons. that Some people don't want to diagnose, I, I especially because I do adults and I do kids. I always hate stamping a kid with something, saying this is what it is, move on, okay? Because there can be so many things. People change over the years. Now, you know, the opposite side of that is true. I mean, don't, don't leave them hanging, okay? You, you want to at least have a direction you're going in where you kind of look at that stuff. Um, some are easier than others. But, uh, you know, it, and you'll see many providers that are just different how they do stuff. Um, I would like to think it's so we make sure that we're getting everything right, okay? Because it's, it's something you just you don't want to stamp somebody with something you don't have. Yeah, what, what's, what's typically the, the most complicated thing you see? Oh, wow. Well, there's a – it depends. I, I, probably one of the hardest things I see is sometimes psychosis or schizophrenia or other things like that, too. Um, just because it's it's something which just can take over to a degree. I I've seen extreme depression where it's just someone just is totally different than how they used to be, uh, withdrawn. You know, the suicidal stuff comes in, which is really really worrisome. Um, I uh, you see sometimes the PTSD stuff where you know somebody is there, they they're fine, they go through something, and they're just they're just very different. Okay, uh, I take your pick. There's there's a number of them that I do see that are just particularly rough. The, the thing I would advise, though, there are things we can do about it. There is hope. Now, the degree of hope and stuff we change, it depends on the person. But, you know, literature has shown time and time again, there are things that we can do. It's not a perfect system, but it can make a heck of a difference when it's done correctly. I, I would think it, that getting someone to acknowledge and embrace the idea that they might need help is perhaps the biggest hurdle. And then once they get in to see you, perhaps the, they, they begin to understand how, how, how they can get help and start to feel relief and, and feel better. Um, once you get past that, how do folks know and how do you coach people to say, you know what, I think you're good now. Um, I, I, th I think you, you've, you've accomplished. When do folks know, you know what, I, I, I'm better now and I don't know that I need you know, a, a, a counseling session every, yeah. every couple of weeks or, or every week? Well, it, there's, there's many, many facets you look at with that. I mean, the big thing is, you know, are we having, how, where are we on the symptoms that we were having? You know, are they gone? Are they there a little bit? You know, and the other thing I think about is, you know, how long is it? Been? You know, I and mean, there's some literature that talks about, you know, duration. You know, there's an old, there's a very blunt rule sometimes if somebody has uh, done well on depressive meds for a year, then, you know, you come off the medication or you try or you consider it. You know, if somebody has had ongoing issues for years and years and years, a lot of people would say continue treatment. Now, that's that's not always an absolute. Yeah, I've had sometimes if things change in their life or other things, it makes it a lot easier to just, you know, come off things and do stuff. But I would say it's just, you know, are the, are the symptoms gone? Are they under control? Is it, has it been a long while? Are we at a different place? That's that's when you kind of start to think about, yeah, let's let's cut back some slack here. A little bit. Let's, you know, let's let them give, give them a chance. Let's get them yeah. to do. Um... Final, final question now, Doc, because I know uh, you, you've got stuff to get to, but final question, Teresa asking, BPD, what do you do for that? BPD, assuming she's talking about borderline personality disorder, um, what do you do for that? It's one of the toughest conditions. Um, now, there's, there's different opinions about this. Therapy, a lot of times, is a very good thing to do because you work on ways of handling personality aspects of, of a borderline personality. Um, a borderline personality and her personality condition in general can be pattern of relating or interacting with others, which are, you know, they, they don't work as well for the person or others. 
um, from a psychiatric standpoint, you know, um, you know, you do try to do some therapy and there's a kind of behavioral called dialectical behavioral therapy, which is a type of therapy, which there's workbooks and other things that can help. Um, from a medicine side of the street, you know, if, if people that have these things can suffer from depression or mood swings or anxiety, you know, a low dose of medication or some medicines would not be unheard of, that type of stuff, because it can help them improve on their therapy. But that's, that's individual. You know, a lot of times the treatment of choice for a lot of these things is therapy. All right. Dr. Robert Matlack, Best Day Psychiatry and Counseling. Uh, doctor, I think this is tremendously helpful for folks who might not always have access to, to expertise like yours and to be able to come on and, and chat about this openly for everybody yeah. to listen in, I think only, only helps and can destigmatize things and also just share some really, uh, important information. So, um, we'll let you get back to your day. We know you've got, uh, patients waiting to see you. Um, and we appreciate everybody chiming in, uh, during this, uh, YouTube and Facebook live doc. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks for having me. And thanks everybody for the questions. Much appreciated. All right. Take care. Have a good weekend. Bye. You too. Thanks. Bye. CMS has its hands full tonight as they plan to take on several big issues. Here's three things you need to know. First up, leaders want to hear from you on next year's school budget. Tonight, folks can weigh in about plans to raise teacher pay as part of the district's $2.2 billion proposed budget. CMS leaders also expect to look at new performance data showing a drop in the number of high school students taking advanced courses. The district says the number of students taking language and arts courses is also below targets as well. It's all challenges the new superintendent will likely face. Today, the board will finalize interview questions for candidates. The district hopes to have a new superintendent picked out by next month. Well, spring just started, but if you've got kids, now's the time to start planning for ways to keep them occupied this summer. How's that going? We are already in the planning process. <laughs> it's a struggle, I mean, from really what I is. hear. Especially with the budget, right? Right, the budget and, and really just the timeline. Yeah. You got to get started That's early. Right. WCNC Charlotte's Carolyn Brock is joining us with what we need to know before selecting a summer camp for those kiddos. Okay, so here are five steps to help you select a summer camp. And this is according to the Better Business Bureau. They took a deep dive into this. The first thing you need to know is accreditation. Mm. You need to check for that. So there is a um, accreditation kind of organization called the American Camp Association. Um, it will accredit camps in the United States if they meet 32 national summer camp standards. So that's a good place to start. The second thing to know, safety requirements. Yes, we are no longer in a pandemic, but COVID could still be a concern. So you wanna know what the camp protocols are. What are the health guidelines? Are visitors gain, gaining access to that camp? So know these things ahead of time. The third thing, get references. Yes, this is not a uh, job interview, but at the same time, you are going to be putting your child in the care of these people. So ask camp management. It's totally in your right to ask them to put you in touch with past campers so you can discuss their experiences with the camp. And also make sure you check those online reviews. Just mm -hmm. get a deep dive and be thorough with that. Mm -hmm. you, this is something that you cannot overlook. Evaluate health resources the camp has. Interesting. You want to ask about the medical facilities on site to treat your camper if they do become sick or injured. So is there one that's on site? You also need to know the camp policy if medical care is in fact needed. You also need to know if there are kids, if this is like a sleepaway camp and you, your child maybe has to take a daily medication, what are the accommodations for that? who is in charge of administering it. You just want to iron out all those details so you're not surprised about it in the end. And this one, speaking of budget, guys, you <sighs> have to review the contract and the fees. you got to read the fine print. You cannot trust or take the word of anything that is said to you. You have to read that contract before you sign it. And it's very important for you to ask about the total cost. You want the deposit included because some camps have this deposit requirement that's separate from the total cost. You say everything included I need to know before you sign. That's what you need to know. Here are the five steps to pick that summer camp. I know it's a lot of information, but no. it's important. Well, when you're a parent, you got to do your due diligence, right, Carolyn? So yeah, good, I'm trying to help here. Good steps there. We appreciate Things it. Things to keep in mind. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, it certainly felt like we got the summer vibe. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. With your help, WCNC Charlotte is making a difference in our community. We want people to know it's okay to ask for help.
We are the guardrails to some of these families who are struggling. We get to present a check for $5,000 via the Techna Foundation. These people give up their heart and their time, and they don't get anything but thank yous in return. If you'd like to make a difference, go to WCNC.com slash make a difference now. Happening today, Union County Schools considering limiting what material can be on display in district classrooms. Their proposed plan would limit displays to items related to curriculum, but there's concern about what this could mean for LGBTQ students. Wake Up Charlotte's Tradisha Wooder joins us now with more. Tradisha? Well, Sarah, as Union County Board of Education prepares to vote, some parents and LGBT leaders have drafted up a petition encouraging people to stand up against the plan. Now, the proposal says classroom displays should be limited to content related to the United States, the state of North Carolina, the school name, the mascot or curriculum. Now, opponents say this change could ban pride flags and safe spaces for LGBT students. They say it could also limit education about marginalized communities and make LGBT students feel more alone than they already do. District leaders saying reading material must also have value and be comprehensive and evidence based, which could possibly ban books with LGBT content. Now, so far, people against the plan, they have about 670 signatures on this petition. The meeting is set to start at 7 o'clock tonight, and of course, we'll be sure to keep you updated if any changes are made. Ben. All right, Tradisha, thank you. Now to another update here. More fallout for Charlotte's public transportation. Cats ongoing operations issues are a big concern for city leaders, and they were a focal point at today's transportation planning and development meeting this morning. All this while leaders work on a $13 billion transit plan for the city. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre is joining us to show us how the dialogue is going so far. Jesse. Yes, that's right. You know, city leaders are stepping in to get cats back on track. Now, this comes after learning of derailments that were not properly disclosed to local leaders, past due inspections, and several concerns about safety. This thing it, it is a cancer, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and we got to you got to treat the cancer before it spreads. And I think you can even say that maybe it's spreading already because it's just not the derailment, it's the maintenance, it's all the other things that we're dealing with. Monday, the City of Charlotte's Transportation Planning and Development Committee met to discuss several issues plaguing CATS. The Federal Transit Administration has been requested to do a review of CATS following a rail derailment back in May of 2022 that was not properly reported to city leaders. It was later discovered former CEO John Lewis did send a text to city manager Marcus Jones at the time, but it was missed. I'm not going to, um, but um, 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 lose a lot of sleep over the fact that he missed it. I'm losing sleep over the fact that it was uh, that somehow it wasn't reported in a different way other than a text, right? Well, Mr. Jones did not recognize the inflammatory nature of the word derailment did not appreciate the need to be very upfront about that. Uh, and, you know, it was a, a bit of a lapse on his part, but I can well understand that he didn't think, based on the information he got, that there was a need to make public disclosure. The FTA is looking into maintenance records, operations, safety, and state of repairs. Necessary repairs, city leaders say, will not interrupt service. We have the capacity to continue to offer the service that we have been offering and trains will be cycled out of service in order to get these repairs done a few at a time. Interim CAT CEO Brent Cagle says they are implementing mandatory overtime to cover vacancies after learning the rail system has not operated with adequate staffing. The issue also flagged by NCDOT after an unannounced inspection. And we are going to be compensating the controllers for that and we will be getting much more aggressive or trying to find more aggressive ways to recruit new controllers. The agency will also be working with a third party company to improve the work culture, customer service and leadership. Now that we've been alerted to this problem, we are going to be very vigorous about making sure we don't get it again. Now, once on track, city leaders will work to find the right candidate to fill the CEO position. Now, despite the issues, there are no plans to stop moving forward on the transit plan. Live in studio, Jesse Pierre sending it back to you. Thank you, Jesse. Verify, WCNC Charlotte. Verify is all about trying to make a difference in the community by making sure that the community has the correct information. This is what we know. 
and hey, this is what we don't know, sometimes you're actually surprised by the answer. Verify the difference. Verify is a great way to combat that misinformation, making sure that people know the process of the reporting. The York County Sheriff's Office making its youngest hires yet. Yeah, the office says it's welcoming its first 19 year old detention officers. Sheriff Tolson recently swore in Seth Schultz and Heather Culver. Both used to be civilian booking clerks before becoming detention officers. In January, Sheriff Tolson lowered the age requirement from 21 to 19 for detention officers in order to help fill vacancies at the county detention center. Right now we got to talk about a new art exhibit. It's here in Charlotte. It features the work of the well known Pablo Picasso, but it also sheds light on a lesser known artist, but it's a name you've probably heard a lot here in Charlotte, Romare Bearden. Yes, sure. He has an uptown park named after him, but Larry Sprinkle shows us how the Picasso event also pays tribute to the Charlotte born Bearden. Romare Bearden isn't just a well known park in the Queen City. Bearden was a creative and influential artist who was born near what is now Uptown. And though he traveled all over the United States and the world and made a name for himself, he still means a lot to the Mint Museum and to the city of Charlotte. So the museum decided it would be great to highlight his work and show how much Bearden was greatly influenced by Picasso. We knew we had a Picasso show coming. We knew we were going to be the only East Coast venue. We thought, how can you know, all these people be coming in? How can we really spotlight Bearden even more? And so we decided to organize this exhibition, which explores their relationship. Romare Bearden, who was African-American, was a student of Picasso and other modern artists. And Picasso's impact on Bearden was profound. You can see that in the artwork. So you'll see a number of Beardens you haven't seen. We brought in Beardens from private and public collections across the country, um, along with a couple of more Picassos, um, so that people can really see that relationship uh, in person. The exhibition gives Charlotteans the chance to learn more about their own culture and history. If you didn't know Romar Bearden was from Charlotte, he really is one of the most significant American artists of the second half of the 20th century. Um, you know, he kind of reintroduced, reinvigorated the medium of collage. A lot of his work draws, looks back on his ties to the South. This is the first show to explore the relationship between these two amazing artists. It's called Rhythms and Reverberations, and it's just one part of the bigger Picasso exhibition, which has proven to be very popular. Our um, Picasso Landscapes Out of Bounds show, it's drawing in people. Um, really busy on the weekend, so I would say if you want to come see it, definitely come midweek if you can. In Uptown, I'm Larry Sprinkle, WCNC Charlotte. Well, if you're interested in checking out the Picasso exhibition, head on over to WCNC.com or just find the story on our WCNC mobile app. The show actually runs through May 21st, so you've got a little more time. Take a look and show you our, our camera views right here. Every view is looking okay. We have one exception. Uh, we have a great shot there, as you can see, from over in Monroe. The first camera, Kannapolis is all right. Our tower camera, and then the second camera in Monroe indicated a bit of patchy fog over there in Union County, North Carolina. Visibility at the moment, less than two mile visibility here in the Quinn City. Over in Shelby, in Cleveland County, that is half a mile. So you may drive through a bit of patchy fog, but no major massive fog issues out there. We'll check and show exactly what's happening across the area. The future cast indicates a few fair weather clouds during the afternoon. Check out these temperatures. It is a mild morning for the most part. We're looking at temperatures into the 50s out there. Unfortunately, here we go. Pollen count off the charts again today and again tomorrow. Thursday with an opportunity for some showers going to back it off a bit, but uh, unfortunately that is a major issue. The prime culprit, cedar, sycamore, and oak, uh, pine pollen. That's the kind you see in your car, the yellow, but it certainly is not going to cause you sneezing, sniffling. It's the sneezing, sniffling. The rest of those culprits right there. Rain chance over the next seven days. Here we go. We get into Thursday showers. Friday could be uh, one of those days with periods of rain. I think it's just going to be light rain, not expecting severe weather threat. Over the weekend, the day uh, we'll see more opportunities for showers would be on Saturday, maybe even a few showers on Sunday as well. Uh, no severe weather threat here today. Unfortunately, in areas that have been just bombarded with severe weather week after week, it's the upper Midwest, Midwest, all the way down to the Mid-South, where there's a potential for strong and severe storms and some of those long track tornadoes over parts of Illinois into Iowa and all the way into Arkansas and the parts of Mississippi out there today. Right now we do have some uh, light rain showers tracking across the Carolina coastline moving towards the Outer Banks, but that's moving away from us. So there's no rain in the forecast today. Uh, as you can see uh, along the Great Lakes region, some showers that developing storm system back to the west with the line of showers uh, moving across the Great Lakes, moving west to east. Once again today, the threat is 
in the midsection of the country. And then tomorrow uh, from Memphis all the way to, to the Ohio Valley. So from the Mid-South, the Ohio Valley, then we take you into Thursday. We get to Thursday afternoon, late afternoon. We may see a couple isolated strong storms, uh, basically northwest and west of the Charlotte area. Check the Guy Roofing seven day forecast. We're in the low 80s today, warming up tomorrow, mid 80s. More of the same on Thursday. That rainstorm chance is more likely in the afternoon. Friday, yes, uh, there's going to be some showers. It's going to be the light rain variety, a very, very chilly Saturday. And then for Easter Sunday, we're below average as far as temperatures, close to average with some sun returning next Monday. That's for WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. New at six in life, sometimes we have setbacks and for a Charlotte family, the word cancer changed their lives forever. But tonight, nine year old Cameron is doing well and thanks to make a wish, he was able to make a once in a lifetime trip reliving his favorite movie. WCNC Charlotte anchor Sarah French takes us along for the ride. Cameron was a totally healthy kid. Cameron's parents, Robert and Clary Gray, say they received the shock of a lifetime when their son turned seven. He started getting uh, very bad headaches uh, that we couldn't find the cause of. And we eventually found that he had a brain tumor. While Cameron had the tumor removed successfully here in Charlotte, his tumor was the kind that spreads. Uh, luckily, Cameron fit into a trial at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. Cameron had to receive two months of radiation and seven months of chemotherapy before returning home. And that's where Make-A-Wish stepped in, just in time for the one-year anniversary of Cameron returning home. I picked to do what we did in Home Alone 2 because I, it's my favorite movie. And Cameron wanted to do exactly what they did in the movie. So in the movie, Kevin McAllister gets a limo ride with cheese pizza. And so we so we got a limo ride, and we had the cheese pizza in it. And, oh, we went to F.A.O. Schwartz also. All the kids come into the store and play with all his toys. This is a really fun part. We went and got a Sunday bar. We stayed at the Plaza Hotel where they stayed at in the movie. This is a vacation. It was beyond magical. There were some good happy tears, for sure. I'd like to kind of think that all the hardship that we went through made us stronger as a family. And I think it's true. And it's not like it's magically easier once you get back. Cancer's gone and treat, treatment's over and you're back in school, but um, it's a journey and we're all stronger for it, don't you think? Yeah. 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 The family says Cameron is doing well. He's finished with his treatments and there's no evidence of cancer. And they are just so thankful to make a wish for giving their family an unforgettable trip with memories they will cherish forever. For WCNC Charlotte, I'm Sarah French. New at four, a local school that's been around for more than two decades is finally getting its first black leader. WCNC Charlotte's Kia Murray introducing us to the woman who's now leading Trinity Episcopal School in Uptown. You'll find Imana Cheryl in this courtyard every week. She looks over the hundreds of students at Trinity Episcopal School as they sing and dance during morning announcements. It's on these grounds she makes history. I come from a really long history of educators, even when they weren't allowed to learn. Cheryl calls it standing on the shoulders of her ancestors, and she stands tall as the first black woman to earn the title of head of schools at Trinity Episcopal. Throughout her life, Cheryl says being the first and only is nothing new. It's why she hopes in her field of education, more black women will walk through halls just like these to nurture students and lead with love. Because there's so many brilliant, bright, successful, authentic and thoughtful educational leaders that should be in this role right alongside me. So hopefully that opens the doors to thinking about having women of color in these types of roles. And as far as holding the door open for other diverse leaders to follow, Cheryl's goals put equity, inclusion, and belonging at the center. I think you have to be very intentional. Um, I always try to make sure that 
every decision that I make is mission and core values focused because it's not about me, it's about these 440 kids in that building and trying to make sure that we're developing them completely. I asked Cheryl how she wants to lead differently. She said she wants to take the lead on more community partnerships between the school and businesses in Uptown Charlotte. Now this is just one of many examples of WCNC's partnership with Pride Magazine to share stories like this one. If you'd like to see how Imana Cheryl got her start, you can read more at pridemagazineonline.com. I'm Kia Murray, WCNC Charlotte. An update tonight as we follow a shooting in Cornelius. Police are looking for a 66-year-old woman in connection to the incident. This happened earlier this evening at the entrance of Ramsey Creek Park. We know that someone was shot but aren't yet aware of their condition. Cornelius police say this was an isolated incident, and they say the suspect is still on the run. Police are looking for this woman who is approximately 66 years old. She was seen walking in the area of Nance Road and West Catawba Avenue around 5 this evening. They say she's armed and dangerous. If you see her, police say you should call 911 immediately. 514 right now. Time to connect the dots when we make the news make sense. Many are saying the Trump indictment is unprecedented and it is but there are similarities to a case we all watched unfold right here in north carolina is it a crime to pay hush money to cover up an alleged affair in a presidential campaign let's connect the dots more than 10 years ago former north carolina senator and presidential candidate john edwards was on trial in greensboro accused of paying off a mistress riel hunter who lived here in Charlotte at the time. The trial lasted weeks and received worldwide attention. Although we don't know the specifics of the Trump indictments, many legal experts are drawing comparisons. Prosecutors argue using hush money to hide an affair is a violation of campaign finance law. The defense, then and now, argue the money was used to protect family members, not sway voters. In the end, Edwards was acquitted on one charge and the jury was deadlocked on all others. He's returned to private life in Chapel Hill continuing to practice law. Mr. Trump's future remains uncertain. And that is Connecting the Dots. What is near me? If you see breaking news, just open the WCNC News app and go to near me on the bottom right. Tap share with us, upload a photo or video and tell us about what you saw. Hit submit and once you see success, your news has reached WCNC Charlotte. Local gun shops say that they've been busy ever since last week's override of North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper's veto of Senate Bill 41. This is the bill repealing the requirement to get a permit from a local sheriff before buying a handgun. You remember Governor Cooper vetoed that bill once it reached his desk. The Republican majority, along with a handful of Democrats in the General Assembly, made it law anyway, voting to override that veto. WCNC Charlotte's Julia Kaufman shows us how that's impacted the process for buying a pistol. Hyatt Gun Shop packed on a Monday night. Workers say it was so crowded over the weekend, customers had to be one in, one out. We're going to have a couple of weeks where it's really busy, but South Carolina, Virginia, Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, they all have this same law that we have here. They don't have lines out the door. It just takes a little while for it to calm down and business will get back to more normal. Shop owner Larry Hyatt says most customers they're seeing were waiting weeks for their pistol purchase permit from the Mecklenburg County Sheriff. Now with the new law, they just have to clear the FBI background check at the store, which Hyatt says can take one to five days. Well, it's a little harder for us because we're doing more background checks here than what the Sheriff's Department used to do them. So we did them for rifles and shotguns, but now we do them for handguns too. While the law change is making things busier in here, one senator tells me he's worried about its effect outside of the store. It opens up a giant loophole when it comes to private sale of guns. So if you are an individual and you want to sell your gun to your neighbor or someone down the street or a coworker, well, now you're no longer obligated to perform a background check before you make that transfer of that firearm. That's because the old law required someone being privately sold or gifted a pistol to first get a permit from their sheriff. Now, the pistol purchase permit doesn't exist. Senate Bill 41 does nothing to strengthen 
the public safety of North Carolina, it actually takes us a giant step backwards. Mecklenburg County Senator Mujtaba Mohammed also argues federal background checks aren't as thorough as the sheriff's. Hyatt disagrees because they now must be run for every handgun purchase, whereas sheriff permits lasted for five years. We really needed this change. The law calls for state agencies to launch a campaign to promote safe storage of guns and give out gun locks. And it allows concealed carry permit holders to carry on private school campuses during church service. Julia Kaufman, WCNC Charlotte. In the meantime, we are seeing some state senators pushing for more gun control following last week's veto override. Democrats filed a new bill today to reintroduce a state level pistol permit requirement rather than the recently repealed county level requirement. The bill proposes the new process go through the State Bureau of Investigations instead of the local sheriff's offices. This Democrat backed bill does face an uphill battle, though, with a Republican controlled Republican controlled House and Senate. Well, a local teen who has always had an interest in cooking and dreamed of owning her own business, now making those dreams a reality. She is also hitting the road to share her passion with others. On a nice day in the Carolinas, food trucks aren't hard to find. I'm going to try and do my best sauce I can. Maybe a mixture of something would be nice. But this isn't your average food truck. How old are you? 13. That's right. Vivian Detali is just 13 years old. She's had a passion for cooking for a long time, so to her, a food truck seemed like the obvious way to put her skills to practice. That's when Vivian's Rockin' Concessions was born. When I started to cook, I realized how fun it was and how I'd like to see the smile on other people's faces and how they would love to see a 13-year-old especially making food and how cool, unique that is. On the menu, homemade Rockin' Burger sliders and Italian chopped cheese, her own recipes. I just took the ingredients I used and I was just like, put this and that, put this and that. I use my seasonings and then I use my buns and then I use my meat. And I was like, this is really good. This is gonna be my recipe. All of this she's doing on her own dime with some help yeah. from mom and dad. I mean, they're the reason I have this food truck because obviously I can't buy anything on my own. Um, I actually need them to buy the license plate and all that and drive me places. So it's all thanks to them that I'm really doing this. Vivian says all of this is just a taste of what's to come. I really hope that in the future, I will be remembered as a kid that started her own food truck and that's gonna be like my like cue to where I started and people are gonna remember that and say, wow, she's been working this since she was 13. That's actually pretty awesome. And we're saying wow right now, mm -hmm. not even in the future. All right, well, the truck's grand opening will be at Camping World in Statesville on May 5th and 6th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Okay. When it comes to WCNC's chief meteorologist Brad Panovich, our viewers tell the whole story. Hey, if you're new to the area, this meteorologist is awesome. I always stick with Brad Panovich when it comes to severe weather. He's rarely wrong. You should follow Brad if you don't already. He's usually right on the money with his forecast. I don't look at anything else besides what Brad says. We are fortunate to have him here. Brad Panovich, experience the difference with WCNC Charlotte weather. Well, many of you pay your monthly homeowners association dues, expecting your HOA will live up to its end of the agreement. But a Charlotte woman says her HOA has moved so slowly to fix a hole in her roof. Her townhome has suffered thousands of dollars in what she calls preventable damage. Six months after Hurricane Ian's heavy winds toppled a tree onto her home, rainwater continues to get inside. As she asked, where's the money? The HOA assured WCNC Charlotte's Nate Morbido they'll hire a contractor to make the necessary repairs by the end of the month. What the HOA won't tell us is why this has taken so long. We're talking about six months of exposure to the elements with nothing more than a tarp covering the roof. All while the owner pays her monthly HOA dues for a home she doesn't feel safe living in. Okay, uh, September 29th, a tree fell on the top of the townhouse. The storm itself caused enough problems. It's uninhabitable. The aftermath made matters so much worse. Oh, well, it was devastating. Just when Shanti Horn and her fiance, Mark Bass, started preparing to put their townhome on the market, disaster struck. We had to call the tree remover ourselves. The tree removed, they quickly alerted their homeowners association of the underlying damage to their roof. Repairs legal documents show are the responsibility of the HOA. It shouldn't take this long. Six months later, the damage 
is still here. All the insulation is exposed, all the wood is exposed, the windows busted, the storage room is busted, so water has been pouring all through the townhouse from September to now. But not just outside. Step inside and then walk upstairs. Rain is pouring out of the outlets in the walls. And you'll find water damage in the walls. The ceiling is falling in upstairs and now it's poured down into the laundry room and the ceiling's caving in in the laundry room. Overhead and underfoot. The subflooring in the bathroom has gotten spongy now so when you walk on it, it bounces. This is what she gets in return for the $185 she says she pays every month to the HOA. I'm paying it every month on time and we expect the same courtesy. Horn says her community's property management company changed last summer, with Cedar Management Group taking over responsibility. State records show people from all over have named Cedar Management Group in two dozen complaints filed with the North Carolina Attorney General's Office since 2020, including this one filed in January, a complaint about an 83-year-old's damaged condo roof in Hickory. Her daughter told us it took several months for the company to make repairs. What most people don't realize is what a significant role an association and its board can play in your day-to-day -day life. Attorney James Galvin specializes in this area of the law. He says generally the best way to protect yourself is to do your research before you even move into a community. You can require a seller to hand over information about the financial health of your future HOA, as well as meeting minutes to get a feel for how responsive the association is when concerns arise. What the minutes will also do is give you a sense of the personality of the board. If you already belong to an HOA, he says it's critical to get involved. So if and when a problem surfaces, relationships already exist. Your rights will be more easily ignored um, if the board's not hearing from you, if you're not participating. Back in Kimberly Woods, Cedar Management Group shared limited information with us, insisting the Homeowners Association did in fact respond immediately once the HOA received proper notification suggesting Horn did not follow HOA protocols in this case. The company added the HOA has and will continue to exercise its due diligence in rectifying this issue, which includes securing multiple estimates before authorizing any contractual agreements of this magnitude. An email shows the company received a quote back in November, but needed approval from the board of directors before moving forward. Just weeks prior, Horn emailed the HOA to warn the damage might get worse over time. It's gotten just gradually worse and worse. And it did. For Horn and her fiance. It's ridiculous, yeah. The old saying rings true. Six months after Ian, when it rains, it pours. After all this, the HOA recently accused Horn of violating the neighborhood's rules, warning the board will fine her if she doesn't treat the bare spots in her lawn. Even though the covenant we reviewed shows it's the HOA's responsibility to maintain the lawn on each lot. We're told the HOA has since retracted that violation letter. Nate Morabito, WCNC Charlotte. When did you know what you wanted to be? Hey mom, the weather's on! WCNC Charlotte's chief meteorologist Brad Panovich always knew what he was meant to do. All right, don't forget your umbrella. In fact, he joined the American Meteorological Society when he was 13. Now Brad is all grown up. You can see him right here on WCNC Charlotte, making sure you're informed and safe. Hey, where did all my hair go? Experience the difference. Take a look and show you our, our camera views right here. Every view is looking okay. We have one exception. Uh, we have a great shot there, as you can see, from over in Monroe. The first camera, Kannapolis is all right. Our tower cam, and then the second camera in Monroe indicated a little bit of patchy fog over there in Union County, North Carolina. Visibility at the moment, less than two mile visibility here in the Quinn City. Over in Shelby, Cleveland County, that is half mile. So you may drive through a bit of patchy fog, but no major massive fog issues out there. We'll check and show you exactly what's happening across the area. The future cast indicates a few fair weather clouds during the afternoon. Check out these temperatures. It is a mild morning for the most part. We're looking at temperatures into the 50s out there. Unfortunately, here we go. Pollen count off the charts again today and again tomorrow. Thursday with an opportunity for some showers going to back it off a bit, but uh, unfortunately that is a major issue. The prime culprit, cedar, sycamore and oak, uh, pine pollen, that's the kind you see in your car, the yellow, but it certainly is not going to cause you 
it's sneezing sniffling. It's the sneezing sniffling. The rest of those culprits right here. Rain chance over the next seven days. Here we go. We get into Thursday showers. Friday could be uh, one of those days with periods of rain. I think it's just going to be light rain. Not expecting severe weather threat over the weekend. The day uh, we'll see more opportunities for showers would be on Saturday, maybe even a few showers on Sunday as well. Uh, no severe weather threat here today. Unfortunately, in areas that have been just bombarded with severe weather week after week, it's the upper Midwest, Midwest, all the way down to the mid south, where there's a potential for strong and severe storms and some of those long track tornadoes over parts of Illinois into Iowa and all the way into Arkansas and the parts of Mississippi out there today. Right now, we do have some uh, light rain showers tracking across the Carolina coastline, moving towards the Outer Banks, but that's moving away from us. So there's no rain in the forecast today. Uh, as you can see, uh, along the Great Lakes region, some showers that developing storm system back to the west with the line of showers uh, moving across the Great Lakes, moving west to east. Once again, today, the threat is in the midsection of the country and then tomorrow uh, from Memphis all the way to, to the Ohio Valley. So from the mid-south, the Ohio Valley, then we take you into Thursday. We get to Thursday afternoon, late afternoon. We may see a couple isolated strong storms uh, basically northwest and west of the Charlotte area. Check the guy roofing seven day forecast. We're in the low 80s today, warming up tomorrow, mid 80s. More of the same on Thursday. That rainstorm chance is more likely in the afternoon. Friday, yes, uh, there's going to be some showers. It's going to be the light rain variety, a very, very very chilly Saturday and the for Easter Sunday we're below average as far as temperatures close to average with some sun returning next Monday. That's four. Well, today's another big day for the future of space exploration. NASA unveiling the four astronauts who will take a 10 day trip around the moon. Artemis 2 is the first crewed flight uh, test and it's a critical step towards a long term human presence actually on the moon. The chief himself, Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich, <laughs> in today for the Midday Show. He joins us more with this announcement. And Brad, some notable folks going to be on this mission. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. You know me, I'm a big space geek as well. I had to put my NASA shirt on today. But let me introduce you to the four astronauts that were picked to go back to the moon. From left to right on my screen here, you can see our commander. This is Reed Will uh, Wiseman, excuse me. This is Victor Glover. This is a very important person right here. This is Christina Cook, all right? She is a three-time graduate from NC State. She grew up in Jacksonville, North Carolina. And then our Canadian friends, Jeremy Hansen, he's the Canadian on this uh, crew as well. Now, this first mission is uh, gonna be crewed. It's gonna go around the moon. They're gonna survey it. They're not gonna land on it next year. The goal is sometime late in 2024, maybe around November. They will be the same crew though that will go on Artemis 3, which will actually land on the moon. Now, unlike the Apollo missions, we're actually gonna try to uh, build a base there in the southern part of the moon. Remember, the Apollo missions were more in the equatorial or the middle part of the moon's surface. This is gonna to be towards the southern end. And the reason for that, guys, is there is the possibility of some frozen water in those craters in the southern part of the moon. And the goal is to have the base be nearby where they can actually harvest that water and use it for the mission to eventually go to Mars because this is the first step in getting all the way to Mars. They gotta establish a moon base first because if we do go to Mars, the, the way it's gonna work, we'll go to the moon first. That'll be kind of like the midway point and then they'll go all the way to Mars. So kind of exciting news today. And you know, you think about it, it's been over 50 years since we were last to the moon back in 1972. That was the last Apollo mission. So this is a whole new generation. And as you heard today in the announcement, they're calling it the Artemis generation. So our parents kind of grew up with the Apollo era. This is gonna be the Artemis uh, you know, mission and it's gonna go into the future and eventually to Mars. So pretty exciting day to see the first four that'll be going back to the moon. And good to see North Carolina represented. I know, isn't that yes. amazing? I love it. Yeah, she was my she was my favorite because I was hoping that she got selected and she was the very first one announced. And I kind of thought she'd be there because she is really brilliant and she's been uh, on many missions. Most of these astronauts have gone to the space station several times. They've had a long career already, so they're very well established. And it'll be very interesting to watch that launch next year barring any delays, which we know in space flight. There's yeah, maybe possible. Brad can get an interview with her. I think so. I would love to. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Brad, thanks, sir. Appreciate it. All right, now a local visit from Bill's safety, DeMar Hamlin, three months since he suffered cardiac arrest during that game against the Cincinnati Bengals. As Hamlin continues to recover, he's also focused on using his platform to educate others about life saving CPR. That includes a visit to the White House last week and a stop here in Charlotte today to team up with the Carolina Panthers for a CPR training and education session. Ashley Strohlein has more on how Hamlin is continuing to inspire others. Stroh? 
Yeah, well, we always say it's bigger than sports, and in this case, it most certainly is. When DeMar Hamlin suffered cardiac arrest during Monday Night Football back in January, it impacted millions across our country, whether they were a sports fan or not. Now, the Panthers organization certainly watched with concern while everyone waited to see the outcome of DeMar's incident. And Nicole Tepper told us she wanted to do more than make a donation in DeMar's honor while he recovered. She wanted to find a way to make an impact in the lives of others by CPR certifying everyone at Tepper Sports and Entertainment. And thanks to a chance meeting at the Super Bowl, it all came to fruition. We're in Arizona, I was at a lunch, and I look up from this lunch and I see DeMar standing in the back of the room. I almost teared up, I think I did tear up, and I beeline to the bar like a fangirl. <laughs> and I introduce myself, I tell him who, who I was, and I start talking really fast. Nicole says that chance meeting is a God wink, divine intervention. And I was started telling him the story. We were going to donate to Chasing Amba, and then we decided we were going to do CPR training and all of this stuff, and you know, just in honor of you and Kim, and da, da, da. and he just looked at me with this unbelievable smile, and he said, "I will be there." True to his word, Demar made his way to Charlotte for Monday's CPR training and education session held by the Panthers in partnership with the American Heart Association. You know, I always grew up wanting to be a football player, wanting to make it to the NFL. Um, and, you know, uh, this situation has just brought a whole bigger life purpose for me. And while DeMar's life purpose is an unexpected one, he's all in on using his platform any way he can. I just want to keep raising awareness and trying to get as many people uh, that we can CPR certified because you never know when you could be that hero. Uh, my trainers, like Nancy said, uh, everything went how it was supposed to go um, because they're well trained, they're well prepared, uh, they take the proper time out and, and making sure if moments like that happen that they know what they're doing and that's exactly what we're going to do here today. Now Tepper's vision for the hearts in our community to keep pounding has that many more CPR trained and educated people in it thanks to an unexpected friendship or perhaps a God wink at its finest. The real story is, is that I met a forever friend who I'm extremely proud of. Um, I will always have his back. I will always support him. Um, I'm his biggest fan, and I just can't be more excited that he took the time out of his schedule, because you know you're all watching him, right? He's making a difference in this world. Yeah, so just amazing to be there today to hear Damar speak and share his story. I mean, we were all, we're all so concerned when that incident first happened, but now yeah. to see what he's doing with his platform. And I love the story that Nicole Tepper shared. I said, hey, how did you guys meet? She's like, oh, you're gonna hear all about that. But a chance meeting at the Super Bowl and now yeah. a partnership where he came here to the Panthers and, and shared his time. And now that many more people in our community are CPR certified. Yeah. Talk about taking a moment and then, you know, building on it to impact people. It almost seems like Absolutely. it was meant to be. Yeah. How many people went out and learned CPR after that? Right, we even, in our newsroom. I was about to say, we even had our own trainings here. Yeah. So. so, yeah, keep yeah. doing what you're doing. All right, yeah. thank you, Strong. The new and improved WCNC Plus, now on Roku and Fire TV. Watch local live newscast, get extended breaking news coverage, and see local programs and specials. The new and improved WCNC Plus, now on Roku and Fire TV. New at four, two Don are now back with their owners after getting caught by officers this weekend. Huntersville police posting this photo saying the donkeys were just grazing on some grass in the Stevens Grove neighborhood. Police say they corralled the animals into a fenced backyard where they waited for their owners. And that's when they say, look how cute they are. Their owners led them on a quarter mile walk of shame <laughs> back home. <laughs> Sweet little guys. A new push tonight to get more psychologists in schools. There is a bipartisan bill in the North Carolina Senate seeking to add more of these specialists in districts across the state. The National Association of School Psychologists say that North Carolina is actually one of the worst student to psychologist ratios in the nation and one of the lowest average salaries. WCNC Charlotte's Shamaria Morrison looks at the latest efforts to change this. The bill comes as experts are warning about a mental health crisis in K through 12 students and as there are calls for more mental health resources inside schools to curb violence. 
If passed, the bill would cost taxpayers about $22 million. The money would go towards pay increases, recruitment, and retention of school psychologists. CMS school board member Jennifer Delahara has been calling for more state funding for school psychologists for years now. We have a lot of students uh, where um, suicide ideation is up, students who are battling um, you know, drug abuse and addiction. Um, obviously, there are concerns around firearms and weapons. The recommendation from the National Association of School Psychologists is 500 students per 100 psychologists. CMS is at one per 1,500 students. We know that the social and emotional well-being of our children is just as important and actually impacts their academic success as well. And what's really uh, poignant to point out is that our students are also asking for that. The bill would give school psychologists a $650 supplement and a 12 percent monthly bonus of their salary for being nationally certified. One benefit that we've been able um, to see in the bill is there is an increase in pay, which of course is really needed to be able to attract and then retain our school psychologists. The bill would also create a new grant program for schools to get money to recruit psychologists. CMS wouldn't likely benefit from this portion of the bill since it prioritizes school districts with little to no psychologists, which are normally small and rural districts. Very happy that other districts are going to potentially benefit, but this is another one of those areas where the larger districts sometimes get left out of what's otherwise really great, meaningful legislation. Money would also go to five North Carolina colleges, including Appalachian State, with the goal of doubling the number of school psychologists graduating from the schools. Shamaria Morrison, WCNC Charlotte. When I think about the community, I think about the time that I've been here. I've been in this community almost my entire adult life. So I, I, you, know, you get to know the people. When you know what they care about, then that's what you care about. This community looks at all of us who do weather here at WCNC Charlotte as part of their family. And uh, when you're part of their family, you want to make sure you do it just for them. Right after practice and on a day between games, the Hornets still brought the energy to give back this afternoon at Spectrum Center. LaMelo Ball, Coach Steve Clifford, and basically the whole roster helping to pack 3,000 care kits for military service members preparing to deploy or returning from deployment at a number of local installations. This was done in conjunction with USO, USO North Carolina. The military and basketball are kind of similar, you know, it's competitive. So we we're, were comp competing even in the, in the boxes. So, you know, it's all the same thing, so it's fun. They're risking their lives in the front line, so. So that's crazy in itself to risk their whole lives for the sake of us, the children and the, and the youth in the community. Snacks and thank you notes included in those packs. Hornets hosts the Toronto Raptors tomorrow night. If you're looking to buy a used car in Charlotte, you might be in luck. And really it's because on average we're seeing it's actually cheaper to buy now than it was just one year ago. But there are going to be some exceptions to that. Yeah, WCNC Charlotte's Carolyn Bruck here with the used cars that'll cost you more. So you're not left asking where's the money. So if you are in the market for a used car, I've got some good news. Used car prices nationwide have gone down 8.7%, which is around $3,000 less than it was just a year ago. Now in Charlotte, we're not as great, but still 8.1%, which is $2,700 basically. And this is just from a year ago. But as Vanessa said, there are some exceptions. So these certain vehicles will be um, more expensive, unfortunately. So Ford Expedition Hybrid, it's actually more expensive by 8.3% than it was just last year. So you're paying an extra $4,100 if you want this used car. The GMC Yukon XL, that's also up 8.1%, which is a $4,500 price jump from just last year. Mercedes-Benz GLS, 7%, but when it's a car that, that costs a lot more, that 7% equals $4,800 more than it was just a year ago. The Toyota RAV4 Hybrid, now you notice there's some hybrids on this mm -hmm. because of course those are the popular cars people want. This is up 6.8% from just last year, which is $2,400 increase. And then the, the Porsche Cayenne is 5.9% higher than it was just last year. And that's uh, $4,300 that you're gonna have to tack on to that. So if you are looking for a used car and you don't have deep pockets, steer clear of those ones.
By the way, tomorrow I'm going to bring you the five cars that are um, costing much less this year than I last year. Know. Yeah, we'll wait for that I'll one. Yes. Because right now I got empty pockets. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Same, Fred. I'm looking forward to that cheap list you got tomorrow. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. Where's the money? WCNC Charlotte. Where's the money really is about leveling the playing field. It's about helping others and breaking down barriers. We don't want our viewers to be taken advantage of, so we're here to help. See the difference. We see ourselves as a resource for the community. A lot of times when people get to us, they've tried all kinds of other alternatives. They've knocked on doors that haven't been answered, or they go to places where there aren't doors. We create openings for them, and that's what we do with Where's the Money. Take a look and show you our, our camera views right here. Every view is looking okay. We have one exception. Uh, we have a great shot there, as you can see, from over in Monroe. The first camera, Kannapolis is all right. Our tower camera, then the second camera in Monroe indicated a little bit of patchy fog over there in Union County, North Carolina. Visibility at the moment, less than two mile visibility here in the Quinn City. Over in Shelby, in Cleveland County, that is half mile. So you may drive through a little bit of patchy fog, but no major massive fog issues out there. We'll check and show you exactly what's happening across the area. The future cast indicates a few fair weather clouds during the afternoon. Check out these temperatures. It is a mild morning for the most part. We're looking at temperatures into the 50s out there. Unfortunately, here we go. Pollen count off the charts again today and again tomorrow. Thursday with an opportunity for some showers going to back it off a bit, but uh, unfortunately that is a major issue. The prime culprit, cedar, sycamore, and oak, uh, pine pollen. That's the kind you see in your car, the yellow, but it certainly is not going to cause you s sneezing, sniffling. It's the sneezing, sniffling. The rest of those culprits right there. Rain chances over the next seven days. Here we go. We get into Thursday showers. Friday could be uh, one of those days with periods of rain. I think it's just going to be light rain. Not expecting any severe weather threat over the weekend. The day uh, we'll see more opportunities for showers would be on Saturday, maybe even a few showers on Sunday as well. Uh, no severe weather threat here today. Unfortunately, in areas that have been just bombarded with severe weather week after week, it's the upper Midwest, Midwest, all the way down to the Mid-South, where there's a potential for strong and severe storms and some of those long track tornadoes over parts of Illinois into Iowa and all the way into Arkansas and the parts of Mississippi out there today. Right now, we do have some uh, light rain showers tracking across the Carolina coastline, moving towards the Outer Banks, but that's moving away from us. So there's no rain in the forecast today. Uh, as you can see, uh, along the Great Lakes region, some showers that developing storm system back to the west with the line of showers uh, moving across the Great Lakes, moving west to east. Once again, today the threat is in the midsection of the country, and then tomorrow uh, from Memphis all the way to, to the Ohio Valley. So from the mid-south, the Ohio Valley, then we take you into Thursday. We get to Thursday afternoon, late afternoon. We may see a couple isolated strong storms, uh, basically northwest and west of the Charlotte area. Check the guy roofing seven day forecast. We're in the low 80s today, warming up tomorrow, mid 80s, more of the same on Thursday. That rainstorm chance is more likely in the afternoon. Friday, yes, uh, there's going to be some showers. It's going to be the light rain variety, a very, very very chilly Saturday and the for Easter Sunday we're below average as far as temperatures close to average with some sun returning next Monday. That's for First, it's hard to believe we are more than just more than uh, three years into the COVID pandemic and doctors. They're still learning so much about the virus. Many who battled COVID lost their sense of taste and smell and continued dealing with those symptoms for months or even years in my case. NBC's Kristen Dahlgren has more on the new hope for those patients. Jennifer Henderson wouldn't normally cry over a cup of coffee. Is it strong? Yeah. But she hadn't smelled one in nearly two years. It smells like coffee. After a COVID infection in January 2021, Jennifer Henderson never got her smell or taste back. You couldn't smell or taste nothing, anything. Nothing. And then after about a year, it wasn't that I couldn't smell or taste anything. Now the taste was off. It was terrible. Food she once loved tasted disgusting. Chicken. I couldn't eat chicken. What did it taste like? It tasted like rotten flesh. Jennifer grew depressed. Meals were unbearable. It's hard to get through each day. And then a Facebook group with nearly 50,000 people with similar complaints led her to Dr. Christine Shin at the Cleveland Clinic. It was incredible that something simple as the stellate ganglion block could produce this type of result. The stellate ganglion is a nerve bundle in the neck. 
Numbing it has been used for a century to help regulate some pain and circulation. So doctors tried the procedure on long COVID patients. We have seen quite a good um, response, but there are also patients who don't respond. And we're still in that phase where we're trying to figure out who it's going to help. Doctors still don't know exactly why it works to restore taste and smell. But Shin estimates it helps about 50% of patients. Shin plans to start the first clinical trials for its use in treating long COVID soon. But in the meantime, is offering the procedure to patients like Jennifer. Now getting her third round, a quick injection into her neck. Within minutes, Jennifer tries something she hasn't tasted in years, watermelon. You can taste it. Oh, yeah, Oh, wow. Dr. Shin says some patients see instant relief, others get senses back over time, and some nothing at all. It's unclear if improvements are permanent, and insurance coverage also varies by plan. Oh, God. But for Jennifer, you're my hero. <laughs> my the results it's couldn't no, be sweeter. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, Cleveland. And there was a shooting this evening, too, in East Charlotte. It put one person in the hospital. That happened at the Avalon Apartments just off Albemarle Road. Medic says that person has life-threatening injuries. No word from CMPD yet on a suspect. We are lurking, working to learn more, though, about what happened. talked about local police department efforts to recruit more officers and specifically more women to bear the responsibilities of the badge. If you're looking for a shining example of a female on the force, we've got one for you tonight. Yeah, we want to take you to the campus of Kannapolis Middle School, where you will meet our latest Hyundai hometown hero, an officer making such a difference in the community. Many students call her mom. And today we can call her a worthy recipient of the Charlotte area Hyundai dealers brand new Santa Fe. It's early morning and Kannapolis Middle School is enjoying a special rally before class. Little do students know this rally is about to become recognition for someone making a major impact on the community. She goes above and beyond for the students and for the staff. You'll often find her after hours in the community attending things for students that aren't required of her. That's really our mom, like our school mom. Like we go to her and talk about stuff. Like if we need to get something off our chest, that's more of like our counsel. Is there an officer Armstrong? And when we call school resource officer Nija Armstrong to the auditorium stage, you can see the effect she has had on these kids. Miss Armstrong has dedicated herself as a police officer, a school teacher. She's really just become a, a shining star of the community. You know, today, on behalf of the Hyundai dealers of Charlotte area, I'd like to congratulate you and offer you a new car. My heart is still pounding. It's always important to give back to the community, you know, and, and the community or, or the people that enable us to do what we do. So whenever we can return that favor to somebody deserving of it, it it's really worth it. She is a hometown hero. She's a hero to us, but she gives us an opportunity to say, hey, we're human, understand, we're here to help. A member of the force and a force for good, driving our kids to be the best they can be. I'm very grateful, appreciative. Like, they know I love this shop. I give the kids my all here. Like, whatever they want, whatever they need, whether I'm getting paid for it or not, I'm there for them. And driving off with a well deserved Hyundai Santa Fe. I love the kids here. I love working here. It's. Whew. Mm. It's definitely a lot. That's all I got. <laughs> so, um, you know how we talk about when things happen for a reason. There are other layers to the story. We didn't realize until after we had given her the surprise. She was actually supposed to go that day and buy a new car. How about that? <laughs> 
she actually planned to go with a friend. It's because her prior car broke down. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a red charger. She said she loved it. She loves red cars. She and got that's, a red car. That's the other layer. Oh, wow. But we didn't know that at the that's time, awesome. but it just all works out. I believe she'd been praying for that. That's she, probably an an, that's probably an answered prayer. I think so. Good for her. Yeah. And they always respond the same, always humble, always love what they do, would do it for free. Yeah, yeah. she's amazing. Yeah. Looking ahead to Friday, that's when the health insurance coverage of millions is at risk. A pandemic era rule that protected people from losing Medicaid coverage is set to expire. Usually a Medicaid recipients need to renew their coverage every year. But in 2020, lawmakers passed a rule that kept people automatically enrolled even if they no longer meet the requirements for coverage. 15 million people are at risk of losing coverage. Friday will mark the start of an unwinding period where states will check everyone's eligibility and send renewal and termination notices. This is expected to last 12 months. Experts predict unenrollments to start trickling this month. WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. Anticipation along with a show of force is growing in lower Manhattan right now. Former President Donald Trump is expected to be formally charged tomorrow. The case involving a payoff to former adult star Stormy Daniels to keep quiet about an alleged affair ahead of the 2016 election. It will be the first time ever a former president will face criminal charges. Jay Gray is in Manhattan with more on what comes next. Former President Donald Trump making the trip from Mar-a-Lago to Manhattan a day ahead of history. Tomorrow afternoon, the 45th President of the United States expected to become the first to sit in the Oval Office, then stand before a judge facing criminal charges. We don't know what's in the indictment yet, but um, yeah, it's, it's pretty surreal to be honest. The indictment will remain sealed until after his arraignment, but sources tell NBC News the former president will face more than 30 charges in the case involving hush money paid to former adult star Stormy Daniels just ahead of the 2016 election to cover up an alleged affair. The Trump legal team says he will plead not guilty. Um, the team will look at every every um, potential issue that we, we will be able to challenge and we will challenge it. Security will certainly be a challenge. There are no credible threats, according to police. Still, New York's mayor has this warning for potential protesters. Uh, while there may be some rabble rousers thinking about coming to our city tomorrow, a message is clear and simple. Control yourselves. New York City is our home, not a playground for your misplaced anger. The entire NYPD force, 35,000 officers, is on alert. The FBI also on the ground, and the Secret Service will be with the former president at all times. Jay Gray, NBC News, New York. Welcome back. Spring break is almost here for most of the Charlotte area schools. And if you're planning a getaway, you have to be prepared to pay more for just about everything. Yeah, almost absolutely everything. As you said, Charlotte's Carolyn, Char uh, WC's Charlotte's Carolyn Brooke is here with the uh, prices you can expect to pay. So you're not left asking, where's the money, Carolyn? Well, you might be left asking where's the money. I gotta be honest, <laughs> but, right. but but I, we'll be can, prepared. I can prepare you at there least for having to pay so much more. So let's talk about it. I mean, that if that gives you any indication, Mm -hmm. Because the spring break yeah. is up and it's up in all cases but one. So let's talk about airline tickets. <laughs> I mean, this number 26.5% higher than it was just one year ago is I think we can all agree is ridiculous. Yes, it's, it's absurd. It's a lot. Hotels and motels. So once you get to your destination, you've got to find somewhere to stay, right? Hotels and motels up 7.4%. And I guess you look at this and you say, okay, so last year this was around, I think, 15%. So I guess <laughs> it's a little less, but it's still almost 8% more. Restaurants, because you have to go out to eat, right? If you're going to a place where you don't have a kitchen, 
you got to go somewhere to have food, and that's up 8%. Uh, and I was actually surprised by that number not being higher. Admissions, and this is, this is an average for admissions to things like amusement parks, water parks, um, any, any sort of place where you want to go to spend your spring break, you're going to expect to pay 6% more. Now, this is the one area that is uh, less expensive this year, but not by much. So car rentals, a 1% decline from last year. So if you are headed out, make sure you bring your piggy bank because the cost of spring break, cha-ching. It's breaking the piggy bank, really. Yeah, it really is. You have to take all your pennies with you. It's unfortunate. Rent a car true. and just drive around the area here. I mean, hey. I mean we're lucky that we live in such a nice place, right? <laughs> right. We don't have to go anywhere. Just go to North the park. Carolina, right? Just rejuvenate tourism right here. Go to home. the mountains, exactly. go for Carolyn. a hike. That's Hopefully free. you're giving some ideas to people at home. We yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-huh. Connect the dots and let us clear up the confusion. We're here to make sure the news makes sense. And with Connect the Dots, you'll understand how the headlines impact your family. See the difference on WCNC Charlotte. Some galactic news this afternoon. Another big day for the future of space exploration. NASA revealing the four astronauts who will take a 10 day trip around the moon. One of them has ties to the Tar Heel State. Christina Koch is an NC State grad. She's going to make history as the first woman to fly to the moon. Artemis II is the first crewed flight test and a critical step towards a long term mission. This morning, Brad Panovich actually talked about the major announcement and the mission goals. You can see that full report right now on our app. Hundreds of new homes are coming to Rowan County. It is just part of the growth that's happening in the city of Salisbury and nearby town of East Spencer. WCNC Charlotte's Kaylin Hagwood is in East Spencer with more on the developments and how people who live in the area are responding. Well, here on Bringle Ferry Road, you see mostly trees in this area for right now, but town leaders tell me more than 120 homes have been approved for that side of the street with more developments on the way. A town on the move. It's an older community, but we're on the verge of um, a huge explosion. Town manager Michael Douglas says the population of East Spencer is about 1,500, but could soon see some new faces. East Spencer is right in between Greensboro and Charlotte, and that's why there's a lot of growth. Already, he says, two major subdivisions have been approved and are expected to bring more than 120 homes to Bringle Ferry Road and more than 50 to McCandless Road, with new businesses possible as well. East Spencer has been a neglected community for years. This growth is beyond imagination for us. A similar story in the city of Salisbury, just minutes away, where new homes are coming, including on Earnhardt Road and right downtown. The city says apartments are even being built above businesses like Threadshed, where Dave Laughlin works. I've been downtown for 47 years, and there's always something going on that's good. And again, I think it's because we care about our town, we care about the old structures. Across the street, the city says the Empire Hotel, which has been vacant for decades, could also see new life with a boutique hotel, row homes, a restaurant, and more proposed. Amtrak is expanding service here in Salisbury. We're looking to improve our main street. Good growth for everybody, smart growth. Back in East Spencer, Douglas says this side of Bringle Ferry Road could see some development too. They're considering homes or businesses, but that all depends on if they get approval to make some road changes that would more closely link the town to I-85. Kaylin Hagwood, WCNC Charlotte. Take a look and show you our, our camera views right here. Your review is looking okay. We have one exception. Uh, we have a great shot there, as you can see, from over in Monroe. The first camera, Kannapolis is all right. Our tower camera, then the second camera in Monroe indicated a little bit of patchy fog over there in Union County, North Carolina. Visibility at the moment, less than two mile visibility here in the Quinn City. Over in Shelby in Cleveland County, that is half a mile. So you may drive through a little bit of patchy fog, but no major massive fog issues out there. We'll check and show you exactly what's happening across the area. The future cast indicates a few fair weather clouds during the afternoon. Check out these temperatures. It is a mild morning for the most part. We're looking at temperatures into the 50s out there. Unfortunately, here we go. Pollen count off the charts again today and again tomorrow. Thursday with an opportunity for some showers going to back it off a bit, but uh, unfortunately that is a major issue. The prime culprit, cedar, sycamore and oak, uh, pine pollen, that's the kind you see in your car, the yellow, but it certainly is not going to cause you 
sneezing, sniffling. It's the sneezing, sniffling. The rest of those culprits right there. Rain chances over the next seven days. Here we go. We get into Thursday showers. Friday could be uh, one of those days with periods of rain. I think it's just going to be light rain. Not expecting any severe weather threat over the weekend. The day uh, we'll see more opportunities for showers would be on Saturday, maybe even a few showers on Sunday as well. Uh, no severe weather threat here today. Unfortunately, in areas that have been just bombarded with severe weather week after week, it's the upper Midwest, Midwest, all the way down to the Mid-South with the potential for strong and severe storms and some of those long track tornadoes over parts of Illinois into Iowa and all the way into Arkansas and the parts of Mississippi out there today. Right now we do have some uh, light rain showers tracking across the Carolina coastline moving towards the Outer Banks, but that's moving away from us. So there's no rain in the forecast today. Uh, as you can see, uh, along the Great Lakes region, some showers that developing storm system back to the west with the line of showers uh, moving across the Great Lakes, moving west to east. Once again today, the threat is in the midsection of the country and then tomorrow uh, from Memphis all the way to, to the Ohio Valley. So from the mid south, the Ohio Valley, then we take you into Thursday. We get to Thursday afternoon, late afternoon. We may see a couple isolated strong storms uh, basically northwest and west of the Charlotte area. Check the guy roofing seven day forecast. We're in the low 80s today, warming up tomorrow, mid 80s. More of the same on Thursday. That rainstorm chance is more likely in the afternoon. Friday, yes, uh, there's going to be some showers. It's going to be the light rain variety, a very, very very chilly Saturday and the for Easter Sunday we're below average as far as temperatures close to average with some sun returning next Monday. That's for All right, well, a new age of gaming to talk about. Local developers getting a head start in the video game industry and introducing a new generation of people to coding and programming and this weekend you can actually get the chance to play their games. Brittany Van Voorhees tells us how. Here's a story to put all four letters in the science, technology, engineering, and math STEM acronym. Super Abari is a community-driven arcade and game bar with a goal of highlighting independent games. Amar Ahmed is the game designer for Crab Volleyball. Although he has a background in software development, there was a significant learning curve. While I knew the software and I was able to make that, um, it got really hard for me to kind of get the full experience from the hardware side. So I had to learn a lot about soldering. I had to learn a lot about um, just wiring things, how power works, you know, grounding of wires. Wilder Ham developed the Legend of Zelda Pinball. He says one of the best parts of the journey is watching people enjoy your game. It's great. People, people see this as a really challenging project and they appreciate it. And when I look at it, all I see are the flaws, but you know, it's, it's a passion project. Owner Zachary Pulliam says it's important to give these artists a chance to show off and create a relaxed environment for all to enjoy. I think it's a really nice place for you to come, feel comfortable, meet like-minded people, and you know, also try out some games that you won't get to play anywhere else. The gaming community hopes this event will spark creative interest for gaming and others. Plus, supporting local is always great for business, especially based on how much effort the creators put into these games. For WCNC Charlotte, I'm meteorologist Brittany Van Voorhees. <laughs> WCNC Charlotte. This is Flashpoint. Thanks for joining us here on Flashpoint. I'm Ben Thompson. Healthcare for thousands of people here in North Carolina could soon be on the way. This week, Governor Cooper signing the Medicaid expansion bill into law. It's something that's been years in the making. Republicans eventually swayed by nearly $2 billion in federal incentives. And now some 600,000 folks could get the care they need. Joining us now is the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. Secretary, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Absolutely, Ben. Thanks for having me. So this week, a big deal here in North Carolina this week, becoming one of the last states to finally expand Medicaid. We've talked about it for about 10 years now. Given that most states have already done this, given the fact that you sort of are aware of how these things go in all 50 states, what is this going to mean for those 600,000 people here in North Carolina who finally have access to affordable health care? Ben, perhaps there's no better way of saying it than to say to those 600,000 uh, Americans in North Carolina, to the governor, to all the legislative leaders, you've just given people peace of mind. Uh, to all those people who today know that if their child all of a sudden becomes uh, deadly, deadly ill and needs to go to a hospital, you don't have to worry anymore. If I take my child to the to the hospital, will I not have the money to pay the mortgage or or my rent? Will I go bankrupt? 
That used to be the case. And a lot of folks would have to weigh those decisions and sometimes not go to the hospital or not buy the medication. Today, 600,000 people have the peace of mind to know that they can take their child to the hospital. Um, for our friends down in South Carolina, which by the way, only about 10 miles from where I'm sitting here in Charlotte, um, they have not expanded Medicaid. What else do you think needs to happen to get those last few states on board? You know, 40 states have given millions of their residents the peace of mind. Uh, but you're right, there's still 10 states in America who have not. And it's, a, it's crazy to believe, but there are still millions of Americans who don't have the opportunity that their fellow Americans just across the state border have to have that peace of mind. We, it's not something we can afford to do, and it's not something a country as great as America should do. Switching gears now, this week the FDA approving the over-the-counter uh, Narcan. It's a drug that can reverse overdoses. It's been talked about for quite some time. How do you see this changing the game when it comes to overdoses here in America? Oh, it's it's like uh, getting three new strikes when you're at the plate. Uh, we know that a lot of people are dying today because they don't realize that the drug they're about to ingest or inject is laced with uh, deadly fentanyl or other drugs. And what happens is you have younger and younger populations that are dying from overdose. Narcan is one of those drugs that helps offset. It, it, it reverses what some of these deadly drugs like fentanyl can do, uh, what opioids, excuse me, can do, and it could save a life. Now the fact that you can get it over the counter will make it far easier for some of these folks who are still using drugs to save a life or for a family member or a friend to be able to save a life. It will change, it is a true game changer, but we have to make sure that it's done right. And so for that reason, we wanna make sure when it gets on the market, it's affordable. When it gets on the market, it's uh, easier to understand where to get it. And when it gets on the market, finally, we make sure there's accountability to make sure it's being used the ways we want it to be used. Let's talk about insulin prices. Three of the major producers uh, of insulin announcing caps at 35 bucks a month. Uh, it's something that the administration I know has been working hard on, but it's just one of, as you know, ex many extremely expensive drugs. Help us w work this out. I, I realize this is different, but at the same time, I know folks at home want to understand, why can we not apply this same sort of thing and scale it to say other prescription drug costs? Well, Ben, they're right. There's no reason why we shouldn't. And so that's absolutely the correct question. Why are, why are we doing it for insulin, but not for so many other drugs that we need that are so, so expensive? And that's the, the answer. Uh, that's the question that the president answered by making sure we passed his new prescription drug law that will lower the cost of uh, prescription medication. Let's talk about COVID. Um, here in a little more than a month, uh, the public health emergency is set to uh, end. I know while vaccines will remain free, I think coverage of some of the over-counter tests will, will, will end. Are you worried that this would lead to less testing and potentially more people going to, to work, school with the virus? Or are we now saying as a country, okay, that's a level of micromanaging this virus that we're not going to do anymore? Well, I, I'm hoping that what happens is because we are at a different place than we were three years ago with COVID, uh, that we can <clears throat> say that we're no longer in a state of emergency that we can't control, but that we know how to control. We know how to manage COVID. And ha ha having learned how to manage COVID, vaccination, distancing, masking where necessary, that what we'll do is we will put it as into part of our routine. Just the way we will get the flu vaccination, just the way we ask our kids to get vaccinated for measles and for uh, smallpox and the rest, we're gonna try to move America towards putting this part of their routine to protect against COVID. And the best way, of course, is to get the vaccination, uh, stay updated. So it's gonna get to the point where we hope it will be once a year for most Americans, get that vaccination, and you're in pretty good shape when it comes to COVID. Obviously, continue to be smart, don't do crazy things, but that's where we hope we'll go, Ben. But the bringing down the public health emergency means that we're in a better place, but that still means we have to work hard to protect ourselves. Does this mean, mean the end of folks needing to necessarily quarantine anymore? For the most part, remember, we still have Americans who have low uh, immunity because of uh, they may have cancer. They're taking drugs that lower their immunity, make it tough for them to fight off uh, 
those types of viruses and diseases. And so we always have to protect our, our elderly uh, loved ones who are not as strong anymore. Our children sometimes can have certain diseases. So there's always gonna be a case where we have to be careful. Quarantining would be one of those examples where it's a severe example of how we try to protect ourselves from those who might spread uh, a disease. But for the most part, as I said, we've learned to manage COVID so we can move away from some of the more dramatic measures that we had to take before. Finally, let me ask you, it's not exactly your wheelhouse, but you are Health and Human Services. And, and we have saw once again this week that there's um, gun violence, the number one killer of, of children in America. Your thoughts on our inability as a country to tackle this problem? Well, we have the ability. We just have to be willing to use the wherewithal we have. And unfortunately, from my personal perspective, we have it. Uh, I consider that we at the Department of Health and Human Services consider gun violence a health care crisis because it impacts not just those who are the victims of gun violence, including up to death, but it, it, it hits every family member. And I, I must tell you that uh, today Americans are suffering, suffering by the death of children uh, at the hands of someone wielding weapons of mass destruction. And I, I would say that it's time for us to realize that we have it in our power to reduce gun deaths. We just have to be willing to take so, some of those actions and keep those weapons that are not meant to be principally defensive or for hunting out of the hands of people who are using them in a way that kills our loved ones. Are you optimistic that anything will change anytime soon? Look, I'm always optimistic. I'm the son of immigrants. And so uh, I, I do believe that this country will learn. Uh, and sometimes we, we take a little while to learn, but that's the beauty of America. We move forward, we learn, we don't wanna go backwards. And I think we see that we should not be the king and queen of gun violence in the world. And we will learn because it's our children who are suffering because of our inaction. U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. Secretary, thanks for coming on, we appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. All right, take care. Well, the primary for North Carolina governor now less than a year away. Coming up next on Flashpoint, the first Republican candidate to announce his bid for the governor's mansion. Tonight, we are learning a man has died from his injuries following a shooting in Gastonia last week. Police say 61 year old Clifford Scoggin died at the hospital. Officers say 58 year old Calvin Black shot Scoggin and assaulted a woman inside a home on Osceola Street last Sunday. When police arrived, they say they ended up shooting and killing Black. The woman was treated and is expected to be OK. The Carolinas rank in the top 25 nationwide for the most lightning strikes in this week's weather IQ. Meteorologist KJ Jacobs explains what you can expect when lightning strikes. I'm in Kannapolis, the lightning capital of North Carolina, just north of Charlotte. In 2022, Kannapolis had more lightning events than any other city in the Tar Heel State. Lightning is a spectacular weather phenomenon. It goes viral when captured on camera. June, July, and August account for more than 75% of the yearly lightning strikes in North Carolina. A positive lightning strike is typically 10 times brighter, 10 times stronger, 10 times louder. Positive lightning bolts originate from the top of the thunderstorm, which allows them to be powerful and deadly. 90% of lightning strikes are negatively charged and tend to branch out. On radar, the frequency of lightning strikes can signify a storm is intensifying or weakening. And we hear thunder when the air expands and contracts due to its intense heat. Because light travels faster than the speed of sound, you will see lightning before you hear thunder. Thunder can be heard about 10 miles away from the apparent storm. And if you can hear thunder, you are close enough to be struck by lightning. Do not shelter under trees or open structures. Do not touch electronics plugged into the wall and do not use running water. If you ever at a ball field like this one in Kannapolis, the 30-30 rule can help keep you safe. If you hear thunder within 30 seconds after seeing lightning, go indoors. Stay there for at least 30 minutes until the last sound of thunder. In Kannapolis, a meteorologist, KJ Jacobs, W, CNC Charlotte.
Two missing boys from Concord have been found safe in Missouri. That according to the Concord Police Department. They say authorities found the brothers and their father at a Super 8 motel in Rockport. That's about two hours north of Kansas City. The boy's father has been taken into custody. He's now facing several charges. Police say they're working to get the kids back home to their grandmother in Concord as soon as possible. Matter of fact, I would say that Charlotte at number three and Minneapolis at number four are going to be the biggest surprises uh, around the country uh, when they look at our uh, project that we've completed here. I think the thing that pushes Charlotte over the top, uh, especially against some of the similarly sized markets, number one, you have that motorsports footprint. There are thousands of people employed in motorsports in Charlotte, from the race teams to the facility to even the NASCAR Hall of Fame. So that gives Charlotte a real advantage in terms of just the number of people employed in sports. I think another thing that helps Charlotte is an oversized media uh, footprint. When you think about ESPN and how many employees they have for the SEC network, uh, for ESPN events, which runs a lot of their business out of Charlotte, uh, so that can't be underestimated. And I think that gives Charlotte an advantage that maybe some other cities its size don't have. Uh, Getting back to our methodology a little bit, one of the buckets of data that we use, we interviewed about 100 top-level executives from around the industry and just got their anonymous feedback. We wanted them to be as uh, honest with us as they could. Uh, they gave Charlotte really high marks. So uh, it's a great environment for business. Uh, the banks and financial sector really underpin a lot of the sponsorship here, and I think that's important. Uh, plus, not to mention, great people, great weather, great food and restaurants. It really is just outside of sports a great place to live. So uh, people may be surprised by Charlotte, but I think folks within the sports industry will not be nearly as surprised. I think one thing that Charlotte has done over the last few years is build some more hotel rooms. That's important. Uh, you know, we have talked for years and years about it. would Charlotte ever be able to potentially host a Super Bowl Uh Maybe wanting a domed stadium is part of that, but another part of that equation was just how are we going to fit all these people in the city when they're coming in for a Super Bowl? They're starting to resolve some of those problems. Uh, so I think events in Charlotte, you mentioned a lot of them. Uh, don't underestimate what goes on at, at Quail Hollow. Uh, the PGA Championship, the Ryder Cup, those are really big sort of premier marquee events, and Charlotte is winning a lot of those bids. So uh, I think that as the city grows and as it uh, establishes these public-private partnerships around sports, uh, I don't see this as something that is going to uh, recede. I think Charlotte is going to continue to be a hub for sports. One of the metrics we looked at, uh, Charlotte actually in our study came out as the fourth fastest growing region in the country. So Dallas is our number one city in this report. Dallas is very similar to Charlotte in that it is a growth city. Uh, if you think about Dallas, you have so many transplants from California that move in uh, because of the low taxes. Uh, government regulation is not nearly as strict. It's just very business friendly. Uh, Charlotte kind of on the East Coast has that same dynamic. You have people moving in from New York. You have people moving in from Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland. We know that because when you go to a Panthers game and those teams are playing, it's hard to tell sometimes who the home team is. <laughs> but that plays into Charlotte as a destination city. This is the type of place that people move to and they stay because they like it. So the facilities in Charlotte are top notch. Uh, virtually any kind of sport you want is played here. Uh, we'll see if Charlotte is in the running for a Major League Baseball team or not. Uh, even if they don't get it, it's easy to see that the Knights have one of the top minor league facilities anywhere. That's uh, almost like watching Major League Baseball when you go to a Knights game. Uh, it's a great environment. So uh, Charlotte has a lot going for it, and I think they've put a lot of effort into this in the last few years, and this is the result of that. Well, one of the things we looked at was if I'm a, uh, let's say I'm a salesperson for a vendor in the sports space, and I want to visit a city, and in two days I want to make as many in-person sales calls as I can, Charlotte's a great place for that. All of the properties are located essentially within blocks of each other uptown. Uh, Getting around Charlotte is not nearly as difficult as it is, say, in Los Angeles or Atlanta, two cities that are bigger than Charlotte but got dinged for this type of thing in our survey. So I think Charlotte um, is, uh, it rates really highly with people coming into town. They like what they see. 
they know that uh, they can do business here. Uh, when you talk about the financial services industry, just look at what they've done with local sponsorship. So, you know, Bank of America obviously has a huge uh, relationship with the Panthers in the stadium. Uh, Ally with Charlotte FC's jersey. Ally has been a great corporate sponsor and has done a lot of really innovative stuff with their sponsorships. Truist has the deal with the Knights. Uh, Lending Tree has the Hornets jersey patches. So these are all local financial institutions that are heavily invested in sports. And that means a lot to people when they come into town. They know they can hit up four of the biggest sponsors in sports, and they're all located within just a block of each other right uptown. So those are the kind of things that help Charlotte out a lot. The financial services industry, you know, is the bedrock on which the city's built. I think as a baseball city, the first thing you have to think of is there are 81 home games. Are we really going to be able to draw 30,000 people a night to 81 home games? There's reason to think that you can. Number one, the weather here is fantastic. So uh, you're not going to have some of the problems you may have in Cleveland, uh, you know, and uh, Milwaukee as far as getting snow dates. But, you know, can Charlotte support 81 home games a year? That really is a big question. Um, you do, like I said, have so many transplants that you'll have a lot of fans from the visiting teams that will go and show up for games. I think that will help. Um, we'll see. I mean, I think we weren't sure that soccer was going to be uh, was going to take off in Charlotte, and we see how successful that's been. Uh, just looking at what Charlotte FC is doing right now, winning and losing doesn't seem to matter. They're having great success now. Over time. That's where winning and losing, we say around here all the time, there's no promotion like winning. So there's no marketing or sales efforts you'll ever be able to do that is better than just winning games. And so if Charlotte has a Major League Baseball team and they end up being a small market team with a low payroll like, say, Pittsburgh or Cincinnati or Detroit, and they're going to kind of languish around the bottom of the league, baseball's uh, revenue sharing structure is such that you'll have the Mets with a $300 million payroll and the Pirates with a $60 million payroll, that's pretty unique in sports. So if I were to look into a crystal ball and say 10 years from now Charlotte had a Major League Baseball team, but its payroll was near the bottom and they weren't able to really compete with some of the other big market clubs, that's a possibility. It could turn out that way. It could also go a totally different way where they're more like, say, Tampa, another small market or low revenue team, still finds success. So... Uh, there's no promotion like winning, and that will cure all ills. But there are still some questions Charlotte's going to have to answer about whether they can support a Major League Baseball team. And I think Charlotte was in the running for FIFA World Cup qualifiers. Uh, they want to be in the conversation for every major sporting event. Uh, Charlotte has had Final Fours, and Charlotte has, you know, North Carolina is obviously a great market for college basketball. Uh, you know, I think back to even 30 years ago, did we even think the NFL was going to succeed in Charlotte. I mean, there are a lot of people who have doubted Charlotte over the years, but the business climate here, there's a lot of smart people working on it. Um, they know what things they need to address, uh, and Danny Morrison and the crew at the Charlotte Sports Commission do a great job of sort of looking at these problems and trying to address them. Uh, as long as you have corporate support on your side, uh, that will be a big feather in their cap, and it will help them compete against some of these other markets. Um, if you look at the top 10 cities in our recent survey of the best cities, six of those 10 are sort of what I would call sunbelt cities. So Phoenix, Las Vegas, Nashville, Atlanta, Charlotte, Dallas. Uh, business is moving away from New York and Los Angeles. There's no question about it. Taxes are too high. Cost of living's too high. Uh, some of the regulatory problems these cities have are just a lot to overcome. Charlotte, Dallas, Atlanta, they don't have a lot of these problems. And so you see businesses moving to these cities, and they're growing. And I don't see that kind of growth on the coast anymore. I think we're undergoing not just in sports, but really the whole country is undergoing a shift away from those two markets. And markets like Charlotte are definitely taking advantage. Take a look and show you our, our camera views right here. Every view is looking okay. We have one exception. Uh, we have a great shot there, as you can see, from 
Over in Monroe, the first camera, Kannapolis is all right. Our tower cam and then the second camera in Monroe indicated a bit of patchy fog over there in Union County, North Carolina. Visibility at the moment, less than two mile visibility here in the Quinn City. Over in Shelby, in Cleveland County, that is half mile. So you may drive through a bit of patchy fog, but no major massive fog issues out there. We'll check and show you exactly what's happening across the area. The future cast indicates a few fair weather clouds during the afternoon. Check out these temperatures. It is a mild morning for the most part. We're looking at temperatures into the 50s out there. Unfortunately, here we go. Pollen count off the charts again today and again tomorrow. Thursday with an opportunity for some showers going to back it off a bit, but uh, unfortunately that is a major issue. The prime culprit, cedar, sycamore, and oak, uh, pine pollen. That's the kind you see in your car, the yellow, but it certainly is not going to cause you sneezing, sniffling. It's the sneezing, sniffling. The rest of those culprits right there. Rain chances over the next seven days. Here we go. We get into Thursday showers. Friday could be uh, one of those days with periods of rain. I think it's just going to be light rain, not expecting any severe weather threat. Over the weekend, the day uh, we'll see more opportunities for showers would be on Saturday, maybe even a few showers on Sunday as well. Uh, no severe weather threat here today. Unfortunately, in areas that have been just bombarded with severe weather week after week, it's the upper Midwest, Midwest, all the way down to the Mid-South, where there's a potential for strong and severe storms and some of those long-track tornadoes over parts of Illinois into Iowa and all the way into Arkansas and the parts of Mississippi out there today. Right now, we do have some uh, light rain showers tracking across the Carolina coastline, moving towards the Outer Banks, but that's moving away from us. So there's no rain in the forecast today. Uh, as you can see, uh, along the Great Lakes region, some showers that developing storm system back to the west with the line of showers uh, moving across the Great Lakes, moving west to east. Once again, today, the threat is in the midsection of the country, and then tomorrow uh, from Memphis all the way to, to the Ohio Valley. So from the Mid-South, the Ohio Valley, then we take you into Thursday. We get to Thursday afternoon, late afternoon. We may see a couple isolated strong storms, uh, basically northwest and west of the Charlotte area. Check the Guy Roofing 7-day forecast. We're in the low 80s today, warming up tomorrow, mid-80s, more of the same on Thursday. That rainstorm chance is more likely in the afternoon. Friday, yes, uh, there's going to be some showers. It's going to be the light rain variety, a very, very very chilly Saturday and the for Easter Sunday we're below average as far as temperatures close to average with some sun returning next Monday. That's for At WCNC Charlotte, we really want to make a difference. We have tools like Verify and Where's the Money to really listen to viewers and see what they're struggling with, whether that's trying to get money that you deserve or answering a question that's confusing you. We're not the experts, we're interviewing the experts. And that's why we want to bring it to you so you can see the facts, how we check them, and how we get the answer. Developing now new details about the Chinese spy balloon. U.S. officials shot down over the South Carolina coast back in February. The Biden administration says the balloon did gather intelligence from several sensitive military sites. It first entered U.S. airspace over Alaska. China has said repeatedly that the balloon was an unmanned civilian airship that accidentally strayed off course. CMS has its hands full tonight as they plan to take on several big issues. Here's three things you need to know. First up, leaders want to hear from you on next year's school budget. Tonight, folks can weigh in about plans to raise teacher pay as part of the district's $2.2 billion proposed budget. CMS leaders also expected to look at new performance data showing a drop in the number of high school students taking advanced courses. The district says the number of students taking language and arts courses is also below targets as well. It's all challenges the new superintendent will likely face. Today, the board will finalize interview questions for candidates. The district hopes to have a new superintendent picked out by next month. Well, spring just started, but if you've got kids, now's the time to start planning for ways to keep them occupied this summer. How's that going? We are already in the planning process. <laughs> it, it's a struggle, I mean, from it what really I is. hear. Especially with the budget, right? Right, the budget and, and really just the timeline. Yeah. You got to get started That's early. It. WCNC Charlotte's Carolyn Brock is joining us with what we need to know before selecting a summer camp for those kiddos. Okay, so here are five steps to help you select a summer camp. And this is according to the Better Business Bureau. They took a deep dive into this. The first thing you need to know 
is accreditation. Mm. You need to check for that. So there is a um, accreditation kind of organization called the American Camp Association. Um, it will accredit camps in the United States if they meet 32 national summer camp standards. So that's a good place to start. The second thing to know, safety requirements. Yes, we are no longer in a pandemic, but COVID could still be a concern. So you want to know what the camp protocols are. What are the health guidelines? Are visitors gain, gaining access to that camp? So know these things ahead of time. The third thing, get references. Yes, this is not a uh, job interview, but at the same time, you are going to be putting your child in the care of these people. So ask camp management. It's totally in your right to ask them to put you in touch with past campers so you can discuss their experiences with the camp and also make sure you check those online reviews just mm -hmm. get a deep dive and be thorough with that mm -hmm. you this is something that you cannot overlook evaluate health resources the camp has interesting you want to ask about the medical facilities on site to treat your camper if they do become sick or injured so is there one that's on site you also need to know the camp policy if medical care is in fact needed you also need to know if there are kids, if this is like a sleepaway camp and you, your child maybe has to take a daily medication, what are the accommodations for that? Who is in charge of administering it? You just wanna iron out all those details so you're not surprised about it in the end. And this one, speaking of budget guys, you <sighs> have to review the contract and the fees. You gotta read the fine print. You cannot trust or take the word of anything that is said to you. You have to read that contract before you sign it. And it's very important for you to ask about the total cost. You want the deposit included because some camps have this deposit requirement that's separate from the total cost. You say everything included I need to know before you sign. That's what you need to know. Here are the five steps to pick that summer camp. I know it's a lot of information, but no. it's important. Well, when you're a parent, you got to do your due diligence, right, Carolyn? So yeah. good, I'm trying to help here. Good steps there. We appreciate Things it. Things to keep in mind. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, it certainly felt like we got the summer vibe. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. With your help, WCNC Charlotte is making a difference in our community. We want people to know it's okay to ask for help. We are the guardrails to some of these families who are struggling. We get to present a check for $5,000 via the Techna Foundation. These people give up their heart and their time, and they don't get anything but thank yous in return. If you'd like to make a difference, go to WCNC.com slash make a difference now. Happening today, Union County Schools considering limiting what material can be on display in district classrooms. Their proposed plan would limit displays to items related to curriculum, but there's concern about what this could mean for LGBTQ students. Wake Up Charlotte's Tradisha Wooder joins us now with more. Tradisha? Well, Sarah, as Union County Board of Education prepares to vote, some parents and LGBT leaders have drafted up a petition encouraging people to stand up against the plan. Now, the proposal says classroom displays should be limited to content related to the United States, the state of North Carolina, the school name, the mascot or curriculum. Now, opponents say this change could ban pride flags and safe spaces for LGBT students. They say it could also limit education about marginalized communities and make LGBT students feel more alone than they already do. District leaders saying reading material must also have value and be comprehensive and evidence based, which could possibly ban books with LGBT content. Now, so far, people against the plan, they have about 670 signatures on this petition. The meeting is set to start at 7 o'clock tonight, and of course, we'll be sure to keep you updated if any changes are made. Ben. All right, Tradisha, thank you. Now to another update here. More fallout for Charlotte's public transportation. Katz's ongoing operations issues are a big concern for city leaders, and they were a focal point at today's transportation planning and development meeting this morning. All this while leaders work on a $13 billion transit plan for the city. WCNC Charlotte's Jesse Pierre is joining us to show us how the dialogue is going so far. Jesse. Yes, that's right. You know, city leaders are stepping in to get cats back on track. Now, this comes after learning of derailments that were not properly disclosed to local leaders, past due inspections, and several concerns about safety. This thing it, it is a cancer, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and we gotta you gotta treat the cancer before it spreads. 
and I think you can even say that maybe it's spreading already because it's just not the derailment, it's the maintenance, it's all the other things that we're dealing with. Monday, the City of Charlotte's Transportation Planning and Development Committee met to discuss several issues plaguing CATS. The Federal Transit Administration has been requested to do a review of CATS following a rail derailment back in May of 2022 that was not properly reported to city leaders. It was later discovered former CEO John Lewis did send a text to city manager Marcus Jones at the time, but it was missed. I'm not going to, um, but um, 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 lose a lot of sleep over the fact that he missed it. I'm losing sleep over the fact that it was uh, that somehow it wasn't reported in a different way other than a text, right? Well, Mr. Jones did not recognize the inflammatory nature of the word derailment, did not appreciate the need to be very upfront about that. Uh, and, you know, it was a, a bit of a lapse on his part, but I can well understand that he didn't think, based on the information he got, that there was a need to make public disclosure. The FTA is looking into maintenance records, operations, safety, and state of repairs. Necessary repairs, city leaders say, will not interrupt service. We have the capacity to continue to offer the service that we have been offering and trains will be cycled out of service in order to get these repairs done a few at a time. Interim CAT CEO Brent Cagle says they are implementing mandatory overtime to cover vacancies after learning the rail system has not operated with adequate staffing. The issue also flagged by NCDOT after an unannounced inspection. And we are going to be compensating the controllers for that and we will be getting much more aggressive or trying to find more aggressive ways to recruit new controllers. The agency will also be working with a third party company to improve the work culture, customer service and leadership. Now that we've been alerted to this problem, we are going to be very vigorous about making sure we don't get it again. Now, once on track, city leaders will work to find the right candidate to fill the CEO position. Now, despite the issues, there are no plans to stop moving forward on the transit plan. Live in studio, Jesse Pierre sending it back to you. Thank you, Jesse. Verify, WCNC Charlotte. Verify is all about trying to make a difference in the community by making sure that the community has the correct information. This is what we know, and hey, this is what we don't know. Sometimes you're actually surprised by the answer. Verify the difference. Verify is a great way to combat that misinformation, making sure that people know the process of the reporting. The York County Sheriff's Office making its youngest hires yet. Yeah, the office says it's welcoming its first 19-year-old detention officers. Sheriff Tolson recently swore in Seth Schultz and Heather Culver. Both used to be civilian booking clerks before becoming detention officers. In January, Sheriff Tolson lowered the age requirement from 21 to 19 for detention officers in order to help fill vacancies at the county detention center. Right now, we got to talk about a new art exhibit. It's here in Charlotte. It features the work of the well-known Pablo Picasso, but it also sheds light on a lesser known artist, but it's a name you've probably heard a lot here in Charlotte, Romare Bearden. Yes, sure. He has an uptown park named after him, but Larry Sprinkle shows us how the Picasso event also pays tribute to the Charlotte born Bearden. Romare Bearden isn't just a well-known park in the Queen City. Bearden was a creative and influential artist who was born near what is now Uptown. And though he traveled all over the United States and the world and made a name for himself, he still means a lot to the Mint Museum and to the city of Charlotte. So the museum decided it would be great to highlight his work and show how much Bearden was greatly influenced by Picasso. We knew we had a Picasso show coming. We knew we were going to be the only East Coast venue. We thought, how can you know, all these people be coming in? How can we really spotlight Bearden even more? And so we decided to organize this exhibition, which explores their relationship. Romare Bearden, who was African-American, was a student of Picasso and other modern artists. And Picasso's impact on Bearden was profound. You can see that in the artwork. So you'll see a number of Beardens you haven't seen. We brought in Beardens from private and public collections across the country, um, along with a couple of more Picassos, um, so that people can really see that relationship uh, in person. The exhibition gives Charlotteans the chance to learn more about their own culture and history. If you didn't know Romar Bearden was from Charlotte, he really is one of the most significant American artists of the second half of the 20th century. Um, you know, he kind of reintroduced, reinvigorated the medium of collage, 
A lot of his work draws, looks back on his ties to the South. This is the first show to explore the relationship between these two amazing artists. It's called Rhythms and Reverberations, and it's just one part of the bigger Picasso exhibition, which has proven to be very popular. Our um, Picasso Landscapes Out of Bounds show, it's drawing in people. Um, really busy on the weekend, so I would say if you want to come see it, definitely come midweek if you can. In Uptown, I'm Larry Sprinkle, WCNC Charlotte. Well, if you're interested in checking out the Picasso exhibition, head on over to WCNC.com or just find the story on our WCNC mobile app. The show actually runs through May 21st, so you've got a little more time. Take a look and show you our, our camera views right here. Every view is looking okay. We have one exception. Uh, we have a great shot there, as you can see, from over in Monroe. The first camera, Kannapolis, all right. Our tower cam, and then the second camera in Monroe indicated a bit of patchy fog over there in Union County, North Carolina. Visibility at the moment, less than two mile visibility here in the Quinn City. Over in Shelby, in Cleveland County, that is half a mile. So you may drive through a bit of patchy fog, but no major. Massive fog issues out there. We'll check and show exactly what's happening across the area. The future cast indicates a few fair weather clouds during the afternoon. Check out these temperatures. It is a mild morning for the most part. We're looking at temperatures into the 50s out there. Unfortunately, here we go. Pollen count off the charts again today and again tomorrow, Thursday, with an opportunity for some showers going to back it off a bit. But uh, unfortunately, that is a major issue. The prime culprit, cedar, sycamore, and oak, uh, pine pollen. That's the kind you see in your car, the yellow, but it certainly is not going to cause you sneezing, sniffling. It's the sneezing, sniffling. The rest of those culprits right there. Rain chance over the next seven days. Here we go. We get into Thursday. Showers Friday could be uh, one of those days with periods of rain. I think it's just going to be light rain, not expecting severe weather threat. Over the weekend, the day uh, we'll see more opportunities for showers would be on Saturday, maybe even a few showers on Sunday as well. Uh, no severe weather threat here today. Unfortunately, in areas that have been just bombarded with severe weather week after week, it's the upper Midwest, Midwest, all the way down to the Mid-South, where there's a potential for strong and severe storms and some of those long track tornadoes over parts of Illinois into Iowa and all the way into Arkansas and the parts of Mississippi out there today. Right now we do have some uh, light rain showers tracking across the Carolina coastline moving towards the Outer Banks, but that's moving away from us. So there's no rain in the forecast today. Uh, as you can see uh, along the Great Lakes region, some showers that developing storm system back to the west with the line of showers uh, moving across the Great Lakes, moving west to east. Once again today, the threat is in the midsection of the country and then tomorrow uh, from Memphis all the way to, to the Ohio Valley. So from the Mid-South, the Ohio Valley, then we take you into Thursday. We get to Thursday afternoon, late afternoon. We may see a couple isolated strong storms uh, basically northwest and west of the Charlotte area. Check the guy roofing seven day forecast. We're in the low 80s today, warming up tomorrow, mid 80s. More of the same on Thursday. That rainstorm chance is more likely in the afternoon. Friday, yes, uh, there's going to be some showers. It's going to be the light rain variety, a very, very very chilly Saturday and the for Easter Sunday we're below average as far as temperatures close to average with some sun returning next Monday. That's for WCNC Charlotte. Weather is a, a kind of science that you get to see and experience every day. And I think some people don't even realize how much it affects them. That weather has a huge impact on how it threatens your family, your livelihood, or your home. So I think it really is one of those defining things we do that really affects everybody in our community. See the difference. That process of giving you a warning ahead of time and keeping you and your family safe is really important to me because I live here too. It's my family, it's my friends, it's my neighbors. New at six, in life sometimes we have setbacks and for a Charlotte family, the word cancer changed their lives forever. But tonight, nine-year-old Cameron is doing well and thanks to Make-A-Wish, he was able to make a once-in-a-lifetime trip reliving his favorite movie. WCNC Charlotte anchor Sarah French takes us along for the ride. Cameron was a totally healthy kid. Cameron's parents, Robert and Clary Gray, say they received the shock of a lifetime when their son turned seven. He started getting a very bad headaches uh, that we couldn't find the cause of. And we eventually found that he had a brain tumor. While Cameron had the tumor removed successfully here in Charlotte, his tumor was the kind that spreads. Uh, luckily, Cameron fit into a trial at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. Cameron had to receive two months of radiation and seven months of chemotherapy before returning home. And that's where Make-A-Wish stepped in, just in time for the one-year anniversary of Cameron returning home. I picked to do what we did in Home Alone 2 because I, it's my favorite movie. And Cameron wanted to do exactly what they did in the movie. 
So in the movie, Kevin McAllister gets a limo ride with Cheese Pizza, and so we so we got a limo ride, and we had the Cheese Pizza in it, and oh, we went to FAO Schwartz also. All the kids come into the store and play with all his toys. This is a really fun part. We went and got a Sunday bar. We stayed at the Plaza Hotel where they stayed at in the movie. This is a vacation. It was beyond magical. There were some good happy tears, for sure. I'd like to kind of think that all the hardship that we went through made us stronger as a family. And I think it's true. And it's not like it's magically easier once you get back. Cancer's gone and treat treatment's over and you're back in school, but um, it's a journey and we're all stronger for it, don't you think? Yeah. 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 The family says Cameron is doing well. He's finished with his treatments and there's no evidence of cancer. And they are just so thankful to make a wish for giving their family an unforgettable trip with memories they will cherish forever. For WCNC Charlotte, I'm Sarah French. New at four, a local school that's been around for more than two decades is finally getting its first black leader. WCNC Charlotte's Kia Murray introducing us to the woman who's now leading Trinity Episcopal School in Uptown. You'll find Imana Cheryl in this courtyard every week. She looks over the hundreds of students at Trinity Episcopal School as they sing and dance during morning announcements. It's on these grounds she makes history. I come from a really long history of educators, even when they weren't allowed to learn. Cheryl calls it standing on the shoulders of her ancestors, and she stands tall as the first black woman to earn the title of head of schools at Trinity Episcopal. Throughout her life, Cheryl says being the first and only is nothing new. It's why she hopes in her field of education, more black women will walk through halls just like these to nurture students and lead with love. Because there's so many brilliant, bright, successful, authentic and thoughtful educational leaders that should be in this role right alongside me. So hopefully that opens the doors to thinking about having women of color in these types of roles. And as far as holding the door open for other diverse leaders to follow, Cheryl's goals put equity, inclusion, and belonging at the center. I think you have to be very intentional. Um, I always try to make sure that every decision that I make is mission and core values focused. Because it's not about me, it's about these 440 kids in that building and trying to make sure that we're developing them completely. I asked Cheryl how she wants to lead differently. She said she wants to take the lead on more community partnerships between the school and businesses in Uptown Charlotte. Now this is just one of many examples of WCNC's partnership with Pride Magazine to share stories like this one. If you'd like to see how Imana Cheryl got her start, you can read more at pridemagazineonline.com. I'm Kia Murray, WCNC Charlotte. <laughs> An update tonight as we follow a shooting in Cornelius. Police are looking for a 66-year-old woman in connection to the incident. This happened earlier this evening at the entrance of Ramsey Creek Park. We know that someone was shot but aren't yet aware of their condition. Cornelius police say this was an 